story begins in a magical world called Arpedia. However, it's not technically a real place, because you can only get there when you're online. You see, Arpedia Online is regarded as the greatest fantasy game among modern virtual reality games. It uses a game-specific capsule to deliver to the five senses in such a way that it can't even be distinguished from reality. Basically, the user is placed in this futuristic capsule, and then their consciousness is transported to the fantasy world, thanks to the patented scanning technology that it uses to create an avatar identical to the user. This amazing game is also paired with the latest AI technology, which allows the NPCs and monsters to act like they have actual sentience. It also offers a well-paced and fun experience without the need to wail, adding to the reasons why it's regarded as the greatest Korean game of all time. The game has become so popular that people have started paying close attention to the actions of the game's top players. But even among the best, there's always one person who stands out. The most notable of them is none other than the rank 50 warrior, Bartz. So why do people pay so much attention to him, even when he's not the highest ranked player in the game? Well, it's because Bartz is quite different from the rest. In Arpedia Online, teaming up and forming parties is considered necessary for survival, but Bartz remains the only hardcore solo player who managed to take on the Rage Dragon alone. As you'd expect, rumors started making the rounds about Bartz's identity in the real world, but they're all just speculative. Some say that he's someone with a close relationship to the developer of the game, while others think that he's a rich boy who wailed an incredible fortune into the game. But truth be told, our boy isn't any of those at all. Instead, in the real world, Bartz is just an unemployed man named Kang Yuhan. And he mostly stays in his room thinking about what the people in the game say about him. He doesn't know why they're all getting excited just because he defeated a rage dragon. To him, rage dragons aren't that big of a deal, and he even went to visit his grandma after the feat, leaving the rest of the community in uproar. The scene shifts, and we see Kang back in the game, standing but naked in the middle of the street. Sure enough, this gets the attention of all the people around, and Kang doesn't seem to know what's going on. As if it wasn't already embarrassing enough, another player points to Kang while laughing and shouts for others to look at him. One of the other players refuses to look, stating that Kang has clearly lost his mind. It doesn't take long before everyone around starts murmuring about the situation. Some of them even suggest reporting Kang, and begin to call for the game masters in charge of moderating the game. When Kang sees that he's about to be in a lot of trouble, he nervously tells them to wait, claiming that he's going to equip his clothes right away. He tells them not to report him and goes straight to his inventory. Unfortunately, when he checks it, he's shocked to find it empty. From the crazy look on his face, you can tell he's horrified when he sees that all his items are missing. Confused, he wonders if it might be a bug and frantically starts searching for the report bug button. Sure enough, that button is nowhere to be found as well. The reality of the situation finally dawns on him when he sees his profile has been changed. He's no longer a rank 50 solo warrior, but just a level 1 beginner. Kang screams so loud that it gets his mother's attention in the real world. The worried woman rushes to his room, thinking that he was attacked by a thief or something. However, she finds Kang sweating and panting in front of his capsule. He doesn't say anything at first, and the suspense makes his mother gulp in anxiety. Eventually, he reveals the problem, telling her that he thinks his account has been hacked. Kang's mother freezes when she hears this, and then decides to confirm what he's talking about. She asks him if he's talking about his gaming account, and the man-child nods in response with tears running down his face. Hearing this, his mother goes into a state of absolute rage, and we see her head turn into that of a tiger, implying that she's probably about to rip his sorry ass apart. She's beyond enraged, and disappointed that he's creating such a scene for something as little as a game. Reminds me of the time my mom smacked my head with a sandal while I was playing Valorant, and honestly, that was well deserved. Anyway, she resumes her scolding and reminds him of what he told her when he decided to drop out of college. Back then, Kang claimed that he'd figure things out himself and go down a reasonable career. However, ever since then, all he does is play games inside and doze off whenever he goes to the civil servant cram school. The furious mother asks him how his recent actions show that he's figuring anything out. Kang is speechless after that, so she just storms out of his room, telling him that he's going to give her an aneurysm one of these days. She gave him a serious scolding, but it seems he isn't affected by it at all. He's more concerned about his avatar, Bartz, and prays that the game brings him back because of how much it took to raise him. And with that, Kang curls himself up beside his capsule and sobs in despair. The world's best solo player, the lone wolf, the lonely warrior, the dragon killer, all of those titles are gone in the air in just a single moment. Later, Kang calls Dream Max Corporation, the developers of the game, to explain to them the situation of his account. Like the man-child he is, Kang starts to complain that his character might have been hacked. He explains that he already submitted a ticket, but got a response that says everything was normal. However, he's sure that it's not possible because all his gaming data has been wiped. Like all customer service personnel, the person on the other end starts asking questions that have already been answered, for confirmation. 
understandably, Kang starts to get impatient and a bit annoyed, especially when the person tells him to wait a moment. Kang's anxiety increases as he waits to hear what the verdict is. Unfortunately, it's not what he wanted to hear. My boy is informed that his details have been verified, and it has been confirmed that his character was created only four days ago. On top of that, the agent tells Kang that nothing seems out of the ordinary with his account. As you'd expect, our hero refuses to accept it. He tries to explain that he created Bart's a long time ago during the open beta, and laments that not only his levels have been reset, all of his gear has also vanished. That's when the truth finally comes out, when the agent tells Kang that the Bart's character he's referring to has been deleted five days ago. Of course, Kang is horrified to hear this because he doesn't remember doing such a thing. He even tries to explain that he wasn't able to log in for the past week because he was at his grandma's place. He starts to get angry again, and insists that his account was hacked because he couldn't have deleted his prized character. The agent tries to convince him that he's not being gaslighted, and assures him that Dream Max has a world-class security system. Heck, he even claims that the issues he's having are most likely to be a result of his own mismanagement of personal information. In other words, my boy is being told that he's the one at fault. The agent adds that the company recommends changing passwords weekly, just in order to prevent such unfortunate occurrences. As he listens to the agent, Kang's lips start to quiver, but he forces himself not to cry. The agent then confirms that Kang wasn't changing his passwords every week as recommended, and as a result, the company cannot take responsibility for his mismanagement of personal information. Before the agent can finish talking, Kang angrily cuts him off, yelling that he understands before hanging up the phone call. Kang still believes that his account was hacked, because he knows for a fact that he never deleted the account. Heartbroken and enraged, my boy swears that he's never going to forgive the perpetrator, even though he doesn't know who that person is. At this point, he's already developed a vendetta against the unknown hacker. Later that evening, Kang's brother Haiyan walks in on him conducting a funeral service for Bart's. Haiyan initially came in because their mom wanted to see Kang, but seeing his brother spiral, he just stands there in confusion. Kang weirdly offers Haiyan a drink, and the latter starts to wonder if his older brother has gone insane. Haiyan can't drink since he's a minor, but Kang seems to have forgotten that as well. With a condescending and disappointed look on his face, Haiyan asks Kang if he finally lost his mind while studying for the civil servant exam. The boy never really believed his brother could pass the exam, even though their mom somehow still expected him to. Kang admits that he's actually lost his mind, but not for the reason his little brother thinks. He reveals that his other half has left the world, and there's no way he can stay clear-minded. Even though Haiyan is incredibly disappointed, he manages to fake some sympathy for his older brother as he drowns his sorrows in alcohol. While Kang plans to drink himself to death, Haiyan just thinks about what a loser his brother is. As if gaming all day wasn't already pathetic enough, now he wants to add drunkenness to his CV. Anyway, Haiyan shakes off the thought and proceeds to reveal why he came in the first place. He tells Kang that their mom wants him to grab a ladle from downstairs. The older brother explains that he's busy and asks Haiyan to go grab it himself. But the boy points out that unlike some people, he actually has to go to school and wants to be there. He reminds his older brother that he's a high school student, and not an unemployed adult like his pathetic ass. Hearing this, Kang can't help but feel the sting from his younger brother's lack of respect for him. Kang even believes that Haiyan might think he's beneath him, even though he's the bigger brother. After the young boy leaves for school, Kang finally goes downstairs where their family business is run. He tells his dad that his mom wants a ladle, and the old man wonders why. After claiming that he doesn't know, my guy remembers that she said she broke it while making fried rice. Kang's father is surprised to hear this, and wonders how hard she must have been using the ladle for it to break. While fiddling with the ladle, Kang admits that he doesn't know, and talks about how his mom doesn't understand objects all have inherent durability. Then suddenly, he has an epic idea. He thinks about the ladle's durability, and begins to laugh like an absolute maniac. Although his dad has no idea what is going on in his son's head, Kang seems to have had a moment of eureka. He suddenly bolts upstairs like a crazy person, while his dad shouts for him to close the door before he leaves. Kang realizes that Arpedia Online has a durability system. Every piece of equipment consumes its durability as you use it, and when it gets to zero, the item always gets destroyed. Because of this, players always seek out blacksmiths who can repair their weapons ahead of time, and the repairability of the equipment changes by level. This means that the better and more expensive the equipment is, the higher the level of the blacksmith you have to entrust it to. Now, what do you think would happen if a high-level blacksmith were to repair equipment for cheap? Well, the answer is that everyone would come rushing to that blacksmith to request repairs. Kang remembers how all of Bart's equipment were expensive and rare items, so he knows that there's no way a hacker would have left them alone. Kang believes that the hacker sold all of his items before deleting his character, so he plans to find the person by following their trail of sale. With this plan in mind, Kang is more confident than ever that it's just a matter of time before he catches the hacker. The scene shifts, and Kang re-enters the game. 
At the entrance gate of Arpedia Online, a yellow ball angel asks our hero if he'd like to log in. But this time, he's got something else in mind. Instead, he wants to create a new character. The gatekeeper asks Kang to choose his character's birthday, and he just tells it to pick a random number. The gatekeeper chooses April 4th and informs Kang, before asking him if he'd like the name to also be selected randomly. Of course, our boy prefers to do that himself. He rubs his chin and thinks intensely to come up with a name, because he wants something short and strong like Bart's. Suddenly, the name comes to mind, and he snaps his fingers in excitement as he chooses Zig as the name for his new character. The gatekeeper accepts the information, and processes it as the gates start to open for Kang. As the character Zig is created, our hero is certain that it's going to be the name of the greatest blacksmith in all of Arpedia. Unfortunately, there are going to be a few obstacles along the way. Because the moment Zig goes to start his new career, the senior blacksmith there tells him that there's no chance for him to succeed in this field, explaining that the job requires endless patience and endurance. He calls Zig a brat, and claims that the job isn't something he can take on as he wishes. And with that absurd reasoning, the NPC blacksmith named Smith Pabachi tells Zig to get out of his shop immediately. There are two ways to gain a production job in Arpedia. The first way is to learn by purchasing a ski book, and the other is to learn by working. The second method would allow you to earn money with a job advancement, but everyone in Arpedia seems to avoid it. The reason for this is that every master craftsman has an odd personality. Out of all of them, Zig is particularly wary of Pabachi Smith, because even back then when he was Bart's, this asshole would always try to pick a fight with him whenever he wanted to get his equipment repaired. However, now that he's Zig and also broke, he decides that the best thing for him to do as a level 10 character with only 35 gold in his account is to go for the job advancement quest. He believes that it shouldn't be that hard, and that's why he knocked on Pabachi's door in the first place. He walks into the smithy and tells the dude that he would like to become a blacksmith. Not just any kind, he wants to become the world's greatest blacksmith. Pabachi finds it amusing of course, because just by looking at Zig, he can tell that he's not cut out for the job. Our hero naturally protests, claiming that Pabachi should be fair enough to at least test him before failing him. Hearing this, the blacksmith appears to be quite baffled, so our hero explains that he can order him to do anything to see what he's capable of. After thinking for a moment, Pabachi agrees to the deal. The scene shifts once again, and we see our boy standing in awe as he looks up at the tall heap of logs, stacked on top of each other. As if he wasn't already overwhelmed enough, Pabachi suddenly orders him to chop all the wood there, adding that he has only one day to do so. The sun shines on the cruel blacksmith's head, as he tells Zig that he'll reconsider his earlier decision if he succeeds. Pabachi turns around and walks away, while our boy is still shocked that he expects him to chop so much wood. For clarity's sake, he asks him if he really means it, and Pabachi just tells him to quit if he doesn't have the balls. Realizing that it's the only way to prove his readiness, our hero gets to work. Unfortunately, he's terrible at chopping wood, and that's just putting it lightly. He swings the axe and misses the log he is supposed to split, and from the way he's panting and gasping for air, it's clear he's been at it for a while. Even the log of wood is disappointed in him at this point, because he hasn't even gotten a scratch from Zig's axe. Determined to succeed, Zig tries again many times, but misses each time to the point that the log of wood starts taunting him. He gets extremely frustrated and starts yelling, wondering why he even has to do this in the first place. He remembers seeing other characters advancing immediately and being taught how to use the hammer, but here he was, struggling to chop a single piece of wood. One of the other lumberjacks chimes in, and suggests that he's probably having difficulty due to his affinity. Zig is curious upon hearing this from the unknown character, so he asks the guy who he is. This is when the man reveals that he's also a hopeful blacksmith apprentice. He explains that the birthday you choose for your character during its creation also determines one's affinity with jobs. And unfortunately, production jobs are notorious for being very difficult at the beginning if the affinity doesn't match. As you'd expect, Zig is both furious and exasperated at the same time, because he realizes that he's once again partly responsible for his problem. He had no idea that birthdays were so important in the game, and already regrets his earlier decision to let the gatekeeper choose for him. The fellow hopeful blacksmith apprentice reveals that he's facing the same struggle because of it. Zig doesn't appear to care about him, and is more concerned about what he can do to fix the situation. He's angry that he didn't know before, and contemplates creating a new character. But if he does that, he'll need to reach level 10 once again. Rather than worrying, Zig decides to just focus on the challenge at hand, and that is to chop the mountainous heap of wood. After all, he's certain that Pabachi will let him advance if he can chop all the wood. So once again, he takes his axe and starts swinging. With a new sense of motivation, Zig yells for the log of wood to die, but then proceeds to miss again anyway. However, this time, he doesn't relent and instead channels all his frustration into chopping the logs of wood till he succeeds. Habachi arrives a while later to meet Zig lying in exhaustion, and is surprised to see that he actually finished the task within a day. 
our hero gets back up and reminds the blacksmith that he said he would do it, so now he expects to officially get hired inside the smithy. Unfortunately, the mean baldy tells Zig that there's still no way he'd hire him yet. He then gives him a sword and orders him to mine ten black coals from a place called Mount Lankel. Zig practically deflates when he hears this, because he knows that Mount Lankel Mines is a dangerous place where only those above level 15 should dare to go. The field boss of the mountain is a level 45 raging boar, so it's natural that our boy is very reluctant to take the order. He asks Pabachi if he would take responsibility for his death, pointing out that he just barely got to level 10. In response, the asshole blacksmith shows a rare moment of kindness by letting our hero borrow one of his swords. He still thinks that Zig is too whiny though, so he tells him he can quit if he doesn't like the mission. Zig believes that his affinity shouldn't be that trashy to hold him back, so he eventually accepts the task and takes the sword. However, before setting off, he asks Pabuchi if he promises to hire him when he completes this mission. With a suspicious smirk on his face, Pabuchi agrees to let him become a blacksmith if he succeeds. After the verbal agreement, Zig heads down to the mines, where his objective is to obtain ten black coal from the location marked by the asshole. Zig seems to have made missing a habit, because even in the mines, he keeps swinging away from his targets. Seeing that his approach isn't working, he calms himself down and decides to use the same pattern from his wood chopping challenge. By gripping the shaft lightly and swinging with a circular momentum, he strikes the mine like he's wielding a sword, and finally obtains the first black coal. Our hero praises himself, suggesting that he just displayed two years' worth of experience. With this new strategy, he swings his pickaxe like a sword once again, and it works for the second time in a row. It doesn't take long before Zig uses this effective technique to complete his task. And now that he's acquired 10 black coal, the only thing left is for him to deliver them to Pabachi, and then he'd finally gain his reward, which is an advancement to blacksmith. Unfortunately, the path back to Pabachi is ridden with several dangerous monsters. And even though other players are keeping most of them occupied, the level 45 raging boar has its eyes set on only our hero. Just when he thinks he is one step closer to catching the hacker, he receives a warning message, informing him that the field boss has arrived. It appears he had forgotten about the raging boar, because he doesn't really look like someone who's even slightly prepared to fight. The beast charges at him, and my boy does the only reasonable thing he can think of. He runs in the opposite direction, back to where the other players are standing. But of course, when they see the field boss running in their direction, they all scamper out of the way as well. As Zig runs for dear life, he wonders why the raging boar spawned in front of him, when it usually only appears once a day at a random location. He knows that his health is terrible because he's aiming for a production job, and as such, he'll be dead after a single hit from the boar. The terrifying beast opens its wide teeth-filled mouth and tries to bite Zig, but he manages to dodge by jumping over it. As he lands on the floor, he wonders if the boar's aggro is fixed on him, and fears that he'd eventually have to stop running if that's the case. In Arpedia Online, production jobs have an inherent disadvantage in combat. However, Zig believes that the nature of virtual reality games means that the character's body is connected to the real one. And since Arpedia Online is founded on realism, it means that disadvantageous fights are still viable, depending on one's martial capabilities or natural combat senses. With this in mind, our hero gets motivated, so he charges at the boar with his sword. He knows that its weakness is at the center of its forehead, so he just has to land a precise hit in that spot, even if the attack is weak. Unfortunately, precision isn't exactly his forte as we've seen. And to make matters worse, the boar blocks his attack and proceeds to ram him away with a powerful headbutt. By some miracle, our hero ends up surviving still. He thinks that the boar stopped him because he has low movement speed, and regrets not packing any dexterity potions with him before he left. He was still busy swearing in frustration when the raging boar started charging at him again. Zig just stands there confused, he doesn't know what else to do than attempt hitting its weak spot. And since that has already failed, he contemplates running away once again. However, at the last second, he changes his mind, reminding himself that he's the legendary player who shouldn't be worried over a mere entry-level monster. He wields his sword and assumes his former personality, believing that although the character may be temporary, his class is still permanent. Unfortunately, just when he's about to enter god mode, he receives a message that informs him that his stamina is low, telling him to eat some mom's spaghetti. His knees get weak, and he falls to the floor in shock that he's already out of stamina. The raging boner, I mean boar, is about to finish him off when someone shoots a powerful arrow at the monster. The arrow ends up removing 30 levels from the boar, making it look like a harmless pig. The boar is also shocked and screams when it sees one of its horns is broken. Just then, the archer responsible appears, afraid that she did too little damage to the beast. The monster starts raging again and charges at the girl when she doesn't expect it. I guess she didn't really expect to face the consequences of her actions, because now it doesn't look like she knows what to do. The boar jumps into the air and Zig tells her to aim for the center of its forehead. 
At the final moment, the girl manages to shake off the nerves and shoots another arrow straight at the creature's weak spot. After the blast, a message pops up, confirming that Archer Sia has defeated the raging boar. Our hero heaves a sigh of relief, knowing that he barely survived. He thanks the archer for her help, but she interrupts him by grabbing him from the shoulder. The girl pulls him closer to herself and asks the man if they've met somewhere before. We continue from where we left off, and our hero just stands there nervously as Sia curiously examines his face. She claims that he looks very familiar, but admits that she might be wrong. She thrusts her face closer to Ziggs, making him even more uncomfortable. He starts to panic, wondering what's up with the strange lady and why she's invading his personal space like this. Because he's so nervous, he's too dumbfounded to even reply to her. Sia calls for his attention, asking him if he didn't hear what she said. In response, Zig starts to stutter nervously before suddenly bolting off. As he runs away, he tries to explain that he has a quest to complete and as such, he doesn't have time to talk to strangers even if they just saved his life. Or at least that's what we think he said while running away. Sia is taken by surprise when he jets off, but still can't shake off the feeling that she's met him somewhere before. The scene shifts, and we see that Zig has returned with the ten black coal that the blacksmith sent him to mine. He presents them with a sack to the mean blacksmith. While holding the bag open and looking at the black coal, Zig realizes that he's never actually seen the minerals before, even though he's been playing Arpedia for a while now. Once again, Zig exceeds Pabach's expectations. The baldy admits that he didn't think Zig would successfully acquire the black coal and expresses his surprise. Hearing this, Zig is pretty upset and asks Pabuchi why he would make him do things he didn't think he could accomplish. The baldy just takes the sack from Zig and finally admits that he was wrong about him. Pabuchi thinks that he can make good use of Zig's grit, so he decides to hire him. Zig is excited to hear this and relieved too. Suddenly, the ball-like angel appears, asking if he would like to become a blacksmith. Of course, he does. That's the reason he suffered all that he did in the first place. Just then, a tab pops up, informing Zig that he's officially advanced into a blacksmith, and sure enough, he's delighted that he's finally won. Now, his blacksmith life can begin so that he can one day become a legend. Zig fantasizes about it, but he's interrupted from his daydream when his new boss, Pabuchi, calls out to him, asking him to follow. Zig follows his master as he eagerly awaits the day he catches the hacker who ruined his gaming life. Back at the forge, we see that Zig has already started hammering away. Unfortunately, he's not having too much luck initially. He's supposed to be working on a sword, but what we see looks nothing like a sword. Even though the blade is bent, Zig believes that he must be talented. In his mind, he's created something perfect. He looks at the curved blade in awe, thinking it's brilliant, but Pabuchi bursts his bubble by claiming it's nonsense. The boss doesn't like it, and even doubts that the blade can cut a leaf. He decides to forgive the new apprentice for his mistake, but threatens not to pay him if he makes any piece of junk like it. Zig tries to argue, claiming that his first work should at least have more value, but Pabuchi cuts him off and orders him to make 30 short swords. Of course, Pabuchi warns him not to make any of them ugly because if he does, he's going to get fired. Zig gets annoyed after the boss scolding, and wonders how different his swords could possibly be from the ones others make. He feels very unappreciated, because he's worked all day and night to make this first sword, and yet, his asshole master doesn't care. He curses his bald boss, and vows that he's going to make the best short sword ever. Zig gets to work immediately and stays at it till nightfall. By then, he's almost done with the short sword, but he still feels it's not good enough. Zig examines the weapon, and wonders what he has to do to make a good sword. He gets upset, and to make matters worse, the game starts to taunt him too. A tab pops up, calling his sword a cheap piece of shit that can only be made by a novice. Apparently, it's of low quality and it's difficult to use because of its messy state. Seeing this, Zig is even more frustrated, because he knows he won't be able to gloat in front of Pabachi if his work keeps turning out like this. Desperate to make the best sword, Zig gets back to work, and after a while, he notices something very strange. He sees that the latest sword he created has a bunch of blue lines, which baffles him a lot. However, that's not the strangest part, because it appears that the blue lines are actually now on all the swords he made, but they all have a different lining style. Determined to get an answer, he immediately walks over to another blacksmith's table and yanks his sword away. The guy demands that Zig give it back, but he just ignores him. Zig takes a closer look at the man's sword and also sees the lines. However, the ones on this sword are all crooked. The owner of the sword attempts to take it back, but Zig just points it at his face to show him the strange lines. Unfortunately, the guy can't see them. He's confused by what Zig is saying and just backs away when he starts waving the sword in his face. Zig tries to get him to see the lines too, but the guy just tells him that he can't see anything and warns him to stop shaking the sword like a freak. For a brief moment, Zig appears to be deep in thought about the mysterious lines but ultimately decides to forget about them, since he doesn't understand them. He casually tosses the sword away, and suggests that they just stick to the other quests they were assigned to. 
Zig then receives his fifth quest for blacksmith training. This time, his job is to repair five broken axes and take them to Pebachi, because as a blacksmith he's definitely supposed to know how to fix broken things. When he goes to start the quest, he's once again baffled, and scratches the back of his head as he looks at the broken axe in confusion. The axe also has those weird lines he doesn't understand, and this time, they're even red. After coming up with no better idea, he decides that he'll just try hammering the axe, hoping that it will fix the axe, and in turn, the red lines will just disappear. So, our boy begins hammering, and after a while, something terrible happens. He destroys the axe, and a message pops up, informing him that he's failed to repair it. Zig begins to lament that he doesn't have the talent to repair, and as if that wasn't disappointing enough, he takes a closer look at the broken axe, and sees the red lines still there. He notices that the damaged shape matches up with the red lines. Upon seeing this, he suddenly starts to get an idea of what the cause could be, and judging by the steam coming out of his ears, it's something mind-boggling. Sometime later, Pabachi returns to the smith and he doesn't look too happy. He yells at Zig for failing to make the short swords, and points out that it's already been several days since he was given the task. When Zig doesn't answer, Pabachi gets more annoyed so he walks up to confront him where he's currently bowing his head. He asks Zig how long it took him to make the ten short swords, and hopes that he's done with his repair training as well. He finally gets to where Zig is standing, and when he looks over at the table, he's too stunned to speak. Pabachi is mesmerized by the shiny and beautiful short swords Zig has created. The apprentice asks him what he thinks about them, but the boss is still speechlessly beholding the swords in awe. Even though he doesn't say anything, Zig already knows what Pabachi thinks of them. He calls the swords perfect, and reveals that he learned a shocking fact after a few days of producing and repairing. First, it was the blue line. Zig realized that it's the trace of the hammer pounding on the metal. Its shape is influenced by the power and timing of the hammering. So, the more consistent the distance between the lines is, the higher the quality of production. The next thing he learned was what the red line is all about. He found out that these red lines were cracked inside the metal tissue created during the repair process. As such, Zig surmises that if he focuses on taking care of these red lines, then he should be able to fix any item completely. In other words, everything Zig is trying to say is that he now knows that the blue and red lines that appear on the items are the cheat codes to make production and repair perfect. Zig informs Pabachi that he actually stayed up a few nights while learning about this, but admits that it was all worth it. Thanks to those late nights, he's gained a rare and incredible ability. After revealing all of this, Pabachi stays quiet for a brief moment before suddenly slamming his palm on the table like a maniac. Sure enough, Zig is startled but he quickly realizes that there's no cause for alarm. For the first time, he sees an actual genuine smile on Pabachi's face as he tells him that he passed. The blacksmith tells Zig that he has nothing left to teach him and assures him that he did a good job. Seeing the usually cruel boss smiling and giving him a thumbs up, Zig is a bit skeptical. He's shocked and doesn't really believe him, but Pabachi assures him that he's being serious, pointing out that his skills are good enough already. Pabachi admits that Zig really surprised him. In his experience, talentless guys like him usually give up right away, but our boy didn't do that, and now he's practically an expert. And now, our hero asks Pabachi if any other guys without talent passed his training, but the baldy shakes his head to say no, claiming that no one was able to do it because they all lacked the patience. Zig then asks him if any of those students said anything about seeing lines, but once again, Pabachi reveals that there were none, especially since he has no idea what Zig is talking about in the first place. Hearing this, Zig ceases his questions and starts to wonder if his new ability is related to a hidden achievement. He feels that there's a high possibility of this, and suggests that the conditions could have been that he had to reach a certain rank, being trained by an NPC, all while having the worst affinity. Zig thinks hard about it, and is certain that he hasn't ever seen anything like his case on the internet. He also feels like he's the only one who went through all this trouble in the game too. As such, our hero believes that he's probably the only person in all of Arpedia Online with this ability. With this in mind, a smile appears on his face, and he starts to realize that things turned out a lot better than he expected. The scene shifts, and the next thing we see is some kind of flashback memory. It's back when Kang was still Bart's. It was a time when he probably went to get his items fixed at Pabuch's smithy, where the baldy asks him why he's so intent on being alone most of the time. Hearing the question, Bartz is taken aback and starts to recall some very traumatic memories from when he was in college. Bullies told him all kinds of mean things, and in one particular scene, we see them torturing him for telling the truth about something. They laugh at him, mock him, wish death upon him, and insult him, just like my ex. Our hero tries to keep the hurtful words out of his mind, but they are way too many bullies to ignore. They surround him and lash out more insults at him. The bullies blame him for something and demand an apology but that doesn't seem to be the major concern. They're just more interested in making Kang's life miserable. As the memories flash across his mind, we finally find out that the reason he chooses to be alone all the time is that he knows people can't be trusted. 
Fortunately, the traumatic memories are cut short when Kang wakes up at the counter of his family store. He's relieved to see that he was only having a bad dream, and wonders if it's because he didn't sleep well the previous night. You can tell he looks very stressed out. He's sweating and rubbing the back of his neck, like an extremely exhausted person. Another thing that's really stressing him out is the fact that his father is making him look after the store when there are no customers around. Anyway, he's brought out of the thought when his phone starts ringing. He looks at the screen and sees a number that he doesn't recognize. He's pretty confused as to why an unknown caller would be trying to reach him. But there's only one way to find out who the person is so he answers the phone. Kang says hello, and then eagerly awaits the response of the person on the other end. The person finally responds and introduces himself as Yang Ho Shik, who happens to be the customer service manager at Dream Max. As you know, Kang already has bad blood with the organization for abandoning him in his time of crisis, so they're the last people he wants to talk to. Because he's still holding a grudge, Kang attempts to quickly end the call as he tells the manager goodbye. However, Yang Ho Shik manages to stop him from doing that. He tells Kang to wait and reminds him that he contacted them a few days ago, reporting that his account was hacked. Hearing this, Kang suddenly jumps to the conclusion that they have decided to restore his beloved character. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Yang Ho Shik informs him that according to their company policy, they won't be able to restore Bart's, and my boy's vibrant demeanor suddenly turns gloomy again. Thankfully, there's good news, because the company has decided to provide Kang with a small compensation for his unexpected loss. Hearing this, Kang finds it a little annoying that they would call it a compensation when Bart's is his character. In his mind, they shouldn't consider it a gift because it's the character that was taken away from him. Kang bluntly tells the manager that he doesn't need any compensation, and adds that they shouldn't bother calling him if they're not going to restore Bart's. Just when he's about to hang up again, Yang Ho Shik informs him that the compensation they have for him is the newest model capsule worth $8,000. He says this and then asks Kang if he needs it or not. As you'd expect, to an obsessed player of Arpedia Online, that's an irresistible offer. Kang is speechless upon hearing this and is even drooling from the mouth because he's absolutely stupefied by the information. Like a crazy drug addict suffering from withdrawal symptoms, he yells over the phone, confirming that he needs that capsule. So much for not wanting any of their compensation. The scene then shifts to a tropical island, and someone asks the customer service manager if Kang liked the capsule offer. The manager flatters the boss over the phone, claiming that Kang is probably now thanking his stars for the way the director decided to handle the matter. It turns out this man sitting under an umbrella on the island is actually Sun Siokjin, the director of Dream Max. Director Sun is pleased to hear that everything went according to plan, and that Kang has been compensated properly. The curious customer service manager asks the director why he suddenly decided to graciously gift Kang a new capsule at his own expense. While clicking away on his computer, he thinks about a response for a brief moment before revealing his reason. Director Sun explains that even though Kang was hacked, he continues to play the game rather than quitting like most people would. What he finds even more intriguing is the fact that Kang is now playing as a blacksmith, which most players avoid a lot. All of this makes the director very curious, and he asks Yang if he doesn't feel the same way. Director Sun really looks forward to finding out what kind of play our hero will demonstrate in the upcoming update, and the whole thing makes him very excited. Meanwhile, back in the game, we see a poster about the Izo party for Deborah Dungeon. Apparently, the party is recruiting members to go hunting in Deborah Dungeon. They already have a knight, a mage, and an archer. Those who would like to join the party are directed to contact Sia. Meanwhile, Sia walks around the town, wondering why it's so difficult to find a party. She's been having terrible luck finding one, and when she finally does find a potential member, they quickly back out. Seeing how difficult the whole venture is, she contemplates just going for a party of only three members. While walking absentmindedly through the busy streets, she accidentally bumps into someone and we find out that it's none other than our boy Zik. They both immediately apologize to each other at first, but upon looking at the other person, they both point at each other like in the famous Spider-Man meme. Sia remembers that he was the guy that was being chased by the raging boar. She seems happy to see him again, but before she can even complete her next sentence, Zig makes a run for it once again. This guy takes antisocial to another level. In his mind, he's better off running away before things can get annoying. But unfortunately for him, Sia is extremely fast so she quickly and effortlessly catches up to him in no time. She maintains his pace and suggests that they chat for a bit. But my boy is just horrified to see that she's the literal incarnation of Flash. Regardless, he ignores her and keeps trying his best to outrun her. It's futile anyway because she even gets ahead of him just so she can get his attention. She insists that they have a chat, and it doesn't take long before Zig's low stamina manifests again. He quickly gets exhausted and chooses the more logical option to just stop and listen. Even while panting heavily and struggling to catch his breath, he manages to ask her what exactly she wants from him. Not surprisingly, she shows him the paper for her party and asks Zig if he'd like to join them. Pretty sure we all know what his answer is going to be. 
The girl assumes that he's never been to Deborah Dungeon and tells him about the rumors of the place. Deborah Dungeon is said to be a good place for beginners who want to level up, and it's also a very good place to earn a decent amount of money. Sia has no idea, but my boy over here knows all about the Deborah Dungeon. Because back when he was raining on top of this game as Bart's, he was actually the first person who discovered that place. After telling him her desire to go there, she informs him that she's been looking for people to join her, but she only has two members so far. She points out that if Sig joins her party, they'll be four in number, which is the recommended party size in Arpedia Online. Unfortunately, before she even finishes talking, Zig cuts her off, bluntly telling her that he doesn't want to join her party. Sia protests, pointing out that they keep running into each other and claiming that it could be a sign. However, Zig just shakes his head vigorously while saying no about a hundred times. Sia starts to get upset and asks him why he dislikes the idea so much, even when he would get to earn money and level up. Zig just remains silent for a moment, not sure what to say to her. Even after thinking, he still can't get himself to give her a definitive answer. The scene shifts, and we see many players lined up, waiting to meet our hero. Those in the queue start to murmur, wondering if Zig is really as good as they say. Another responds, telling them that although it takes a while, rumors say he has a 100% repair rate on all items. The players are stunned to hear this, because our hero only charges 30 gold for his perfect repairs. We see a signpost, revealing that Zig has already found his own place. His smithy offers services to equipment below D rank and assures a 90% repair rate, all for the measly sum of 30 gold. Of course, it doesn't take long before he starts to get tired due to the huge workload. He wipes the sweat off his face and admits that he didn't think he'd get such a big crowd. He wonders if he should even charge more to reduce the numbers and make more money, but quickly slaps the idea out of his head, reminding himself that he isn't doing it for money and that he still needs to catch the hacker. After setting his priorities straight, he calls for the next customer to bring in their equipment. Just as he suspected, the equipment presented to him is one that he owned as Bart's. It's the ranger's bow, the only D-rank equipment he owned as his previous character. As he collects the bow from the new owner, Zig wonders if he found a clue about the hacker too soon, before quickly deciding that he didn't. He examines the equipment, and notices that there's no insignia. The rude customer tosses him the 30 gold like he's a beggar, and Zig wonders why he's so rude. Another player asks the guy if he's really going to give a girl the bow, and he points out that they have to spend money to get the ladies. Zig overhears their condescending conversation, and gets upset that they'd talk about another player like she's just a sim. The brown-haired guy feels that it's risky to gift her a rare gem, and help her in the dungeons without a guarantee that she'll meet them in real life. On the other hand, the rude guy explains that no one would shamelessly deny a request after receiving all that. On the off chance that she does deny them, the guy claims that they can always threaten to post about her on the community forum. After that, they're confident that they can pressure the girl to go out for drinks with them. Sig just gets more pissed off the longer he listens to the scumbags and feels bad for the girl they're preying on. He tries to focus on repairing the bow, but ends up overhearing the scumbags calling out to the girl. They're so shallow that they don't even remember her name, and that's when Zig flips out, because he remembers that it was Sia, even when he refused to join her party. Sig hands the guys the bow, claiming that the repair is finished. But when the rude guy tries to take it, our hero refuses to let go. The guy starts to get upset, reminding Zig that he already paid him, but my man just thinks about the poster the archer gave him earlier, remembering that her name was mentioned on it clearly. While the scumbag is ranting, Zig concludes that there's no way the username could have been repeated so he becomes certain that it's the same person. We finally find out that the annoying guy's name is Zerus after he falls, because Zig abruptly let go of the bow. Zerus angrily gets back to his feet and curses at Zig before grabbing him by the shirt. He threatens to mess him up if he doesn't apologize right away, claiming that the blacksmith will be forced to uninstall the game after he's done with him. However, before things can get messy, a huge man emerges from the crowd behind and asks Zerus to move aside if he's done with his repair. The big guy doesn't look like his patience can be tested anymore, so with a very serious look on his face, he reminds Zerus and his minion that there are people waiting behind. This guy is either a gym bro or Ernest Kolomov the Giga Chad. And as we start this new video, we find out that this big bearded guy is a famous character in Arpedia, known as Guilford of the Storm, the leader of one of the strongest mercenary guilds in the game, the Red Tiger Company. All of his great feats have made him very popular in the game, and he's also ranked 45th on the server. However, right now he's not in warrior mode or anything, because he's currently waiting in line with the other customers so that he can see the blacksmith when it gets to his turn. Guilford looks at the damaged sword in his hands and recalls the fond memories he had with it. It appears that he had already gone around looking for a blacksmith who could do repairs regardless of the item's maximum durability. Unfortunately, the blacksmith he went to plainly told him that he can't carry out repairs that guarantee a 10 over 10 durability. As such, Guilford came over to Zig's place, hoping he could finally get his beloved sword repaired. 
he stares at the sword longingly and hopes that Zig will be able to repair it, because if he can't, he'll have to go find a person named Gurion. He's drawn out of his thought when he notices Zerus and his brown-haired buddy trying to pick on Zig, and he wonders why they haven't left even though their repairs are finished. That's when he gets fed up with their shenanigans and decides to confront them. Guilford walks up to the guys and tells them to leave if their repairs are finished, pointing out that there are other people waiting in the line. Guilford's red eyes glare at Zerus and not surprisingly, he's terrified to see the famous Guilford of the Storm standing in front of him. He's confused as to why a ranker would be there. The brown-haired friend is just as terrified, so he tells Guilford that they were just about to leave. Of course, Zerus concurs and nervously admits that they were talking for too long anyway. The cowardly duo jet out of the scene in a flash, telling Guilford to have a good day. Seeing how they behave toward him, Guilford thinks that the guys might have been polite fellows after all. Little does he know, they were just a pair of greasy cowards. Throughout all of this, Zig doesn't even say a word. He just looks down quietly while holding his hammer. He finally looks up when Guilford raises the damaged sword, explaining that it's his favorite sword because he has been with it since he was a beginner in the game. Zig takes a closer look at the sword when Guilford asks him whether he can fix it. The fast-rising blacksmith takes the sword and examines it. He claims that it's possible but asks Guilford to wait a moment. Seeing Zig get to work, a sense of renewed hope washes over Guilford because his favorite sword stands a chance of getting fixed. Even though the blacksmith is ranked D and below, he believes that his 99% success rate is incredible. He stares at the young blacksmith in awe, wondering if he has a hidden skill that allows him to fix items to perfection. While Guilford is pondering on the topic, Zig is struggling to stay focused. He's distracted by thoughts about Sia and the scumbags even though he feels it shouldn't concern him. Images of Sia and the guys flash across his mind, making it hard for him to concentrate while hammering the sword. Meanwhile, the big bearded Guilford is still fantasizing about the sword. He even plans to hang it on the guild building once Sig is done with the repairs. Unfortunately, this happy moment turns gloomy when he hears a loud crack. He looks down at Zig's workbench and sees his beloved sword shattered into pieces. Even worse, a tab pops up, informing them that the blacksmith has failed to repair this bloody sword and that it's now in a state of being unusable. Seeing this, Guilford is shocked, horrified, and enraged at the same time. He grabs the handle of the sword after the blade has been broken, and angrily demands to know how Zig managed to destroy it. Before he can get any answers, something funny and annoying happens. Sneaky Zig practically disappears because Kang quickly logged out of the game. A tab pops up to inform Guilford about this and he's even more infuriated, so much that he unknowingly breaks off the remaining parts of the sword in his rage. Guilford angrily asks where the bastard blacksmith went, and yells out for him to come back, cursing at him wherever he might be. The scene shifts to some place in the Rocky Mountains. We see Sia, Zerus, and his fat friend standing in front of a cave. The entrance of the place has chains around it. The three party members stand there in awe as they behold the famous location which was first discovered by Bartz. It's none other than the Deborah Dungeon. Sia has never been here so she's a bit mesmerized by the sight. The two scumbags start to brag about how they've cleared the level several times. They tell her that the dungeon is the lair of the scary witch named Deborah. Deborah is said to have put the entire Barca's kingdom in peril 300 years ago. Zerus assures her that it's just a beginner's level that they can handle, and tells her not to be afraid. However, Sia is a bit frightened, especially after the story they just told her, but Zerus just pats her on the shoulder and suggests that they go into the dungeon right away. Before they can get going, someone yells for them to wait. Sia and the guys turn around and are surprised to see that it's the bloody blacksmith, Zig. He pants heavily like he's been running for miles and is pleased to see that he isn't too late. Zig chuckles nervously, asking if he's at Deborah Dungeon. Sia is delighted to see him and addresses him as Mr. Ungrateful Blacksmith. Well, I personally like to call him the bloody blacksmith. Anyways, Zig gets a bit offended by the term, so he snaps at her, asking who she's calling Ungrateful. In response to his tantrum, Sia bluntly reminds him that he's the one who ran away without even greeting her when they met earlier, even after she saved his life. Even though she was quite upset before, Sia admits that she's happy to see him again because it means that he changed his mind and is now ready to clear the dungeon with her. She then gladly welcomes him to the party, introducing herself as Archer Sia and stretching her hand out to shake his. Seeing her outstretched hand, Zig becomes nervous again, and he hesitates to shake her hand as if she were a different species and just stares at it with uncertainty. Eventually, he doesn't shake her hand and instead just rubs his head nervously. Zig then introduces himself and shyly pleads with her to take care of him. Hearing this, Sia looks up at him and agrees, asking him to also take care of her. After that, she quickly introduces the bloody blacksmith to the two scumbags named Alden and Zerus. She also informs them that he's the blacksmith she was trying to recruit earlier. The three guys have already met each other before, but the archer doesn't know this. She tells Zig that these scumbags are both skilled players over level 70, and while she is still talking, Alden and Zerus begin to recognize the blacksmith. 
At this point, Zig already knows that they recognize him because Alden starts whispering into Zara's ear. They both recognize him as the blacksmith from a while back. When Sia is done with the introductions, Zaris points out that since Zig is a blacksmith, he won't have any battle skills, so he asks the girl if it would be alright to take someone like him along. Hearing this, Sia defends Zig, claiming that he's very strong and that she's even seen it herself. This is the first time Zaris is hearing someone say a blacksmith is strong, so he's pretty skeptical about it. He points out that even if that's the case, a production class character like Zig might be a problem in battle. Just then, our blacksmith reveals that he remembers meeting them at the smithy. Seeing that they're still holding a grudge, he promises to apologize to them for what happened previously, so that they will take care of him during the quest. He starts to invade Zara's personal space, rubbing himself all over him like a house cat. He tries to calm the scumbag down by massaging his shoulders, and promises that he won't say anything stupid. My man promises that they won't have anything to worry about if he's around, and even claims that he'll become Zara's dog henceforth. To prove he isn't kidding, Zig even goes the extra mile and begins barking like a dog. I call him a bloody blacksmith for a reason. Anyways, as you'd expect, Zaris is both irritated and disturbed by how weird the blacksmith is behaving, but ultimately lets him join the party. The scumbags reluctantly welcomes Zig to the team and suggests that they start moving before it gets late. Even though Sia is excited to have a blacksmith on the team, Alden is still very skeptical about it. He quietly asks Zaris if he's sure Zig should come with them, suggesting that he might say something unnecessary along the way. Zaris senses his friend's discomfort but assures him that it's okay for the blacksmith to join them. After all, he believes that if the blacksmith tries to say anything stupid, they can just kill him and pretend it was an accident. He reveals this plan to Alden, explaining that if they try to force the bloody blacksmith out, Sia will think something is off. It doesn't take long before the party heads into the dungeon. Inside, they find several skeletons of soldiers and tree monsters. The monsters and skeletons all have swords and shields. Apparently, they're the guardians of the dungeon or something. Either way, the party gets right to fighting. Alden uses a special magical power to create a huge blast which he calls Revolving Fire, and it ends up destroying several of the skeletons and monsters. Zaris, on the other hand, displays incredible swordsmanship to destroy the monsters, using a spell called Wheel Lash. This spell transforms his sword into a long blue glowing whip, which he uses to destroy the monsters. Sia just watches in awe as she sees the guys and her team perform incredible skill moves. Zaris notices her astonishment and smirks at her, this simp thought that she must have fallen for him already, after seeing his skills and appearance. Unfortunately for him, she's not particularly paying attention to him. He's stunned and outraged when he sees her asking Zig of all people how he just performed a skill. It turns out that Zig isn't half as bad as they expected. In fact, he appears to be a very skilled swordsman, because he is currently soloing the horde of monsters charging at him. Using the skills and knowledge he acquired as Bart's, Zig is able to counter all of the monster's attacks. He knows that the skeleton's weakness is its temple, so that's exactly where he aims for. This time, he's a lot more precise and manages to last the devastating hit on the skeleton. The other monsters are outraged to see he vanquished one of their own, so the bloody blacksmith decides to act a lot smarter. He knows that he doesn't have combat skills, so he decides that his best shot at defeating the wooden monsters is by using tricks. It turns out that these wooden monsters are actually called mobs, and Zig knows that if they surround him, it's game over. As such, he concludes that he needs to get rid of all the mobs in the area as quickly as possible. Zig suddenly charges at the wooden soldiers with his sword. From experience, he knows that their weak point is their power source which happens to be the heart. So, he takes his sword and drives it into the heart of one of the wooden soldiers. And the moment he performs this action, the monster blows up. Unfortunately, that's about the same time that a tab pops up, informing the blacksmith that his stamina is low. He hasn't been fighting for long, but the character is already exhausted and needs to consume food. Zig is pretty disappointed to discover this, but thankfully, he had a contingency plan in case of such emergencies. Before he came to meet them, he actually packed some biscuits with him and he's thankful he thought about it. While Zig is relieved that he brought snacks, Sia is more concerned with fangirling. She points out how difficult it is to kill the mobs with a single shot. Zig managed to do it without even having skills, so it's naturally that she's blown away by his mad techniques. She even starts telling Zaris about it, reminding him that she said the blacksmith is very strong. As you'd expect, the scumbag is very upset that Zig somehow stole the show. He wonders why a noob would dare to act so cocky in battle, and starts to reconsider his earlier decision. Back then, he was feeling gracious, and that was why he allowed Zig to tag along but now that he sees the guy as a threat to his ego, he changes his mind. While the blacksmith just stands there unsuspectingly, Zaris begins plotting schemes to slowly take him out. Sometime later, we see another skeleton soldier appear. It's aiming at them with a bow and an arrow that has a purple flame on it. The skeleton soldier shoots the arrow at them, and it looks like Zaris immediately knows what it is. 
he informs the others that the skeleton soldier has arrived, and just before the purple flaming arrow can hit them, he uses his sword to deflect it with a powerful counter smash skill. However, instead of the arrow going back to the skeleton soldier, it bounces off the sword and goes straight into our blacksmith's chest. It turns out that Zerus' evil plan is already in motion. Seeing that the arrow hits Zik, he chuckles mischievously, thinking that the new hidden skill he learned is very cool. He even believes that it's going to hurt Zig a lot more, because the power of the blast has doubled. Sia is immediately alarmed when she sees Zig hurt. So, she rushes to his aid, asking him if he's okay. That's when a tab pops up, informing the bloody blacksmith that he's going to be paralyzed for the next 10 minutes, and his movement will be reduced. Even though Zig is in tremendous pain, he wants to look strong in front of a girl, so he says that he's absolutely fine, claiming that it's just one arrow. He says this to appear strong, but he's crying in his mind, because he maxed out the pain sensor on the capsule, and now everything hurts like a fucking truck. Zerus just scoffs when he looks at Zig. He tells him that he looks exhausted and suggests that he's already reached his limit because he's a production job class character. Alden chimes in and taunts the blacksmith even more. He jokingly tells his partner scumbag to not be mean, because Zig is probably already embarrassed enough. The two scumbags then suggest that the blacksmith stays there and rest, while the paralysis wears off. They claim that they can't carry him, so it's better if he stays there. However, Sia opposes the idea. She snaps at the two and tells them that they're not leaving him. Zerus tries to make his point, but he's interrupted by Zig, who suddenly agrees to stay behind. Zig tells them that he'll be able to get back on his feet if he rests a little. He promises to catch up with them and the scumbags agree with him. Zerus claims that the blacksmith is right, and reminds Sia that they all know each other's location since they're in the same party. He assures her that she has nothing to worry about. Sia thinks about it for a while and eventually agrees to leave Zig behind. However, before she leaves, she makes our blacksmith a promise to message her the moment he's free from the paralysis. After he assures her that he will, she finally leaves with the others, heading deeper into the dungeon. Once they're out of sight, Zig opens his inventory and heads straight to the potions section. Without wasting any time, he grabs a green potion and gobbles it down. Once he's finished, another tab pops up, stating that he just drank a common antidote potion and as such, he's no longer in a paralyzed state. A devilish smile appears on Zig's face as he wipes off the excess potion in his mouth. His plan had worked, and now he can't wait to get started with the next. Elsewhere, we see that Sia and the others have gone a lot farther into the cave, and Alden holds a torch to lead the way because it's now very dark. Along the way, Zerus suddenly starts asking Sia how she likes the bow. He asks her if it's light, and Alden chimes in, suggesting that it matches her current outfit. Sia takes a closer look at the bow and asks if it's really a low-priced weapon as they said. She doesn't think so, because the bow looks very expensive. Still, Alden just assures her that it's a common weapon at her level, and tells her that she shouldn't feel pressured. Moreover, they're not even archers like her, so they think it would be better if she has it instead. Hearing this, Sia thanks them and decides that rather than accepting the item permanently, she'll just borrow it until they're done with their quest in the dungeon. Alden chuckles mentally when he sees how happy Sia is to have the bow, and I swear this is the most simp behavior I've ever seen. And then, he tells Zerus that it's high time they made their true intentions clear to the girl. Unfortunately, before he can finish his sentence, a rock comes out of nowhere and knocks the staff out of his hand. The whole place turns dark and Zerus asks him what's going on. He claims that a rock suddenly knocked the staff out of his hand, so Zerus understands and asks him to turn the lights back on. After searching through the darkness, Alden finally finds the staff. He informs the others and picks it up, but when he turns the light back on, he's shocked at what he sees. It's another army of skeleton soldiers standing right in front of him, and these are a lot more menacing. Before Alden and Zerus can fully understand what's going on, they're surrounded by the mobs. However, there's another problem, and that's the fact that Sia is no longer with them. By the time they realize she's gone, they're surrounded by many monsters while someone helps the archer escape from the predicament. The skeleton soldier and wooden monsters charge at them so quickly that even Zerus doesn't know what to do. Eventually, he just tells Alden to attack, hoping that they will survive somehow. Meanwhile, Sia finally decides to confront the mystery person dragging her away. She stops running and demands to know who the person is. She's still yelling for the person to let her go, when he suddenly brings the torch closer to his face so she can see it. Of course, the girl immediately stops complaining when she sees that it's none other than our boy Zig. He tells her to calm down, but she can't shake off the curiosity. She is shocked to see him and asks him what's going on. Sia then asks him where they're going, and reminds him that they have to go back so they can save the others. She's afraid the monsters would kill them both, but Zig cheekily tells her not to worry, reminding her that Zerus and Alden are both level 70 players who can take care of themselves. Zig points out that the dungeon is recommended for players around level 45, and since they're a lot higher than that, he believes that they'll be fine. He then suggests that they keep moving forward so they can head deeper into the dungeon. 
Meanwhile, we see that the blacksmith was right in his assumption, because both scumbags actually managed to defeat the monsters. Alden sits on the floor panting and asking if the ambush is over. And Zerus, who's just as exhausted as he is, confirms that they've cleared out all the monsters. Zerus is extremely upset and wonders what kind of brainless bastard would try to gather monsters. He's interrupted when he sees something that catches his attention. It's a set of semi-rare items just lying around in front of them. He shows it to Alden, and he seems curious about them as well. The two friends go to take a closer look and Alden wonders if items like that just drop in the dungeons. However, Zerus doesn't seem to think their source is important. He simply tells Alden to hurry up and grab them. As they pick up the items, they're both mesmerized by the treasure they just scored. Zerus wonders how much the items would be worth in total, and Alden admits that finding it was worth fighting off all the mobs. Unfortunately, before the two can seize the treasure, someone stops them. The person has scarred hands, and judging by his clenched fists, you can tell that a fight is about to go down. The big lady claims that she can't believe they're ready to take the items for themselves, and for some reason, she recognizes them as the famous Zerus and Alden from the notice board. Apparently, they've been very notorious on the server. Zerus tries to intimidate her for talking rudely to him, calling her and her party members some low-level shit stains. And that's when the girl reveals that she and the other players behind her are the actual owners of the items. Unfortunately for the scumbags, she's come especially prepared to face these fools, and even selected her main character, the level 100 Wang Chialsu. So, what's the whole grudge about and why did this lady have to bring her strongest avatar to face them? Well, as you know, Zerus and Alden are scumbags and they're also notorious on the server's bulletin board for harassing female players. These losers even threaten female players to meet them in real life, and no one ever knows what happens after they meet in real life. However, because of the way the female users quit the game after the meetings, it doesn't seem good. The reason the problem never got out of hand is that the people they harassed just logged out of the game and disappeared afterward. As such, there was never anyone to complain about them. Because of this, our hero made up his mind and decided that he would be the one to kick the two scumbags out of the game for good. Back in the game, we see a flashback of Zig's master plan. He first of all stole the items from the real owner. Because he knew the traits of the Deborah dungeon too well, it was very easy for him. He disguised himself, took the items and kept them lying around for Zerus and Alden to find them. Before then, he grouped the mobs so that they would attack. In the end, the scumbags defeated the mobs, found the items and then got framed for what the blacksmith did earlier. It was Zig, who made Wang Chiaosu to come back more prepared because she wanted to deal with the person that stole her items. Unfortunately for Zerus and Alden, they're now taking the fall for it. Zig's master plan is what he calls dungeon backstabbing, and apparently, it was a pretty popular thing in the past that the players hated a lot. As such, Wang and her party members are not planning to go easy on the two guys who supposedly brought back the forbidden trick. Wang and the others surround the scumbags, and even though they try to prove their innocence, there's no evidence to support it. Just like Zig predicted, by the time Wang and her party members are done beating up the scumbags, they're both forced to quit the game. After the whole saga, Sia checks the party board and is surprised to see that the scumbags have logged out of the game. She wonders if they died, but our hero informs her that they didn't. He claims that he received a message from them, saying that they had urgent business to attend to. Sia wonders why they didn't message her as well, and Zig just states that he doesn't know, suggesting that she can ask them whenever they come online again. What a smartass. The bloody blacksmith says this, but he knows that they won't ever log into the game with the same characters ever again. Seeing that the only members above level 45 are no longer around, Sia suggests that they head back. With Sia being at level 42 and Zig being at only level 38, he agrees with her, stating that the quest would be too difficult for them to handle. On the way back, Zig thinks about how he successfully forced the scumbags out of the game and decides that it's time he went back to blacksmithing. Stupid Sia then suddenly says it's a shame she didn't get to clear the dungeon. It turns out that for some reason, she won't be able to play the game anymore. Zig hears this and is immediately touched, so he tells her to wait and suggests that they go back into the dungeon. Even though he doesn't feel like finishing the quest, he wants to help the dumb girl, so he tells her that since they're already there, they should just go into the dungeon to defeat the boss. Our hero had suggested taking down the dungeon boss with the archer girl. Hearing him suggest such a thing makes Sia very confused, and she's practically speechless when he says that they should go in to defeat the boss on their own. After noticing this disbelief and confusion on her face, Zig admits that he knows how difficult things are for her. All of a sudden, he starts trailing off when he recalls a memory from when he was younger and remembers a time when his mom smashed his video game because he couldn't play it without crying. After that, she practically banned him from using the computer for quite some time. Thinking that the girl might be in a similar situation because she hinted at not being able to play again, Zig starts to get emotional. He feels that he needs to give Sia an unforgettable memory, so he hopes that she will agree to fight the boss with him. 
Seeing the bloody blacksmith acting all weird is a little overwhelming for the girl, but she finally surmises that he just badly wants them to hunt the boss together. She asks him if this is what he means, and the blacksmith confirms it while wiping the tears off his face. In the very next moment, he's surprised when he looks and sees that Sia is already heading for the dungeon. She calls out to him, telling him to hurry up, but my boy is just confused how she got there so quickly. That's when he realizes that the doors have already started closing. He desperately runs as fast as he can to get to the door, before he gets locked out of the dungeon. Thankfully, he makes it just in the nick of time. His short ponytail almost even got caught by the doors closing behind him, and he heaves a heavy sigh of relief since he wasn't locked out. That's when Sia suddenly asks him a very important question. Are the two of them enough to hunt and defeat the boss? In response, Zig explains that it would be pretty plausible if the boss is on the level of the stone golem. He takes the opportunity to brag a little, claiming that whatever happens, they'll have no problem since he's around. Sig reveals that he knows the Deborah dungeon like the back of his hand, and assures her that they'll be fine. During his days as Bart's, Sig actually cleared the dungeon over a hundred times all by himself. It actually got to a point that his muscle memory wouldn't allow him to make any mistakes, even if he tried doing it intentionally. As such, he's confident that he can help the girl out. On top of that, Zig concludes that it wouldn't be such a bad idea, since he can also level up in the process. Along the way, Sia starts to get uncomfortable. She points out that it's been a while since they entered the dungeon, and yet, they still haven't seen anything at all. Zig confidently assures her that the boss will probably appear soon if they just wait a little longer, especially since he knows that the stone golem stays in its boulder form most of the time. He sits on the floor while saying this, but a loud squeak suddenly gets their attention. It turns out that our boy accidentally sat down on a hamster. As the hamster continues squeaking, they both realize what just happened. The blacksmith picks up the hamster, and Sia is immediately mesmerized by its cuteness. Our hero is already aware of this hamster, it's a creature that always sticks around the stone golem. He starts pinching the tiny bugger's cheek, and realizes that the stone golem must also be nearby. And so, he orders the little creature to go on and call out to his big brother. However, that's when something unexpected happens. The ground suddenly starts shaking, and Zig concludes that it's happening because the golem is already on its way. All the rocks in the cave start to move, and he tells the archer to dodge to the sides. Zig is pretty pissed that out of all the places the golem could spawn, it just happened to be right under where they were standing. And just then, all the rocks suddenly start coming together in the sky to form the body of the golem. As its massive feet hit the ground, the wind blows with such force that it knocks up a lot of heavy debris on the floor. Zig and Sia look up at the massive creature, and a tab pops up, revealing that this is the level 60 giant stone golem. It's a giant automaton made by the Deborah dungeon, and we also find out that it's the sentinel that guards the dungeon. Not surprisingly, Sia is very overwhelmed by the golem, and with a horrified look on her face, she asks the blacksmith if they can actually hunt such a big monster on their own. Of course, with a confident grin etched on his face, the blacksmith simply assures her that they can do it, but only if they can follow his strategy. Suddenly, my dude starts charging at the giant golem with his sword, before the girl can even understand what's going on. When she finally sees his plan, she tells him that she'll cover for him by pulling out her bow and shooting the golem in the arm. The massive beast is pretty unfazed by the hit, even though it loses 40 life points as a result. Enraged, the giant golem roars and charges at our girl. Before she can manage to shoot another arrow, it easily knocks her away and sends her flying. Zig immediately retaliates when he sees this. He taunts the monster and gets its attention by calling it a rock-headed dummy. I didn't think golems had feelings, but the massive rock turns to Zig regardless. The blacksmith challenges it, claiming that he's its opponent. He yells for the stone golem to fight him as he slashes its leg with his sword, and the strike takes away 15 points from the monster. Our hero notices that the impact gave him an injury on his hand, and he's baffled because he was the one who attacked. He wonders why he would get hurt and almost starts crying, but he's interrupted when the furious golem turns to him again. It tries to smash him into the ground, but he dodges the attack by leaping into the air like a cat. Although he managed to avoid getting hit, Zig is certain that his ability to jump is very slow. He's disappointed that his stats are so much lower than he expected, because he's very used to Bartz's agility and speed. Regardless, he knows that now is not the time to give up. From experience, he knows that he needs to first get on top of the golem's head to defeat it. But before he can execute any of his plans, the stone golem's massive hand is heading forward to smash him. It's coming so fast that he doesn't really know what exactly he should do. But just in the nick of time, he notices the arrow still stuck in the golem's arm and comes up with an idea. The smirk on his face suggests that he finally has a solid plan in mind. Zig pushes his body to the max and continues to dodge all of the golem's attacks. Sia chases after the monster and calls out to Zig to help, but he just tells her not to come his way. He then continues to evade all the monster's hits and orders Sia to shoot at the golem's joints from afar. 
the girl understands the assignment and immediately sets loose another arrow. It hits the golem and removes another 40 points from its total health. After that, she shoots another arrow that removes 30 points, and this time, the blast even knocks the tiny hamster off the golem's body. At this point, Sia has gone into beast mode, because she instantly follows up with another shot that takes away 16 points from the monster. By the time she is done shooting, we see that she's left an arrow in almost all of the stone golem's joints. Meanwhile, the bloody blacksmith gulps down another potion on the sidelines. When he's done, he wipes his mouth and reveals that he's found the way to defeat the golem. All of a sudden, there's a massive explosion inside the dungeon, and the force is so great that it sends the potion bottle flying towards the golem. It bounces off the stone monster's body, and Sig uses the momentum from the blast to fly over the massive creature. While he's in the air, he turns upside down and goes in for a powerful dive with his sword pointed at the creature's head. Our hero knows that a golem's weak point is its core, and just as he expected, the Viscous Dream Max company made sure that the giant golem's core would be located in its crown. With this in mind, Zeke buries his sword on the top of the golem's head, not allowing it a single chance to react. My guy uses all the momentum he managed to muster and generates enough force to crack right into the monster's head. The cracks in the golem's head begin to glow with a bright red color, and the blacksmith smiles in satisfaction, knowing that he successfully hit it on its weak point. Feeling accomplished, he suggests that it's time to head to the reward room. Unfortunately, something unexpected happens first. The giant golem suddenly tosses our hero off its head and immediately starts to roar as the red color from its head glows even brighter. Zig falls off, shocked at what happened, and even loses his sword in the process. Thankfully, before he can fall to his demise, Sia catches him like Superman would usually catch Lois Lane. With a worried look in her eyes, she holds him in her arms and asks him if he's gay. I mean okay. Zig is still so shaken by what just happened that he doesn't even realize that he's being carried like a baby. Guess it's not that important right now, since he would have died if she hadn't caught him from falling. My guy looks into the girl's eyes and admits that he's okay thanks to her help. Eventually, he gets down from her arms to catch his breath. Sia tells him to hide for a bit and recover while she faces the monster herself to buy them some time. Of course, our hero is surprised to hear her say this and points out that they're almost done hunting. But before he can finish his sentence, he's interrupted by the roar of the giant stone golem. It appears to be angrier than before, and judging by the terrifying red glow emanating from its body, the both of them realize that there's a serious problem. They wonder what could be happening to the stone monster, when suddenly, another tab pops up to reveal that the boss monster has entered its berserk state. They've somehow managed to push the boss to a state where its core is damaged, and can no longer be used to control it. But to make matters worse, the golem's speed and attack power has now increased by a significant margin. At this point, the berserk stone golem is so enraged that it has molten magma flowing out of its head. It tries to smash our hero once again, but I guess my guy isn't gay because he keeps dodging. Still, for someone who has cleared the dungeon over a hundred times, he sure looks lost as fuck. His formerly calm and confident demeanor has totally disappeared, because it appears that he's never encountered the golem in this state. After evading most of the hits, he's now exhausted and confused. He doesn't even believe what's happening at the moment, he's just afraid that he will lose for the first time because he was trying to show off and didn't take the dungeon seriously. Zig tries to charge at the berserk golem again, but quickly gets swatted away like a fly. He's now reaping the bitter fruit for being overconfident, because he felt that since he cleared the dungeon a hundred times before, it would just be another walk in the park. As the golem smashes the ground, the force blows him away along with the girl, but he still manages to get back up and attack it again. Unfortunately, it ends with the same result once again. Since this is the first time he's facing such a weird attack pattern from the monster, our hero is having a really rough time. As the berserk golem throws him back once again, Sig remembers how that wouldn't have been an issue back when he was Bart's. Back then, it didn't matter if he was facing an opponent for the first time or seeing an unfamiliar attack pattern, he would always manage to overcome any obstacles. But now, he's no longer the same character, and as he falls to the ground, the reality of his predicament dawns on him. To add salt to his wounds, his sword gets broken by the golem. It's hard for Zig to accept that he's no longer as skilled as he used to be, especially in such a crucial battle. He falls to his knees and looks at his broken sword as the berserk golem stands behind him, preparing to finish him off. But then suddenly, there's a huge blast in the radius. Someone unleashes a mighty power shot on the golem's head, and a massive explosion follows. Zig's eyes pop out in shock as he hears the loud blast coming from behind him. He's snapped out of his daze when Sia pulls his hand and drags him away from the golem. He follows her of course, but remains stunned by what just happened. The girl tells him to follow her, and suggests that they find somewhere to hide and recover their health. Their collective HP is so low that their lives are at risk, so of course, hiding would be their best course of option. 
Si urges the blacksmith to run faster, and they manage to hide behind a huge boulder before the golem can find out which way they went. The berserk golem scans the area with its terrifying red eyes and patrols the dungeon in search of the duo. While the golem frantically searches for them, Zig catches his breath, and Seer reveals that she checked for exits and didn't find any. Just as they expected, if they want to get out of the dungeon alive, they'll have to defeat the boss. Seer reveals that she tried attacking the golem's core as well, but found out her attempts were pointless. The girl is still talking, when the bloody blacksmith just literally zones out, almost like he's falling asleep. Sia calls for his attention, but he just tells her that they can't break the golem. Mr. Confidence has suddenly given up, and Sia is shocked to hear him talk like a depressed monkey who just had its banana stolen by a baboon. Zig reveals that this is the first time he is facing this type of golem, and claims that it might be a hidden pattern that only occurs under special conditions. He claims that they need to either suppress the golem with a damage dealer, or determine an attack strategy that will actually work. Unfortunately, neither of the options seems to be available to them because their levels are too low. As a result, Zig suggests that the best option would be to die in a way that inflicts the least amount of pain. Naturally, our archer girl is both shocked and a bit disappointed to hear him say this. However, my man just stays down on the floor like a defeated soldier, claiming that there's nothing else they can do. Their levels are far too low, and he feels that they can't really find a strategy against the new attack pattern. Even though Zig has given up, Seer refuses to emit the same shameless behavior. She gets back on her feet, and insists that the best thing they can do is to at least try and figure out the new pattern of attack. If they're going to fail anyway, the girl suggests that it's better to take up the challenge. The blacksmith tries to protest, reminding her that their levels are too low to take any risks, but the girl just cuts him off. Sia takes her bow instead, and starts running out of their hiding spot. Before she leaves, she reminds Zig that she's at level 42, and he's at level 38 and by virtue of simple mathematics, combining their levels puts them at level 80, which is more than enough to defeat the boss. Not surprisingly, Zig finds this logic to be very flawed. He claims that it doesn't make sense, since that's not how the game works. However, she cuts him off once again, explaining that if they work together, things will certainly work out for them one way or another. While Zig cowers behind the rock, Sia sprints back into battle. She shouts for him to hurry up and join her, claiming that she'll be waiting for his backup. This is when we get a flashback, and the scene shifts to the real world where we see Kang's younger brother entering his room. Kang is lying on the floor, curled up under a blanket, and Haiyan breaks the silence by confronting him about his sudden decision to drop out of college. He asks Kang how he thinks the rest of the family will react to such a decision, and my boy just stays mute the entire time. Eventually, Haiyan reveals that their mother is crying out of concern for his future. But still, Kang refuses to say anything. So in the end, Haiyan goes closer to his brother and reminds him of when they were younger. Back then, Kang used to beat up all the kids who would bully his younger brother. He reminds Kang how he was larger than the bullies back then, so they couldn't really do anything to him in return. That's when we finally see our hero's face, and discover that he's covered in bruises. Haiyan suddenly points out that his once reliable brother is no longer the way he used to be. Now he's just a scrawny loser with a hunched back, and even looks creepy at first glance. The words finally start reaching his ears, when Haiyan slaps him with the truth that he's no longer good at studying, and that the only thing he's good at is playing games. Eventually, Kang reaches his limit and he snaps at his little brother, asking him what the fuck he's trying to say. In response, Haiyan tells him to notice the people around him. This statement hits him hard, because he knows exactly what his brother means. Haiyan admits that he doesn't know what's going on with Kang, but asks him why he didn't consider telling him or any of his friends. But in the midst of saying this, the little brother corrects himself, pointing out that Kang has no friends. Once again, our hero tries to confront his younger brother, but before he can say anything, Haiyan starts walking out of the room on his own. On his way out, he tells Kang that there are many things he can't do by himself, even if you may not believe it. Finally, he walks out of the room and leaves the door ajar. From outside the room, he tells our hero to come down and eat the kimchi stew that their mom has cooked up. He says this, and then tells Kang to hurry up because he'll be waiting. Sia said the same thing in the game, and it appears that it's what actually triggered the memory for Kang. Back in the game, we see a massive and powerful gust of wind blasting at the Berserk Golem. The hit takes out a whopping 97 points from the monster's health pool, and the archer exclaims in delight upon seeing it. Unfortunately, the joy is short-lived, because she's immediately notified that her mana pool is low, and that she needs to rest. Apart from that, her stamina is also low, so she now needs to eat food if she's going to continue fighting. Even though she's exhausted, she smiles in satisfaction, knowing that she did her best. Although she's surprised that she's already reached her limit, the girl accepts her fate as the berserk golem attempts to smash her into the ground. Fortunately, before she can get planted into the ground, Zig suddenly arrives and pushes her out of the way to save her. The golem smashes the ground instead, and is bewildered when it sees that girl is not there. 
Meanwhile, on the other side of the dungeon, Zig thanks Sia for buying him some time. He gets back to his feet, revealing that he completely recovered his HP and stamina. The blacksmith then admits that Sia was right about what she said before. He now believes that since they're going to die anyway, they should at least put up a good fight. While saying this, one of the items in his inventory materializes in his hands. It's a pickaxe, presumably from his mining adventure. Zig declares that the battle is going to be all or nothing, and as the berserk golem tries to attack him, he charges back at it with an axe. With his renewed motivation and replenished stamina, our hero takes a big swing at the golem's hand and unleashes significant damage by removing a massive 180 points. This attack results in a part of the golem's arm exploding. Zig can't believe it worked, and is surprised to discover that pickaxes are the berserk golem's weakness. Zig finds it hard to believe it's true, because according to the system, the pickaxe doesn't have an attack power. To confirm, he decides to try hitting the golem's broken hand again with the weapon. Unfortunately, he keeps missing thanks to his low combat aptitude, and it gets really hard to find out. He starts to wonder if there was a big fluke the first time, but ultimately decides that it can't be the case, because he saw that there was a system alarm earlier. Zig continuously tries to figure out how the pickaxe works, and just then, Sia calls out to him, warning him to look up. When he turns around, he sees the golem's other fist flying toward him. My man just sits there helplessly, knowing that he probably won't be able to dodge it. But just before his seemingly inevitable demise, Zig suddenly sees blue lines on the fist as it races toward him, which triggers yet another memory. The memory flashes across his mind, and he recalls a time when Pebuchi told him how ores are made of several different types of materials combined. He explained that even though they become one due to pressure, there are still some gaps between the various materials. The senior blacksmith admitted that Zig might not be able to tell at his level at the time, but he assured him that if he strikes the gaps accurately, he can mine something incredible. The keyword Zig got from the memory was mining, and with that in mind, he raises his pickaxe to clash with the golem's fist. This results in a massive surge of energy flowing through the golem's body, causing its entire arm to explode. Zig suddenly smirks at the golem, claiming that he's finally found his weak point, and judging by the horrified look on the golem's face, it's safe to say that our hero was right. Regardless, the giant stone monster isn't going down without a fight, so it tries to attack the blacksmith one last time. Unfortunately for the monster, the blacksmith now has the cheat code. Zig says the magic words again, and repeatedly strikes the golem with his pickaxe on all of its limbs, until they all explode in sequence and the monster is practically crippled. The golem's arms and legs are shattered to bits, while its angry head remains intact. And then, a notification pops up, informing Zig that he's succeeded in mining. He has obtained 10 marbles, and also increased his skill proficiency by 30. After seeing our hero's brilliant and magnificent display to defeat the giant berserk golem, the archer girl is stunned beyond belief. Her eyes pop out as she stares at him in awe, and the only thing she can say is incredible. What makes the accomplishment even more unbelievable is the fact that he managed to defeat the boss in Deborah Dungeon, despite being a production skill character. And that's besides the fact that he wasn't even up to the recommended level for the quest. Zig is clearly exhausted by now, but manages to stay upright so he can finish the quest. With a victorious grin on his face, he then points his pickaxe at the golem as it sits there like a big chunk of rock that it is. At this point, the golem already knows it's game over, so our hero proceeds to finish the job by landing his most powerful strike yet. The monster's fate is sealed by a massive explosion, and a tab pops up, confirming that Zig and Sia have defeated the berserk giant stone golem. After blowing up the berserk golem, Zig picks up one of the pieces and examines the rock. He realizes that his special ability to see the lines can also be used for mining. He thinks about how the lines were so faint earlier that he didn't even notice them, and they only became more obvious when he truly focused on finding them. Regardless of how the entire thing went down, Zig is pretty satisfied that he successfully hunted the Deborah Dungeon Stone Golem. He feels proud of his accomplishment, even when he hasn't seen that attack pattern before. Not to mention, it's even more impressive because he's not the skilled warrior character he used to be. Zig is about to start praising himself when Sia interrupts him with praises of her own. She calls him incredible, and is extremely astonished by the fact that he successfully hunted down the boss, even as a production skill character. She almost jumps on top of him in her excitement, and is so impressed by his feet that she can't even compose herself anymore. She places her hands on his shoulders, eagerly asking him how he was able to do it. She claims that she wants to know so she can be like him, but Zig casually laughs it off, telling him that it's a trade secret. Zig claims that he can't just easily reveal it to her, and while they're still standing there, their characters start to get transported out of the dungeon. And in a matter of seconds, Zig and Sia disappear from the place. The scene shifts, and we see the both of them reappear in some kind of factory or something. The game system drops them on their bottoms at the place, and they both wince in pain. Seeing the place for the first time, Sia becomes uncomfortable, so she asks Zig where they are. 
it appears that the blacksmith also hasn't been here before, but from his experience, he presumes that it must be the reward room since they just defeated the boss. While rubbing his head, he takes a look around and begins to doubt his earlier assumption. At this point, he's just as confused as the girl, and starts to wonder what the place is. By looking at some of the things around, like mob models and other scientific stuff, Sia suggests that they might be in some sort of lab where the mobs are created. Zig is quite certain that the Deborah Dungeon Reward Room doesn't look anything like this place, and he should know that, since he's cleared the level over a hundred times before. However, he begins to suspect that it might just be the rumored production room of Deborah. While Sia takes a look around the lab, Zig ponders deeply on why the game would bring them there. He wonders if that's where the game takes players who defeat the berserker giant stone golem, rather than the regular boss. It's his first time seeing all the contraptions in the lab, so he's really puzzled by all of them. His thoughts are suddenly interrupted when Sia calls out to him, revealing that she found a chest. Upon hearing this, Zig is immediately excited, because he already has a feeling he knows what that means. With a crazed look in his eyes, he's very excited to see that they might actually be in a reward room after all. When the archer opens the chest, the first thing she finds is a pair of goggles, which she wasn't expecting to see at all. It turns out that the goggles are actually a rare item, called eagle eyes. The item increases the user's accuracy by 20%, and increases their range by 30% as well. That's not all, because the user's finesse is also increased by 13. This rare artifact was created by the witch of the game world. Zig loses all self-control when he sees that the pair of goggles is a rare item, and desperately asks Sia to show it to him, but she just pushes him back, telling him she doesn't want to. After all, the girl believes that it's her reward to claim. When she refuses to let him have a look, the blacksmith just sighs and goes back to search for another reward. Zig expects that there are a minimum of two reward chests in the game, and it doesn't take long before he finds the second reward chest. When he does, he's so excited that he lifts it in the air and yells out that he's found it. Unfortunately, this great joy is short-lived, when he opens the chest and finds a normal artifact. As you'd expect, he's both shocked and disappointed to see this. He holds the artifact in his hands and stares at it with great sadness. As if he isn't disappointed enough, a tab suddenly pops up, informing him that the artifact is called the Witch's Gloves. It grants the user an extra 3 points to their defense power, and does the same for their magic power. Even though the reward is way below his expectations, Zig admits that it's better than nothing, so he puts the gloves on. The next thing he finds in the chest is a piece of paper that contains the first half of the Guardian blueprint. Upon completing the blueprint, the blacksmith will be able to learn how to make the Black Iron. The Black Iron is a Guardian robot of some sort, which Deborah attempted to create in the past. After reading the paper and realizing what it is, my man is really excited and pumped up. He's got his joy back, and is intrigued by the prospect of being able to create the robot using the blueprint. He practically has an artistic explosion in his head, as different ideas for the robot start flooding his mind. Zig thinks about how crazy the whole thing is, and wonders if he can start making the robot immediately. Before he can, however, he has to meet the necessary construction prerequisites, which are an alloy rank 5, assembly rank 3, and summoning magic rank 7. Zig then goes back to check the chest, and finds out the last thing inside is a book. He wonders if it's a skill book, but quickly finds out that it's a guide. The book in his hands is Hero Carwin's manual. It contains the records left behind by Carwin, the hero who defeated the witch Deborah. If a blacksmith reads the book, the skills of grain and arm break can be learned. Another tab pops up, revealing the grain skill learning prerequisites. They involve having the worst affinity for blacksmithing, Mount Lankel quest completion, and production skill rank 6. As for the arm break skill, the prerequisites involve mind skill, defeating the berserk giant stone golem, and having a skill rank 7. After reading this, Zig realizes that he's already eligible to use the grain skill, so he decides to use it right away. However, he still doesn't know what exactly he would use the skill for so he gets back to reading. In the manual, Zig sees that Carwin wrote that he doesn't know anything else. However, he revealed that defeating the witch's golems wasn't an easy task. As for the giant stone golem, it was even more difficult. Carwin's manual reveals that he heard an important suggestion from one blacksmith. The blacksmith told him that all ores are made of several different types of materials combined, and that there are still some gaps between the various materials. It was those words that opened the path for Carwin to destroy the golem. He was then able to raise his ability to see the grains of all materials, and made a skill to amplify it further. This skill is what he then called the grain skill. As Carwin trained in the grain skill, he was able to learn how to destroy ores and armaments, which eventually led him to create the skill that he called Arm Break. Zig reads all of this with a lot of focus and interest, astounded by the idea of being able to destroy armaments, and finding the skill to be incredible. He continues reading the manual and we see that Carwin's battle against the witch is not over. Deborah will return, bringing forth a powerful army with her, and this is the reason Carwin didn't destroy the witch's cave but chose to leave it as it is. 
Carwin hoped that those who came after him to train against the witch's dregs so that they could learn to fight against the army she would return with. After Zig is done reading, he thinks about what Carwin said about Deborah returning with an army. He's also intrigued that only a blacksmith can learn the hero Carwin's skills. Sia notices him deep in thought so she goes to check up on him. She asks him if he doesn't like his reward, but she assures her that he does. What he feels for the reward goes beyond just liking, because he was able to learn a hidden skill with it. Hearing this, the girl suggests that it's time they left. Zig is speechless when he turns to look at her and sees the mess she made while searching for other rewards. When the duo makes it out of the dungeon, Sia first of all lets out a loud yawn and stretches her body. She admits that it feels like forever since she saw the sky, and without a doubt, our boy agrees. He points out that their quest in the dungeon took a whole day, and guesses that it's over eight hours in the real world. Sia is a bit shocked to hear this, and thinks that she should log out of the game and return to her real life. Before she leaves, Zig tries to summon the courage to ask her something quite personal, but she beats him to it when she suddenly asks him what his age is in real life. The question takes him by surprise, but he manages to tell her he's 20 years old without stuttering. Hearing this, Sia stretches out her hand for a handshake and reveals that they're the same age. She smiles at him and suggests that they become friends henceforth. Zig is too stunned to move or even say anything. Then he just stands there moping, so the girl asks him if he's not going to shake her hand. He snaps out of his daze and after stuttering a bit, he shakes her hand. Sia then tells him that she's added him on the messenger and suggests that they meet up again next time. Suddenly, she tells him that she'll contact him once the test period is over and Zig is shocked to hear this. She sees his expression and explains that her midterms are fast approaching, and that's the reason she wanted to quickly clear the dungeon before then. She claims that she could have still done it in two weeks since her tests will be over by then, but admits that she had a lot of fun with Zig. Anyway, the girl reveals the real reason she wouldn't be able to play, and now our boy feels incredibly stupid for blowing it out of proportion. The reason turns to be nothing more than a school exam, and holy fuck, I accidentally predicted the entire thing in the last episode. I know people won't believe me, but that was legit just a wild guess. The realization is quite annoying and Sig finds it hard to hide that he's upset. Sia sees this and teases him for being upset. She then playfully punches him in the face, but it leaves a noticeable mark. In fact, it cracks his fucking skull. The girl urges him to feel better, telling him that he's making it look like they would no longer be able to see each other again. She's still trying to cheer him up when Zig suddenly disappears. It turns out that her playful punch was so strong that it killed our boy, banishing him back to the real world. A tab pops up, informing her that she's killed Zig and will now be marked as a murderer. Of course, our archer girl is horrified to see what she has done. While she's freaking out about the whole thing, our boy asks her to pick up the items he left behind. She continues to panic because her username is now red, making it obvious that she's a murderer. She is afraid that it won't go away and continues to lose her mind while Zig tries to get her to pick up his items. Zig tries to calm her down, but she ignores him and he just gets frustrated. The scene shifts and we see a delivery truck arriving at Zig's house. It's the compensation that Dream Max Company decided to send him. Upon receiving the new capsule, Zig unpacks it and instantly activates it. As he's about to be transported to Arpedia Online, we find out that it's been a week since the Stone Golem hunt in Deborah Dungeon. Since then, he has grinded his grain skill, along with his crafting and repair skills. While using grain, he achieved a 100% success rate and the quality of the equipment turned out quite impressive. As a result, within a week, he became a famous master blacksmith in Balden. The moment Sig enters the game, he immediately notices how much more real the experience is compared to when he was using the older capsule model. Before he can even take in the whole thing, he's surrounded by a sea of people, begging him to fix their items. Zig explains that he has to take a quest later in the day, so he can't really fix their equipment. The players are upset to hear this, and each of them even begins to demand that he only attend to them and ignore the rest. Suddenly, a man standing in the commotion claims that a slime king showed up on the Urk Plains. This gets the attention of the crowd, and they're shocked to hear that the rare mob has showed up. Without skipping a beat, every single one of them bolts out of there, heading for the Urk Plains. However, the mysterious man who started the rumor remains behind, and Zig suddenly remembers that the slime king doesn't spawn in the Urk Plains. The mysterious blonde-haired man then expresses his relief that he and Zig can now speak in peace and reveals that he has come to scout our hero. This is when we head into a new chapter, and the scene shifts to Kang's life at the NLS Civil Servant Academy. While in class, another student notices something off about Kang. For some weird reason, he's riding insanely fast and the guy is finding it difficult to wrap his head around it. The other student watches in awe and concludes that Kang isn't your average guy. Eventually, he forgets about our hero and focuses on his work instead. 
You see, it's been a month since Bart's got hacked, and since then, our hero has attained fame like he had planned, but still hasn't found any clues about who the hacker might be. Because, because most of Bart's equipment were high-ranking gear, Kang felt it was necessary for him to raise Zig's level as quickly as possible. He looked for methods to do this quickly, and in the process, he found himself on the North Arc trade route exploration quest. In addition to leveling up quickly, Kang believes that the trade route will become established if he succeeds in the quest. If this happens, there will be a large change in Arpedia, to the point that it might end up needing an update. As such, Kang is determined to be there when the update comes out, and decides that he can't miss out on such a fun quest. The quest was recently announced by the King of Barkas, and it involves dispatching a delegation to establish a trade route with the dwarven country of North Ark. Because the quest giver is a king, according to the rumors, many predict that the rewards and experience will be incredible. It turns out that North Ark is the land of the dwarves, who are known for their excellent blacksmithing. So this makes Kang even more excited to go there as Zig, because he sees it as a great opportunity he shouldn't miss. However, the only problem is that system-wise, his reputation and level are too low, and he fears that if he applies for it at the moment, he will most definitely fail. Kang gets frustrated, and vents out his anger by pulling on his hair. The classmate from earlier sees this, and is now even more convinced that Kang is an irregular dude. Anyway, the scene shifts back to the game, and we see the blonde-haired man talking to Zig. He introduces himself as the Gold Rush Merchant Union's Balden branch leader, Dylan. He reveals that he's come to recruit our hero, since he's become famous as Balden's King of Repair. He even promises to compensate Zig for his services, and politely requests that he come with him as well. Hearing this, Zig ponders for a while, mumbling and thinking that he should at least try and request something in return first. Dylan calls out to him, asking if he can hear him, but the blacksmith pretends that he cannot. Dylan then starts to get frustrated, because he knows that our guy is pretending. He points out that he heard him clearly fine just now, but he assumes that he's from a guild so he tells him to just go away. Hearing Zig's assumption, Dylan laughs, realizing that the blacksmith doesn't know much about the gold rush. My man tries to argue that he knows about it, and while picking his nose in an annoying way, he states that the gold rush is a place that always ends up in second place among the merchant guilds. Even though Dylan is pretty offended by this, he covers his anger with a laugh and points out that even second place is quite amazing. He admits that they've been coming second for a long time but he claims that it's about to change very soon. Dylan makes the bold statement that they'll soon come first, and then asks Zig if he's willing to join them and become among the best in Arpedia. To make the offer more tempting, the man reveals that they've specially set aside a signing bonus for our hero, but before he can finish his sentence, Zig bluntly states that he doesn't want to join them. Dylan doesn't hear him the first time and just keeps talking, until he suddenly realizes that my guy is blatantly rejecting the offer. Dylan is shocked and frustrated, so Zig points out that he doesn't want to join any guild, because he knows that they'll treat the blacksmiths poorly. He claims that the blacksmiths will be treated like white elephants, and not be included in the hunting parties. Zig further states that he will be forced to do menial chores, while all the goods they produce will be intercepted at very low cost. After making his point, Zig asks Dylan if their guild will be any different. Dylan laughs nervously, and admits that those types of guilds don't exist, so he asks him what he thinks about becoming an associate of the Gold Rush. Zig is surprised to receive the offer, and Dylan admits that they usually only give the opportunity to high-level users. He explains that there's nothing much to becoming an associate, and tells him that he can simply register on the guild's homepage. Afterward, all he has to do is keep in touch from time to time with Dylan, who would act as his manager. Unlike formal members of the guild, the blacksmith won't have any obligations. In addition, whenever he offers gear to the guild or takes charge of some repairs, they'll repay him with money or information. Dylan explains that Zig can just start his relationship with the guild in this manner and join them officially if he ends up liking the benefits. On the other hand, if the guild isn't to his liking, Dylan reveals that he can just let them know of his intentions to reject their offer in six months. After he is done preaching and pitching his suggestions, the blacksmith thinks long and hard about his decision, to the point where it even gets a bit annoying. He eventually agrees and intentionally runs his snot on the man's shoulder to seal the deal. Unfortunately for Dylan, Zig isn't just agreeing to only the conditions presented by the Gold Rush Guild. He reveals that he has some terms of his own that must be accepted before he can join them for real. He suddenly tells the man to listen to his requests, and the latter is immediately taken aback by this twist in the plot, because he already thought he had sealed the deal. The scene then shifts, and inside a cart, we see a conversation between Dylan and another guild member. As it turns out, they all seem to believe that they're giving the blacksmith too much special treatment for no reason, especially when they're not even sure that he'll turn out as good as they claim. However, Dylan explains that he's not working based on his intuition, but rather his experience. The other member is confused by his statement, so he explains that he's seen someone with a low level, who had surprising repairing and production abilities in the past. 
he reveals that the player's name is Guryon, and the other member immediately realizes that he's talking about the server's rank 1 player. Dylan confirms it, adding that Guryon is the greatest master, whose single pieces can be traded for millions. Hearing this, the member on the other line decides to go along with Dylan's plan, agreeing to wait for the results before jumping to any conclusions. The man points out that he noticed Dylan returning most of the gold, which was meant to be given to the blacksmith as a signing bonus. He wonders what could have gone wrong with the negotiation, so Dylan explains that Zig wanted something else as compensation. As a result of agreeing to that agreement, he took away 90% of the gold. Of course, the other member is curious as to what else Zig could want in place of so much gold. We find out that the thing that was so important to him was a spot on the exploration group's acceptance list. Along with many other players, the blacksmith goes to the board where the list has been pasted, anxious to see if his name is on it. Words may not be able to describe his joy when he sees his name boldly written on the list, and he feels ecstatic when he realizes that he was chosen. Even though he was strapped for time, he can't deny the fact that a large-scale guild is impressive. Not to mention that he was also given 10,000 gold as a signing bonus regardless. Zig thinks about the massive rewards he was given just for joining the Gold Rush Guild and starts to fear that Dylan might want to start making strange requests when they start working together. The thought makes him uncomfortable, but he manages to shake it off. And instead of bothering himself with such theories, he decides that he should just go and prepare for the quest. The scene shifts once more and we're taken to a place called Joe's Bakery, which is located on the east side of Baldwin Square. There, my satanic contract triggers once again and we finally get to see our favorite Giga Chad, Guilford of the Storm. We already know that he's the leader of the Red Tiger Company, one of the strongest mercenary groups in Arpedia. We also know that he's the 45th ranked user in the game, but what we didn't know is that right now, he's standing in line at the bakery, waiting for his turn like a good Samaritan. Even though Guilford is a high ranker in the game, he's not arrogant or cocky at all. Truly, we need more people like him in the world. He's just a simple guy who knows when to be polite, and also when to fight like a fierce warrior. Soon, it's finally Guilford's turn at the bakery, but when he reaches the counter, all of the biscuits he wanted are sold out. My guy is both shocked and horrified, because such a thing has never happened to him before. And this is when the woman at the counter explains that another guest purchased all of them earlier. Guilford gets enraged when he sees the guest leaving the bakery, with a tall stack of biscuit that he was supposed to purchase. The mercenary confronts him and grabs his shirt, pointing out that he shouldn't be so greedy when his inventory is already full. Of course, when the biscuit hoarder turns around, we see that it's none other than our boy Zig. He's already munching on the biscuits, and unfortunately for him, we're not the only ones who recognize him, because Guilford of the Storm also remembers that he was the shitty blacksmith who destroyed his favorite sword and escaped. Before Zig can even think, Guilford grabs his shirt from behind and pulls him back to confirm that he's the bastard blacksmith. Seeing how angry he is, our hero is terrified and even starts sweating. But rather than running away or anything like that, he decides to try and outsmart the red-eyed warrior. With the pile of biscuits in his hands, he pretends that he doesn't recognize Guilford and asks him who he is. Seeing that Zig is trying to play dumb with him, Guilford snaps, and you can actually see the thread of reasoning break above his head. At this point, it almost looks like he's about to tear our hero into a million pieces. His eyes start glowing brightly as a result, and he tries to hit the blacksmith for some payback. By some miracle, Zig manages to dodge a few of the hits, but eventually, it looks like Guilford is going to get him anyway. However, before the big guy can land the life-ending blow on the blacksmith, he disappears into thin air. Zig almost can't believe his eyes, because he knew he was almost killed a few seconds ago. And that's when a tab pops up, informing him that Guilford has logged out of the game. As you'd expect, my guy is quite confused, because he doesn't know why Guilford would log out when he had already caught him. The fighters of the Red Tiger Company who were watching the altercation are also just as shocked and confused as Zig, because they can't understand why their leader would leave so abruptly. The scene cuts to the real world, and we see Guilford in his normal life. Surprisingly, he looks a lot like his avatar in the game, with the only major difference being the color of his eyes. At the time we see him, those eyes are tearing up, because he's currently being scolded by his wife, who's berating him and accusing him of being all talk and no action. It turns out that he promised to help out with the dishes, while his wife went out shopping for groceries. But instead of doing any of that, my man was wasting his time in the fantasy game of Arpedia. Guilford admits that he's at fault, but tries to argue that she shouldn't have pulled out the plug on his capsule. However, before he can even finish talking, his dear wife snaps at him and proceeds to teach him a lesson. We don't see what she does to him next, but from the screams coming from the room, it's pretty obvious she's bending his body parts in ways that shouldn't be possible. He begs her not to dislocate his elbow, and for a brief moment, she actually lets go before suddenly moving to his legs to continue from there. Guilford continues to scream and beg his wife for mercy, but I'm pretty sure that's out of the question. 
While this wrestling couple continues their little scuffle, we see their daughter studying in the next room. She has a boy and arrow hung on her wall, and even trophies which she probably won in archery competitions. The young lady calls out to her screaming father and reminds him that she told him to be quiet so she can study. Guilford hears her and agrees to hold out for one more week, because by then, her exams will be over. Pretty sure we all know where this is going by now, this lady trying to study is actually the archer girl from the game. And holy fuck, my man Guilford actually turns out to be her father. Anyway, the scene shifts back to the game, and we see different players arriving at the Barkas Castle Gate Exploration Team meeting point. The different teams arrive with their weapons and supplies and carts. While the players there wait, some of them suddenly notice someone coming. It's Sir Guilford of the Storm and the Red Tiger Company, and the men are surprised that they also came for the quest. They're even more surprised that Guilford showed up, and as such, they finally confirm that the rumors of him participating are true. For that to be the case, they believe that the quest must really be extremely lucrative. While those guys are gossiping, Guilford suddenly calls out to his men and orders them to search the area thoroughly for someone. Pretty sure you already know who he's looking for. That's right, he's looking for Zig. Guilford has a feeling that our hero will also be participating in the special quest, because he saw how many of the biscuits he ordered. Well, his hunch is actually very correct, because Zig is at the meeting point as well. While he waits for the quest to begin, he hears a woman announcing that she sells items necessary for the quest for cheap. Zig goes to check out her stuff, and she quickly identifies him as a blacksmith, and after doing so, she proceeds to pitch him her products. The woman asks him if he's ever found himself in a situation, where he was ambushed by a monster on his way somewhere. Well, they're in a fantasy game with many monsters, so before Zig can respond, she concludes that he has definitely been in such situations before. As such, she proceeds to tell him that she's thought about such situations as well, and decided that it would be good for production skill players to have at least one survival skill. She tries her best to make the conversation engaging, and even though Zig seems nervous and skeptical, he answers her each time, confirming her obvious assumptions. At this point, our hero feels like she might be a peddler and starts thinking of a way to get away from her and go somewhere else. But before he can escape, the woman reveals the item she wants to sell, claiming it to be a recommended purchase for such situations. The item turns out to be a teleportation ring, and it costs a whopping 10,000 gold. It may sound like an absurd amount at first, but our hero feels that it's actually pretty cheap. To him, it's a mouth-watering offer because a teleportation ring isn't supposed to be that cheap. But even though it's a low price for such a rare item, Zig admits that 10,000 gold is still a lot of money for someone like him. And so, he decides that he needs to think carefully before making the purchase. Strangely, Zig unconsciously drops a bag of gold on the merchant's table and is shocked when he realizes that his body reacted before he could even think about it. The merchant lets go of the ring after he pays, and as Zig walks away with his new item, she thanks him for his purchase and wishes him luck on the quest. My guy doesn't even mind spending so much money on the ring, because he feels that it's so valuable that he could resell it and even make more money. Feeling satisfied with the purchase, he decides to check out the ring and is immediately horrified at what he discovers. A tab pops up, informing him that the ring is imbued with the power of teleportation. The ring teleports the user 20 meters in the chosen direction as it's supposed to, but it will immediately be destroyed after a single use. In other words, my boy Zig has pretty much been scammed. Meanwhile, we see the merchant packing up the rest of her goods and earnings for the day. As she mounts them in her wagon, she mentions how the day's sales were hefty just as she expected. Baldentown Town is full of pushovers who don't know anything, and it's very easy for her to sell counterfeits to them and scam them of their money. Before she can leave though, Zig returns to confront her about her scam. He marches toward her angrily, calling her a con artist and demanding that she return his money back. He yells in rage and challenges her, but she just pretends not to know him and even calls him a beggar. Zig doesn't have the patience for her shenanigans, so he warns her not to pretend and asks her to take a look at the ring she sold to him. He's so pissed that he starts making a scene, so the merchant asks him what the problem is. She points out that the ring has the ability to teleport, trying to justify her sale. Of course, our hero snaps at her, because moving 20 meters after a 4 second delay for a single time only can only be described as a scam. When he calls her a con artist again, the woman snaps back, asking him to address her by her name, which is Legas. Zig decides to be witty and changes the name to Alegas, suggesting that it's the perfect username for a con artist who partakes in illegal traits. It doesn't take long before the heated exchange turns physical, and before both of these idiots can hurt each other, one of the guards arrives and asks them what's going on. He informs the both of them that the players will be departing soon as planned. Zig tries to report the merchant to the soldier by revealing that she scammed him, but before he can say anything, she pushes him to the floor and wraps herself around the soldier's arm. While discreetly placing a bag of gold in his hand, she tells him that she was running her legitimate business when Zig came onto her and started making trouble. After receiving his bribe from behind, the soldier switches up on Zig, 
he points his spear at the boy and calls him a criminal scum for trying to frame an innocent lady. Sig is confused and annoyed that the soldier would think Lagas is innocent. He tries to explain what really happened, but the corrupt soldier doesn't want to hear any of it. He shuts up our boy and orders him to quickly apologize to the respectable lady. On top of that, the soldier claims that Zig will have to push her heavy cart for her as punishment for his offense. Our hero realizes that he can't really fight back this injustice when the soldier threatens to remove him from the exploration team if he disobeys. While Zig is horrified and depressed by this terrible threat, the level 55 merchant slash con artist is just chuckling mischievously on the side. A while later, we see our hero pushing Legas's cart while she sits on top with her goods and money. Not so surprisingly, Zig is crying while pushing the cart because he's been reduced to the level of a donkey. Meanwhile, Guilford is still keeping his eyes peeled for the blacksmith who destroyed his precious sword. Behind one of the trees in the bushes, we see a hooded man with an eagle on his arm. He places a rolled up paper in the compartment strapped to the eagle's leg, and afterward, sends the eagle to deliver his message. The eagle flies swiftly and reaches the Broaden Kingdom's treasury in no time. When the bird delivers the message, it stays on the window while the receiver talks with someone, admitting that the event they were worried about has finally occurred. While burning the paper, the man reveals that the so-called dreaded event is the fact that the Barkas Kingdom has sent off an exploration team. This new development makes things difficult for him, because half of his country's finances come from intermediary trade. However, because they are in friendly relations with the Barkas Kingdom, they can't openly try to restrain them from establishing a new trade route. The old man who's been speaking so far asks the other man in the room if he understands what he means. An ominous smile appears on the hooded person's face, and he assures the old man that he understands him very well. This man's real name is Kira, and he's the 89th ranked player in the game, who also happens to be one of the deadliest assassins in Arpedia. Meanwhile, back in the woods, we see an exhausted Zig lying on the floor and wondering how his situation got this bad. Even though he looks like he's about to pass out, Legas doesn't seem to care. She addresses him as slave number one and orders him to get up so he can set up her tent. Hearing her say such things, Zig just remains on the floor and curses her in his mind. Legas says she needs to log out for a while, so she orders him to set up the tent and go get their food while she returns. Before leaving, she wants to make sure that Zig understands his duty, so she asks him if he's got everything she said. Zig doesn't say anything, so she gets upset and orders him to answer her while calling him a slave. At this point, Zig finally responds by warning her to not push her luck, and asks her if she really takes him for a slave. From the look on his face, it's pretty clear that my man has some horrible plans for this scammer. In the end, Zig snaps and declares that he can't take her mistreatment any longer, but before he can do anything to get his revenge, the annoying con artist calls out for the guards like a damsel in distress. The moment Zig hears this, he quickly turns around and crouches down to inspect the ground and find the best spot for her tent. He continues to murmur while working, and when the scammer sees this, she begins to gloat. She tells him that he should have just behaved from the beginning and expects everything to be set properly before she returns. Finally, she logs out of the game, and while her avatar is still disappearing, Zig begins to shed tears. He thinks about how much crap he's taking from her, just because he can't afford to not participate in this quest. He curses out loudly, but eventually gets to work because that's the best he can do. A while later, he's done with everything as instructed. He's set up the tent, made a fire, and even prepared a suitable meal for them to eat. While he's eating, he wonders why he's suffering so much after getting caught up with a con artist. He's still drowning his sorrow by stuffing himself with food, when someone suddenly calls out to him. The owner of the voice drops a damaged dagger in front of Sig, and reveals that he heard he's the best person to ask for repairs in Balden. It's times like these that Zig wishes he didn't have such a reputation. He looks up at the guy, and he has some men with him who appear to be a bunch of mercenaries. The guy has a scar on his face, and he's holding a pretty big axe that makes him look threatening. He bluntly tells Zig to fix the broken dagger for him, and the blacksmith recognizes the man as people from the Red Tiger Company. Zig, who just wants to enjoy his meal, asks the scar-face guy why he needs the repair so urgently. In response, the guy smirks at Zig tauntingly. He claims that he heard Zig is Balden's king of repairs, but admits that the blacksmith doesn't even look like he's confident in his skills. You see, Mr. Scarface over here doesn't actually need the dagger fixed. He plans to nitpick as much as possible, and then drag Zig in front of their leader, who happens to be none other than our new father-in-law, Guilford. After much hesitation, Zig finally gets up and decides to take a look at the damaged equipment. He places his food on the floor, and thinks about how annoying it is that he couldn't enjoy his meal in peace. He picks up the damaged dagger and uses his grain skill to start working. A few moments later, Zig hands Scarface the dagger after fixing it. The guy can't believe his eyes, because he didn't actually expect his twilight dagger to get fixed. What's even more unbelievable is that the dagger is back to 100% durability, just like it was when it was new. 
To be honest, Scarface and the other men are so baffled by this result that they forget about their plan to take our hero to Guilford. Instead, they all inspect the dagger, trying to make sure that their eyes aren't playing tricks on them. One of them admits that the condition of the dagger is absolutely perfect, and the other points out how the shiny equipment looks just the way the rumors say it should. Scarface is so overjoyed to see his dagger looking brand new that he starts to doubt that Zig is the same guy who destroyed their leader's sword. Meanwhile, Zig, who's lying in a hammock and trying to read Fifty Shades of Grey, politely asks them to leave if they don't have anything else for him to fix. He tells them that he's in the middle of reading, and then for some reason, he calls Scarface an old man. The term seems to have really upset the guy, because my dude immediately snaps at our hero for being rude. He begins to rant nonstop, and claims that he's never seen someone act so nonchalantly after destroying someone else's weapon. He finds Zig's behavior very shameless, and is so offended by his statement that he breaks the newly repaired dagger in a fit of rage. Scarface then clears the air about his age, explaining that he's not an old man, but actually someone around the blacksmith's age. Zig appears to be getting on the guy's nerves on purpose, because he calls him an old man once again. But before he can finish his statement, the guy cuts him off and insists that he isn't old. Even if he didn't want to take Zig to Guilford anymore, he's probably changed his mind after receiving such insults. He tells Zig to follow him immediately, and threatens to beat him up if he refuses. It's at this point that Zig realizes what's going on, so he closes the manual and reveals that he remembers these people. He gets down from the hammock and identifies them as the men from the bakery, and once again calls them old out of spite. Scarface continues to insist that he isn't old, but Zig just asks them if they're all still upset because he bought all the biscuits. Hearing this, Scarface is beyond offended. He grabs his axe and prepares to teach Zig a lesson for suggesting that the Red Tiger Company would get mad over something so trivial. Even if Scarface has more serious beef with Zig, the other members of the Red Tiger Company all hide their faces shamefully, because this is definitely the main reason they were searching for our hero. Either way, their motives don't really matter to Zig, because he just happened to be looking for someone to take out his anger. And now, Scarface and his friends have presented him with the perfect opportunity to do so. He points his sword at them, and confidently challenges them to come fight him. But for someone with such a big mouth, Zig's fighting skills are incredibly appalling. We see him tied up with a big bump on his head, implying that he was pretty much subdued without putting up a fight. In any case, the men take him to their camp where they present him to Guilford. As the Red Tiger Company surrounds him, Zig tries to argue that ganging up is cheating, but it's not like anyone gives a single fuck. Guilford interrupts his nagging, and promises to overlook things and forgive him if he apologizes sincerely. But of course, instead of taking the wise decision, Zig proves stubborn once more and insists that he did nothing wrong. He claims that he waited in line for his turn and paid for the biscuits, so what's there for him to apologize for? On top of that, he curses at Guilford, but the leader calmly explains that he's not even talking about the biscuits. Zig is shocked to hear this, so he asks why they're holding him captive anyway. He claims that ever since he started playing the game, he's never harmed or offended anyone else. Hearing him say this strikes a nerve in Guilford's head, and he's really annoyed that Zig thinks he's actually innocent. He claims that tying the blacksmith up won't be enough, so he orders his men to set him free, confusing our hero on what they're planning. As you'd guess, he wasn't actually set free. Instead, the men are in fact preparing for his execution. Zig suddenly looks into the sky, and sees Sir Guilford of the Storm leaping into the air. The scene terrifies our hero, because he's probably about to get divided by two. However, when Guilford slams his weapon on the ground, an explosion follows, and it appears Zig knows what's going on because he's still terrified. An item with just a single point in attack power shouldn't be able to produce so much force, and when the perspective switches to Guilford, we see him holding the item called the Stick of Love. The man then walks menacingly towards Zig, and reveals that he's going to personally teach the blacksmith some manners. After leaping into the air once again, he announces that it's time for some lessons in discipline. The leader of the Red Tiger Company swings the stick of love at Zig and generates something that looks like a massive inferno. It blows our hero back, and he struggles to stay on his feet. He finds it strange that Guilford would refer to this as a discipline class because he knows that the old man just wants to take out his anger on someone else. Before Zig can even think about dodging or running away from the fight, the huge blast from Guilford's stick hits him in the middle of his chest. The dust settles, and we see our hero lying nearly unconscious in a small crater caused by the explosion. Both the Stick of Love and Zig's body are burning with some fresh smoke, that gives us an idea of the power behind the attack. Guilford stands over him and reveals that he didn't even put all of his strength into the attack, and he's pretty disappointed that Zig couldn't take the hit standing. Disappointed at the result, the man decides to set a condition for our hero. He promises to let him go free, but only if he's able to touch a single hair on his body during the lesson. Even though he's taken a lot of damage, Zig's big mouth only gets bigger and he starts to get back up while calling Guilford a stubborn boomer. 
he calls the old man's conditions crap and labels him as a cocky bastard for thinking he can never get hit by a low-level blacksmith. Zig then takes his sword and slowly gets back on his feet, clearly pissed at how much he's being looked down upon. But you see, he has already suffered so much damage that his health is down to just 10 points. Regardless, he gets up and charges at Guilford with his sword. He screams as he runs toward the leader of the Red Tiger Company, but Guilford effortlessly deflects it with the stick of love. Zig doesn't relent and continues to swing his sword at Guilford, but the big guy keeps deflecting all of his attacks. The two keep clashing weapons, until Guilford eventually manages to push back our hero. However, Zig is determined to hit him as well, so he manages to stay on his feet despite the overwhelming attacks. Guilford admits that Zig isn't bad for a beginner, and even notices that he has a peculiar talent for fighting. However, he still believes that Zig's talent isn't up to the point where he can overcome their difference in levels, especially in a game like Arpedia where your rank is everything. But even with all the odds stacked against him, our hero continues to fight. He charges at Guilford again, and leaps into the air until he uses an incredibly powerful attack to destroy the Stick of Love. After Zig surprisingly destroys the Stick of Love, we find out that he achieved this by using the Arm Break skill, which he learned from Carwin's manual. This special skill allows him to destroy any armaments or ores by simply targeting the gaps existing in the material. The prerequisite to learning this skill is to train one's grain skill up to rank 7, and it appears that today, this is exactly what our hero has done. We see a flashback of when Zig was rudely interrupted from enjoying his meal. It appears that it was the same time he acquired this skill, because just when he was putting his bowl down, a tab popped up and informed him that his grain skill had become rank 7. In addition, he was also able to learn a new skill, the Arm Breaker. The panel cuts back to the heated fight between Zig and Guilford, and we see the epic scene where our hero leaps into the air and uses all of his might to destroy the Stick of Love. As the item shatters into several pieces, Guilford can't believe his eyes because he doesn't understand how Zig could break his weapon. While the big guy stares in bewilderment, my boy concludes that this is the first time he has seen a skill that can break other players' weapons. After such an awesome display, Zig proceeds to do something both shocking and incredibly weird. He grabs Guilford by the shoulders, and as he leans in, he tells the big guy to get a piece of his mind. Zig plans to execute a powerful headbutt, which he probably thinks will knock Guilford out or something, but his plan goes terribly wrong when the old man slips and tilts too far back. As a result, what was supposed to be a knockout headbutt ended up becoming a very awkward and unexpected kiss on the lips. As the two men lock lips, their eyes widen in horror and disbelief. The other members of the Red Tiger Company have different expressions on their faces as they watch the unbelievable spectacle before them. While Scarface finds the embarrassing mistake amusing, one of his colleagues watches it like a movie. Another one is flustered, and the last guy just barfs a rainbow as a metaphor for what we're all thinking. They're not the only ones taken aback by the scene, because even the animals in the forest gasp upon seeing the two men kiss. As you'd expect, Guilford is outraged that Zig would subject him to such embarrassment, so he yells in anger and vows to kill the blacksmith. While the man expresses his murderous intentions, Zig is still shaken by what the fuck just happened. He's very embarrassed and disappointed that his first kiss was with an old man, and he falls to his knees as the embarrassment washes over him. While he's wallowing in humiliation and exhaustion, the mercenaries of the Red Tiger Company all try their best to hold back their leader from ripping the blacksmith apart. They remind him that he has to keep the promise he made to Zig. But at this point, Guilford doesn't even care about keeping his word. He just wants them to let him go so he can tear him a new one. While Guilford continues to argue with his men, Scarface walks up to Zig. He admits that our boy isn't too shabby after all, and offers him a purple potion as a gift. This purple liquid is actually a high elixir, which recovers a player's entire health. Scarface admits that no one expected the low-rank blacksmith to get a single hit against their leader, but he proved everyone wrong. He's intrigued by Zig's move, and asks him what skill he used to destroy the Stick of Love. Our hero accepts the potion, and Scarface reveals that it's his first time seeing a skill that destroys a weapon. The mercenary is very curious about it, and asks our boy if this skill is exclusive to blacksmiths. At this point, Zig is already big-headed with all the praise and attention. He clears his throat, and snobbishly tells Scarface that he can't reveal anything specific about the skill to anyone. He then proceeds to gulp down the elixir, and while he's at it, the still curious mercenary asks him if he has joined a guild. He claims that Guilford is actually pretty fond of Zig, and suggests that the blacksmith join the Red Tiger Company. Our hero doesn't say anything until he's finished the potion and replenished his energy, before wiping the excess off his face and expressing his concerns about such an idea. He reminds Scarface that it wasn't long ago when him and his friends beat him to a pulp, but now they want him inside their guild out of nowhere, so Zig calls Scarface shameless for even suggesting something so ridiculous. In response, the mercenary laughs nervously and admits that the situation could have been handled better. He also points out that Zig isn't blameless either, since he was the one who broke their master's sword and ran away. 
On top of that, he kept calling Scarface an old man, which didn't really help anyone. But regardless of all that transpired, the mercenary is willing to call it even. Even after such a gesture, our hero refuses to make peace. He denies destroying Guilford's sword and claims that he's never destroyed anyone's weapon while repairing it. While he's still denying, a thought flashes across his mind and he suddenly remembers accidentally destroying Guilford's sword. Zig finally admits that he was wrong and makes peace with the mercenaries using a firm handshake. He finally agrees to call it even, and in his excitement, he almost calls Scarface an old man once again. Fortunately, he manages to hold his tongue and decides to call him older brother instead. Scarface accepts it, but Guilford is still very pissed. He's still being restrained by his men, but he demands to know whose permission Scarface is using to make peace with the bloody blacksmith. Zig just laughs tauntingly and casually apologizes to Guilford for the incident with his sword. However, it turns out that the dude isn't even mad about the sword anymore, and angrily tells Zig that the incident with repairs isn't his problem. Guilford is so angry that he can't even make a complete sentence, so he just screams instead. The next morning, we see two guys having breakfast together, and one of them complaining bitterly about the bad food. He asks the other person why it's so bad, and the guy just advises him to lower the sense of taste to the minimum in his settings before eating. He explains that since they have no stamina items, the least they can do is manage the terrible tasting food. Just then, Legas approaches them. It appears that she's been eavesdropping on their conversation, and now plans to scam them too. The con artist pretends to be very concerned, and points out that the guys have run out of all their consumables. Suddenly, she reveals a gold apple from her cloak and tells the two men that they probably need something like this fruit. The men are astonished when they see the golden apple, and immediately start longing for it. Legas claims that the fruit is very special, and tells them that for their sake, she'll be selling it to them for only 1,000 gold, even though it's supposed to be worth 10,000. The men are immediately desperate to benefit from the so-called discount. They request four golden apples, and the next thing they know, there's a small crowd of people surrounding Legas, who all want to avail the same offer. They start to argue about who got there first, and compete heavily for the right to give Legas their money. After another successful day of scamming people, Legas returns to her camp with a bag full of gold. She holds it against her face and thinks about how she had another good day at the office. When she returns, we see that the so-called golden apples are just regular apples that she made our hero paint over with gold color. He's still doing her bidding, because he feels like the corrupt soldier will remove him from the quest if he doesn't. Of course, it doesn't mean that his opinion about the woman has changed. He calls her vicious and wonders how she can go to such lengths to scam the others. In response, Legas decides to tell Zig something, claiming that he might not know it because he's still young. She claims that everything in the world moves because of money and reveals that the thing you need to rise up isn't levels or skills. Rather, she believes that one's inventory and bank account are what actually matter. After sharing this with him, she tells him to hurry up and finish painting the rest. Legas starts walking away and promises not to order him around anymore once he's done with this task, before leaving him to it and heading out to get some herbs. As she walks away, Zig begins to wonder why she's so obsessed with money. Even after what she told him, he still doesn't get it at all. He then paints a smiley face on one of the apples and looks pretty smug about his creation. He lifts the apple in the air, feeling proud of his painting skills, and then names it as Wilson. Like the loner that he is, Zig prefers to have a painted fruit as his companion, rather than actual people. Suddenly, a small portal opens in front of him and a weapon flies out towards his face. He quickly uses Wilson to block the attack, and when he takes a closer look at the weapon, he's surprised to see that it's a kunai. Zig doesn't seem to know the actual name and assumes that it's called a shuriken. Either way, he quickly realizes that they're under attack. Guilford announces this to everyone around and orders all combatants to take defensive positions. Unfortunately, before they can organize themselves, more kunai are hurled at them by a hooded man who suddenly appears in the sky. He continues to attack, and when Guilford spots him, he tries to blast him away with his skill. However, this mysterious killer uses a strange technique to disappear and dodge the hit. Guilford is stunned to see this, and while he's still in a daze, the assassin reappears behind him to land a surprise attack. The mercenary doesn't sense his presence, and wonders if the assassin is using the user death effect. Just when the assassin is about to stab Guilford in the back, Zig arrives and swiftly uses his arm break skill to destroy the killer's blade. Afterward, he smirks at the old man and informs him that he now owes him his life. Guilford refuses to admit it and scoffs instead, claiming that the assassin's attack wouldn't have damaged him anyway. Even though he puts on a tough facade, the man is worried because he knows that he couldn't even sense the attacker when he was behind him. For that to be the case, he wonders if the hooded man's presence concealment skill is higher than his detection. As the murdered players start to disappear from the game, the mysterious hooded figure lands on a rock. Guilford asks the person to reveal his identity while pointing his sword at the intruder. A psycho smile appears on the assassin's face, and as another weapon starts to materialize in his hand, 
he reveals that he's an assassin who received the first class title. He also reveals that he's the man who leads the Black Crescent Moon. Some of the other warriors start to tremble in fear when they hear this. They know that the Black Crescent Moon is a famous contractor guild, and their leader's presence on this expedition can only mean a single thing. The assassin hears the terrified warriors murmuring, so he decides to be more specific and confirm their assumptions by revealing that he is Kira, the rank 89 assassin. We then see a paper that contains the exploration team attack quest. Here, we find out that the mandatory quest is for them to overcome the assassins, who are trying to interfere with the trade between the Barkas Kingdom and the North Ark. In addition, they have to complete this quest and reach the North Ark within the designated period. Hearing the assassin confirm this, the warriors become even more afraid. They don't want to believe that the hooded guy in front of them is the vicious Kira. One of them forces himself to believe that Kira is lying, but when he sees him take the battle stance of an assassin, he accepts the truth. Kira opens his arms and taunts the men to the point that they immediately conclude that they're all going to die. They're all terrified and confused because they don't know what to do. However, Kira suddenly eases the tension when he gestures for them to keep quiet and reveals that he hasn't come to kill everyone. As unbelievable as that might seem, he explains that his true objective for coming is to stop them from going ahead with their quest. He wants to keep them in one place so that he can obtain the Patriot and the Shadows title. Kira tells them that as long as they all give up, he can end things without having to get his hands dirty. The assassin then tries to convince them to give up, but he's interrupted by one of the people. The guy wearing an eye patch suddenly confronts Kira and warns him not to mess with the wrong crowd. Mr. Eyepatch is really upset because he spent a lot of money to participate in this quest, and now someone is trying to stop him. He asks Kira if he's going to refund all of his investment, or if he's going to pay back all the money he has spent. The crazy assassin processes what the guy just said, and pretends to be concerned for a moment. Then suddenly, he smiles again and shoots an arrow into the guy's neck. Guilford is shocked when he sees this, and as Mr. Eyepatch starts to disappear from the game, Kira makes it clear to every one of them that he hasn't come here to bargain. He explains that he's only talking to them to make the encounter more formal. Still standing on the rock, Kira addresses the remaining people and informs them that hundreds of his followers are currently surrounding them. He then reveals that if they don't give up, him and his men will just have to eliminate all of them. The assassin makes the bold statement and asks them if they now understand the situation they're in. While he's talking, Guilford can't help but think that the assassin is bluffing. He can certainly feel the presence of his followers, but he's sure that they're not in hundreds in number. However, he knows that there are still many of them hiding in the forest, and he fears that things will get even more difficult if the NPCs die. Seeing that the odds are against them, Guilford comes up with a plan, and quickly starts using hand signs behind his back to communicate with one of the other players. Using his finger, he tells the person that he's going to provoke Kira so he can draw his attention. While he's doing that, he wants the person, whose name is Hyung Siok, to cover the field of view from the forest with a magical barrier. Hyung Seok instantly understands the assignment and starts waiting for Guilford's signal. Guilford then uses his fingers to count down from three, but while he's still at two, Zig suddenly starts talking to Kira. He claims that Kira's first class title is a lie and suggests that he's more likely just a petty thief. When Guilford hears Zig say this, he immediately uses his hand sign to tell Hyung Seok to abort the mission. Without a drop of fear, Zig challenges Kira by pointing his sword at him and asking what kind of assassin would reveal himself and lecture people. He claims that if he were truly a first-class assassin, he would have been killing people before they even noticed. Seeing our hero's bold attitude, Kira immediately recognizes him as the blacksmith from before who destroyed his weapon. Kira is still thinking about this when Zig challenges him to fight one-on-one -on -one in a respectable fashion to prove he's really a ranker. Our boy continues to lash out at the assassin, calling him a coward for acting cheaply and pretending to be tough when he's hiding his followers in the bushes. At this point, Kira is getting fed up with Zig's insults. He calls the blacksmith a bug-like bastard with an annoying voice and tells him that he shouldn't get ballsy around him just because he got lucky enough to break his weapon earlier. Kira calls Zig a noob and instantly orders his followers to kill the blacksmith. Just like before, a weapon is thrown at our hero, but he managed to deflect it easily. With a cocky smile on his face, he almost starts to gloat about how low the attacks are. However, before he can finish boasting, many more projectiles are hurled at him and the rest. The moment Guilford sees the incoming danger, he yells for Hyung Seok to do what they planned earlier. The sorcerer immediately uses his staff to cast a spell, which creates a magic barrier in the form of an ice wall that stops all the weapons from getting closer. Kira is outraged upon seeing this, and determined to win, he orders his Black Crescent Moon followers to make sure that they kill every single one of the people going on the quest. He wants his men to unleash a large-scale annihilation on Guilford, Zig, and the rest, but before they can initiate their attacks, Guilford boldly warns Kira that the tables are about to turn. The leader of the Red Tiger Company suddenly begins to glow in a bright red color. 
he grabs his giant sword and instantly goes into berserk mode. Everything around him gets supercharged, and his sword starts to generate a terrifying red lighting as a firestorm forms around him. The insane power emanating from his sword causes the earth to tremble and crack beneath them. The rocks start floating, and it doesn't take long before his sword is completely covered in flames. In an epic display of sheer might, Guilford uses his giant sword to blast a huge inferno at the assassin. But unfortunately, Kira manages to jump high enough to avoid getting caught in the firestorm. However, when he lands on his feet again, he's immediately terrified to see the destruction caused by the mercenary's attack. The fire was so powerful that it literally burnt the ground and created a wide fissure. Even though he's a bit scared at this point, Kira's psycho side kicks back, and he starts smiling like a maniac once again. He admits that it's an honor to behold such power, and tells Guilford that he might just have won the battle if he was a little bit faster. All of a sudden, a tab pops up in front of Guilford, and he's informed that his berserk mode is being cancelled because his stats are lacking. This comes as a shock to the mercenary, and he becomes worried because he doesn't know why his stats would be decreasing so rapidly. However, he soon realizes the cause of this when he sees another tab, revealing that the effects of something called Hydra's blood have begun to activate in his body. Unfortunately, as a result of Hydra's blood, all of his health and stats are being reduced by 50%. While that's happening, we see Zig smiling and rubbing his chin. He thinks about how he was right about something earlier and calls himself a genius. It turns out that right before the enemy's attack hit him, just one moment before his imminent demise, he quickly opened his inventory and equipped something called the log armor. This armor happens to be shaped like a log, and its job is to protect the entire body of the user. However, there's one drawback, and that's the fact that the user is unable to move because of how heavy it is. As a result, after Zig activated it to save himself from the arrows and spears, he remained trapped inside. Rather than deactivating it to join the fight, Zig mischievously decided to stay in there and wait till the fight was over. After a while, he assumes that the Red Tiger Company must have taken care of everything, so he deactivates the log armor and decides that it's time for him to head back out. Unfortunately, he meets a very unpleasant surprise the moment the shield disappears. The moment Zig comes out of the armor, he sees most of Guilford's men are either dead or severely injured. That's when he realizes that the Red Tiger Company mercenaries are losing to Kira and his assassins. He quickly discovers the reason for this when blood suddenly starts flowing out of his mouth. A tab pops up, informing him that the effects of Hydra's blood have been activated, and just like Guilford earlier, all of Zig's health and stats are decreased by 50%. Zig falls to his knees as the blood drips from his mouth, and that's when he remembers where he first heard about Hydra's blood. Back when he was still Bart's, he learned about the Kadria dungeon, whose boss is a three-headed dragon named Hydra. The move that's currently affecting him is a possible drop from Hydra. It's a powerful poison that can instantly decrease anyone's health and stats by half. With this in mind, Zig begins to wonder if Kira and the Black Crescent Moon poisoned their breakfasts earlier. Zig ponders deeply about it, uncertain about what really happened. He's pretty confused because the breakfast was very tasty, and while he's mentally debating himself, one of Kira's assassins leaps into the air behind him like a ninja, ready to pounce and kill. The assassin is about to stab the absent-minded blacksmith in the back, when a familiar giant sword deflects the strike. As you can see, father-in-law Guilford has come to repay the favor from earlier. He manages to hold off Kira in the air and slices the other assassin with his giant sword. The fact that Guilford is still this much of a threat even with only 50% health and stats makes Kira conclude that he's most definitely a monster. As if that's not bad enough, his attacks aren't working against the big guy, even though he's been poisoned with Hydra's blood. Despite putting up a good fight, Guilford knows that he's currently at a disadvantage. He loses 90 health points, 75, and then 120 in quick succession. To avoid taking any more damage, he decides that they need to evacuate the NPCs. Guilford tries to get away from Kira, but the deadly assassin catches up to him first. Kira appears to get a hold of Guilford's cloak and tells him to stop trying to escape. Meanwhile, Zig is also trying to evade the other assassins who are hot on his tail. Even though he managed to dodge their attacks, he knows that it's only a matter of time before they catch up to him. He's getting tired and taking a lot of damage, so he concludes that he needs to hide somewhere as soon as possible. But in order to do that, he needs to first of all make it into the forest. As such, he increases his pace and desperately runs into the woods, but the Black Crescent Moon assassins follow after him in hot pursuit. The loud clunk sounds of a cart fill the air, as Leg is frantically drags it along the bumpy roads of the forest. While she's running desperately for her life, we see Kira and his men elsewhere, helping themselves to the spoils of their victory. The Black Crescent Moon assassins take the weapons and items off the bodies of the people they killed, and while they're doing that, Kira keeps watch and supervises them. After a while, the leader of the group calls out to his men, telling them to get ready to move out. With a scowl etched on his face, Kira informs his men that they'll have to ambush the tracking troop the moment they get back. 
the assassins acknowledge their leader's instructions, and while they're at it, the dead men they killed suddenly start to get erased from the game. All of a sudden, the first-class assassin hears a noise coming from the forest, and is immediately alarmed by the rustling in the bushes. He turns around to see what made the noise, but the perpetrator, who happens to be Legas, quickly hides behind a tree. Still puzzled and disturbed, Kira decides to investigate, so he starts walking toward the tree to find out the source of the noise. Just when he's a few inches from catching Legas, one of his men calls his attention. The assassin informs the master that the tracking troop has returned, and reveals that just as they expected, the troop is heading toward the Rocking Bridge Canyon. Upon hearing this, another cynical smile appears on Kira's face, as he can't even hide his delight. In his excitement, he suddenly throws his short curved knife at a tree, and the weapon splits the fat tree in half like it was a tiny piece of paper. Just like a boomerang, the knife flies right back into the killer's hand, and as he catches it with ease, he orders the Black Crescent Moon to head toward the Rocking Bridge Canyon. The first-class assassin assures his followers that they will arrive at the place before the tracking team, and then set a trap by waiting for the team, so they can slaughter all of them. Kira wants to confirm that all of his men understand the assignment, so they all respond loudly in affirmation, while going on one knee and bowing their heads to him like loyal ninjas. Immediately after this, the Black Crescent Moon leaves the scene headed for their new destination, and as they dispatch, Legas pants heavily and heaves a sigh while clutching her chest anxiously. The scene shifts, and we continue with Legas running like the wind, dragging her cart along. In the process, she thinks about her near-death experience from a few moments ago and wonders if the people she saw were really the Black Crescent Moon. The idea seems a bit far-fetched to her because she believes that such a powerful contractor guild that's within the rankings wouldn't just randomly pop up for no reason. However, it becomes more likely when she remembers seeing the NPC's dead bodies and items that were lying around, so she concludes that more than half of the exploration team is most likely already dead. Legas remains deep in thought as she drags her cart along the forest, because she fears that it's going to be game over for her side if the Black Crescent Moon manages to execute another ambush on the tracking troop. With this in mind, she decides that she has to alert the exploration team as soon as possible. Unfortunately, she's stopped in her tracks when a massive monster stomps its foot right in front of her. Legas looks up at the huge creature, feeling so terrified that she just stands there, frozen like a stick of ice. The massive creature suddenly stretches its big hand towards her, which basically implies that it's coming to get her. Sure enough, while the con woman is still stunned and unsure of what to do, the big one-eyed giant starts marching toward her with its huge spiked club in one hand. At this point, Legas is almost 100% sure that she's finished, because she can't even come up with any kind of plan. The only thing she does is scream like a psycho when the ogre roars at her. Eventually, something triggers the survival instincts in her brain just when the monster is about to catch her, so she immediately starts running again, and doesn't leave her cart behind either. For someone who wants to escape, she's really making it more difficult by dragging the heavy load. Legas drags the cart desperately, wondering why there's even a yellow ogre here in the first place. This thought quickly vanishes from her mind though, because the tire of the cart hits a rock, which causes her to fall over in a very embarrassing fashion. After tripping over, she slides across the floor like a penguin on ice, and practically eats dirt in the process. Legas gets up while wincing in pain and covered in bruises. On top of that, the yellow ogre finally catches up to her while she's still trying to regain her balance. Legas stares at the monster in confusion and bewilderment, because it's practically over for her now. A wave of sadness washes over her and her eyes widen, as she looks up at the giant beast that's herring toward her to end her life in Arpedia Online. She just sits there helplessly, and like any other person who's about to be viciously murdered, her life begins to flash before her eyes and a particular memory plays back in her mind. In this brief moment leading up to her demise, Legas remembers her life in the real world. As you'd expect, she goes by a different name in real life, and that name is Jisoo. In the memory, we're taken to a time when she was given a bonus by her boss. Jisoo takes the envelope from him, feeling very surprised to receive it, but the boss notices her astonishment and goes ahead to explain that he's giving it to her because she's been working very hard. And now, he wants her to get herself something nice with the reward. Upon hearing this, Jisoo is overjoyed to the point that she can't even pretend. She stares at the envelope, gleefully blushing with a wide smile on her face. And by the time she's counting the money, all she can think about is how she'll combine it with the money she saved up so she can finally afford to pay for quality piano lessons. After work, Jisoo immediately heads down to the NLS Piano Academy. She's about to open the door when she suddenly gets startled by a noise that turns out to be her ringtone. Jisoo picks up the phone while still being a bit surprised, but this emotion quickly turns into worry when the person on the other end starts talking. We find out that the person is Jisoo's sister, who's calling her to tell her some bad news about their father. While Jisoo's sister apologizes to her, she looks at her phone screen and sees a notification, revealing that a huge sum of money has been deducted from her bank account to pay the hospital. 
Her sister feels very bad about it and tries to apologize, but the generous con woman just tells her not to worry, claiming that money comes and goes all the time. It's pretty obvious that Jisoo feels bad about it, but she manages to hide her emotions and remain strong, especially since the money was used to pay for her father's hospital bills. Later, we see her sitting at her table in class, where she's currently altering the details on her career interest survey as a high school student. Jisoo wanted to attend the Seoul Art University to study piano in the Department of Music, but now that all of the money she saved up to do this has been spent, she's giving up this dream and changing her career interests to global business administration, which she'll study at a different university. After striking off her former dreams, Jisoo stares at the piece of paper, not sure that she's doing the right thing. If she changes her career interests now, she'll be giving up the dreams she's had for a very long time, and all of her extra work would have been for nothing. After thinking long and hard about her future, she finally accepts her fate and gives up her dream. The scene shifts back to the game, and we see that unlike Jisoo who gave up, this time, Legas maintains a strong will and determination to keep fighting, because she doesn't want to lose again. In the face of death, she says a big fat no, and gets back on her feet with a big rock in her bruised hand. She grips the rock tightly, and thinks about how hard she worked to save all the money she has acquired. As the rage builds up and spreads all over her body, she asks the monster if it knows how much she paid for the quest and with tears in her eyes, she loudly declares that she's not going to give up again. With a strong resolve to keep fighting and survive, Legas starts hurling rocks at the monster. She misses several times, and even when she gets a hit, the ogre doesn't really feel anything. She cries bitterly and repeatedly yells at the monster to die, as she throws more and more rocks to kill it. She's so sad that she doesn't even look at it while hurling the rocks, and bursts into tears while just begging the monster to die. Not surprisingly, such a beast has no compassion, so even if she cries all day, it won't stop it from tearing her to pieces. The yellow ogre advances toward her and is about to grab her with its big clawed hand, when suddenly, a knight in shining armor arrives. Well, not exactly shining armor, and he's not really a knight either, but at least Zig is still the main hero of this story. He swings on what appears to be a huge vine, and then somehow manages to strike the ogre from above. You can tell it's a very painful strike, because the monster even sheds a tear from its only eye. Thankfully, our hero blacksmith managed to deliver the devastating hit before the monster could pounce on Legas. Just when she accepts the fact that the monster is going to kill her, it suddenly disappears into thin air because Zig killed it. Legas stares at the monster as it disintegrates into the familiar blue pixels, and almost can't believe her eyes. All that's left of the terrifying beast are its club and other items it carried along. So, when Legas sees this and finally realizes that it's gone, she falls to her knees and sheds even more tears because she's relieved that her journey in Arpedia isn't over just yet. While she's on the ground, our hero lands behind her, asking to confirm if the ogre is really dead. Zig gets back up and is about to start talking about how he finally caught the monster, but he keeps quiet when he turns around and sees his former nemesis crying like a hopeless little puppy. The blacksmith turns to her, feeling very confused, and asks her what she's doing sobbing on the ground. Lagos doesn't even say anything, and instead just sits there and continues crying. While the former master and slave are having a very awkward reunion, the scene cuts back to 30 minutes ago. We see the two assassins who were hot on Zig's heels, searching the woods to find him. As it turns out, the blacksmith was somehow able to cleverly evade the killers. So now, they're just walking in circles, wondering which way he went. Eventually, one of the assassins hears a noise coming from deeper in the forest, so he informs his colleague and they immediately run in there, thinking that it might be Zig. They both run past our hero, unable to see him hiding right under their noses all along. The assassins pay no attention to the only cut tree around, so after they're gone, our hero casually deactivates his log armor and we see where he has been hiding in plain sight. At this point, Zig is covered in dirt and sweating profusely to show just how difficult the last couple hours have been for him. He heaves a sigh of relief and is glad to say that he's finally lost the killer on his tail. Now that he survived them, he talks about how the next thing he needs to do is find a greater antidote. But before he can finish the thought, a loud stomp interrupts him. Our boy doesn't even need to turn around before realizing that he's in trouble, because judging from that sound, he can already imagine what kind of creature is standing behind him. Just to confirm, he turns around slowly and looks up at the giant yellow ogre smiling at him like a creep. He can tell that it's not a friendly smile though, because the creature is very much ready to devour its prey. This point is proven quickly, when the beast starts drooling all over the place like a dog in front of some chicken. A tab pops up to inform Zig that the hungry creature is a yellow ogre, which is a rare mob that appears in the highlands of Nemesis Mountains. The giant monster leaps into the air in an attempt to smash the blacksmith into the ground, and while it's in the air, Zig thinks about how to face it. He remembers from experience that it's better not to fight a yellow ogre, because it has a very high attack power relative to its level. The ogre finally lands its powerful hit but ends up missing, because our boy effortlessly dodges by grabbing onto a vine and swings away. 
even though it's not advisable to take on such a beast. It's recommended that you catch the yellow ogre because it drops greater antidotes. However, this is only the case for users who are skilled in combat. By holding himself up with one hand and his sword in the other, Zig flexes his strength and smirks at the beast as he prepares to use the info he extracted from the Nemesis Mountain's notice board to kill the ogre. With this in mind, our hero proceeds to unleash a barrage of attacks on the monster. From experience, he knows that it doesn't matter how strong a monster's attack is, because it's useless if they can't even hit him. Zig swings into action, literally, and lands a devastating blow on the ogre's head, which takes away 50 whole points from its health. Then, he strikes again to take out 70 points, and then 65, 30, and just goes on like that, until the yellow ogre is at the verge of death. The powerful attack that removes 120 life points turns out to be the last straw, because the ogre starts running away like a middle school kid being confronted by bullies. It even cries as it retreats, but our hero just swings after it like Tarzan with a grudge, yelling for the ogre to stop running away. A few moments later after the little beatdown, we see Zig drinking a green potion from a bottle, which turns out to be the greater antidote he was talking about earlier. It's a cure-all antidote that can cure any kind of condition in the game. We catch up with our boy after he saves Legas from the yellow ogre, and while he chugs the green liquid down, Legas calls him a liar, refusing to believe that he actually killed the huge beast. At this point, our hero must be sick and tired of everyone underestimating him all the time, but it's a good thing he always manages to prove them wrong. Seeing the condescending and disbelieving look on her face, Zig just laughs and confirms that he killed the beast by pointing at the new title above his head, which boldly identifies him as an ogre vanquisher. Gaining this title is no easy feat as you know, because you don't just get it by killing the ogre. Instead, only someone who strikes fear into the yellow ogre's heart can acquire it. After showing her his new title, he claims that even though his attack level is low, all he has to do is to keep whacking the ogre until it dies. While he's casually revealing this, Legas is more concerned with the fact that he was able to kill such a monster, because it shouldn't be possible for him to have such combat power as a blacksmith. For some reason, she's very annoyed about the whole situation, when she should actually be grateful to him for saving her life. Zig on the other hand is pretty oblivious to her envy and anger, because he's more interested in celebrating his healing after drinking the greater antidote. The manipulative con woman watches him jump around happily like a kid, and concludes that his special skills will come in handy, because things will be easier for her with him by her side. She cuts his joy short by suddenly telling him that they have some work to do. Our hero is both shocked and confused to hear her say such a thing after he just saved her life, so he expresses his confusion, and Legas asks him if he wants to complete the quest too. Our boy doesn't even need to answer the question to confirm her suspicions, so the trickster reveals that she's come up with a plan to wipe out the Black Crescent Moon. The scene shifts, and we see the players participating in the quest, arriving at a narrow rope bridge. The players stand there with their supplies and carts, waiting for their leader to make the first move, and soon, Guilford arrives with his men. One of them points out that they've finally reached the bridge, and claims that they're almost at their destination. However, Guilford reveals that they're not, and then suddenly swings his giant sword at what seems to be thin air. But when the flames knock Kira out and make him visible again, we realize that the assassin was actually hiding in plain sight. The impact from the old man's mighty weapon sends the first-class assassin flying back a few feet, but he stays on his feet and shakes off the pain. Kira admits that he's impressed with Guilford for sensing him, because he's very sure that he hid his presence well. Intrigued by Guilford's ability, the psycho assassin asks him how exactly he managed to find him, but the old man just scoffs before claiming that he's simply more experienced. Hearing this brutal burn, the crazy killer just snaps his fingers and tells Guilford not to act so tough and claims that the Red Tiger Company is about to get destroyed by his army. The moment he snaps his fingers, hundreds of arrows suddenly appear in the sky, raining down on Guilford and his men. They all look up and see the speeding arrows racing toward them. Like the brave leader he is, Guilford uses his sword to slash all the weapons he can, but unfortunately, there's only so much he can destroy, and as a result, some of his men get brutally injured. After surviving the first wave of attack, the old man calls out to his trusty mage, Hyung Siok, and orders him to create the ice wall barrier as he did before. But unfortunately, before the sorcerer can cast the spell, one of Kira's assassins appears behind him and slits his throat with a dagger. Witnessing the gruesome death of one of his men, a heartbroken Guilford screams in pain. But while he's still grieving the loss, the villain repeats the same move by appearing right in front of him and stabbing him in the chest. Unfortunately, this time, Zig isn't here to save him, and as a result, the great Guilford of the Storm falls to the ground, losing his sword in the process. After the old man collapses, the psycho assassin mocks him, claiming that he's not as great as they say, and prepares to deliver the finishing blow to end Guilford's gaming life for good. However, just when he's about to kill the old mercenary, he is distracted by the noise coming from a cart speeding toward him. Kira is taken aback by all the commotion and then he sees our boy pushing the cart toward him, waving and mocking him by calling him a petty thief. 
as you'd expect. The first class assassin is very irritated and enraged to see the confrontational blacksmith again. But because of Zig's shocking entrance, he's a bit stunned so he just stands in a spot, curious to see what our hero is going to do next. Using the momentum from his run, the blacksmith generates a lot of speed on the cart so he pushes it toward the assassin and tells him that it's a present. As the wagon races toward him, Kira just uses his powerful dagger to destroy it. But what he doesn't realize is the fact that he also smashes a bottle containing a purple potion in the process. The liquid spills all over him, but he doesn't even notice because he's too busy smiling smugly and feeling invincible. After the cool display, Kira is covered in the strange liquid, but he still doesn't notice since he's more concerned with gloating and trying to intimidate our favorite blacksmith. The crazy killer confronts Zig, revealing that he heard he luckily escaped earlier, and he also admits that he didn't expect the blacksmith to come back on his own. You can't blame Kira for thinking this way though, because he probably doesn't know that Zig is the main character in this story. And right now, the sorry loser is about to discover why this blacksmith is the main man. The first class assassin thinks Zig's return is a very stupid move, so he concludes that our hero definitely has a death wish. Unfortunately for Kira, he quickly realizes that he's the stupid one in the picture when he starts to feel weird and smells a strange scent all over his body. He starts to panic while wondering what the scent is, even though Zig already told him what it is earlier. Guess he doesn't like the present very much, which is a bummer, because that's not the only surprise our hero has in store for him. While the psycho killer is distracted, our boy charges at him with another attack, calling it a bonus for the present, and then proceeds to hurl a flaming bottle at him. As it turns out, Zig's aim has become pretty impressive unlike before, because the bottle lands right on Kira's foot and shatters. The moment the bottle breaks and the liquid inside is exposed, our hero yells out to signal the next phase of his plan. And all of a sudden, several huge explosions follow, blowing up the psycho killer in the Black Moon Crescent. The fire consumes the first-class assassin, and he can't do anything but yell at the blacksmith as he meets his demise. The large-scale explosions turn the place into a massive ruin, as smoke and ash cover the sky. And in the midst of all this, the trickster who came up with the plan just stands and watches on, relieved that her dreams of completing the quest are still alive. We see several wooden barrels with taps lined up on Lega's cart, and she reveals that the content of each vessel is something called blast spirits, which in other words, practically means liquid explosives. While slightly opening the tap on one of the barrels, she informs our hero that she brought the blast spirits on the quest as a trade item, because the dwarves seem to love it for some reason. As the tap opens, the scent fills the air, and she confirms that one can tell that the liquor is insanely strong just by the smell. A single drop of the blast spirit falls from the tap, and as they reach the ground, Legas prepares to demonstrate how strong the liquor actually is. Even though the smell is already very strong, she feels that Zig would get a better idea of what she's talking about by showing him, so she strikes a matchstick. And once it lights up, she tosses the burning stick over to the single drop. The moment the fire touches the liquid, a mini explosion occurs right at their feet, and the con woman confirms that even a single drop will explode every time it comes in contact with fire. It's based on this little science experiment that her killer plan will be executed, so she proceeds to explain how she wants to take Kira and his minions down with it. Legas suggests that if they can find a way to throw all the barrels at Kira and cover him with the liquid, then they can light him up and watch as the massive boom leads to satisfying fireworks. The trickster has a lot of faith in this plan, because she feels that even if the psycho killer is a ranker, he'll definitely die from a single blow because he's an assassin. She feels that the plan is a good one, but our favorite blacksmith is a little skeptical about it, and this makes her a bit upset. Pissed off by his reaction, she snaps and asks him what he thinks about it. Zig explains that even if they somehow manage to get rid of Kira, the issue of his many followers will still be in the picture, because they'll be out of black spirits by then. Hearing this point, she stutters for a bit, implying that she didn't consider that part of the plan before. But then, she suddenly blurts out that they can just blow the assassins up along with their crazy leader. Sounds like a good plan still, but Zig points out that Kira is too proud. He even calls him a peacock to make his point, and explains that there's no way he's going to stick around with the rest of his followers. With this in mind, our boy suggests that the first-class assassin is most likely going to climb out of his hiding place by himself, just so he can show off. Even though she totally understands his point, she still feels that if they can get rid of Kira, then the rest of them will be taken care of as well. But before she can even say this, Zig cuts her off and makes it clear that such a mission cannot be completed by just eliminating the leader. And the reason he thinks this way is because there are just too many of the Black Crescent Moon assassins. The fact that he keeps countering her ideas is starting to get her upset. So, once again, she snaps at him, angrily asking him what he thinks they should do, and challenging him to come up with his own good ideas. Our boy can sense the tension from the tone of her voice, so he calmly tells her to think about the situation. He then explains that Kira and his men are going to be hiding somewhere before attacking, just like they did before. 
With this fact already being established, Zig believes that their plan should be simple, and then suggests that they go to all the places where the scumbags are hiding first, and light them up like fireworks. As our boy comes up with this brilliant plan, the scene shifts for a bit and we see Legas running away from the explosion, looking a bit surprised that the plan worked just like our hero predicted. Anyway, we return to the flashback, and see where our hero puts the finishing touches on the master plan, by explaining that he'll tell her the location where the canyon could collapse. After that, he claims that he'll give her a signal, and tells her that she should blow up the alcohol barrels when he does. The scene switches back to the moment Legas is running from the flames, and she still doesn't look happy even though the plan worked. In fact, she looks upset that Zig's brilliant plan turned out well, because apparently, she underestimated him quite a bit. For starters, she can't believe that he thought about blowing up the canyon before her, and the fact that somehow managed to vanquish the yellow ogre makes her so annoyed that she starts to wonder who this overachieving blacksmith really is. Meanwhile, while she's beating herself up by competing with our hero, the blacksmith in question watches the massive and honestly incredible explosion in awe. He's almost overwhelmed by the unbelievable destruction he's witnessing, because he probably didn't expect it to look like the end of the world or something. His eyes glimmer with powerful sparks as he looks up at the fiery sky, feeling proud of himself, even though he admits that was a bit doubtful the plan would work. As he stands in the middle of the hellscape that just formed, he lets out a small laugh and thinks about how his grain skill keeps getting more fun the more he learns about it. The uncontrollable flames consume the first-class assassin, and Zig chuckles even more, before deciding that he'll look into his new grain skill even more once he's done with the trade route quest. Our boy is about to start walking away from the burning place, when suddenly, the psycho killer starts moving toward him while still covered in flames. You can tell how insanely hot the fire is, when a puff of smoke comes out as Kira opens his mouth to talk. Seriously, how the fuck is this guy still not dead? Anyway, he walks up to our boy and confronts him, asking him where he's going. As you'd expect, Zig is surprised to even hear someone talk behind him, because no one should be able to survive such an inferno. However, he's in Arpedia online, and it appears this villain in particular might just be immune to fire. Before our boy can even turn around completely, this flaming assassin charges at him like a human meteor. But thankfully, he sees the killer coming, so he quickly dodges the attack. Like an actual rocket, Kira flies past our hero and misses. While he's crashing into something else, Zig appears to be absolutely stunned and baffled that the assassin is still alive even after getting blown up. At this point, he starts to fear that Kira might be an unkillable monster like many other rankers. And while he's busy freaking out, the assassin in question turns around with the flames spreading all over his body, and then promises to make our hero regret his life. We thought Kira was crazy before, but when he turns around, the scary look on his face gives us an idea of the true psychopath he actually is. With smoke leaving both corners of his mouth, his eyes glow with a terrifying red color, and he grabs his two curved daggers in preparation for another deadly battle. Elsewhere, we see Guilford and the other players finally crossing the rope bridge, and as the leader of the exploration, he shouts for everyone to move slowly and carefully, instructing that NPCs and beginner users be allowed to cross the bridge first. After giving the orders, the old man drops his fearless demeanor and whispers to Scarface, revealing that he doesn't know what caused the explosion, but admits that he's thankful for it because he'd have been dead otherwise. On that note, he suggests that they get moving before the Black Crescent Moon catches up with them again. Just then, the familiar white-haired merchant runs toward the bridge, yelling out to get Guilford's attention. The old man turns around, and when she finally gets to him, she falls to her knees in exhaustion so she can catch her breath first. While she's doing that, Guilford recognizes her and tries to say something, but she quickly cuts him off with a very scary statement, claiming that it's now or never. Legas tells him that they have to cross the bridge right away before the assassins come after them, and upon hearing this, the gears in Guilford's head start to turn till he concludes that she must be the one who caused the massive explosions. At this point, she appears to be getting impatient, so she quickly confirms his guess and also informs him that the plan was a collaboration with our hero, the famous blacksmith named Zig. The old man is surprised to hear that name again, and Scarface interrupts him, pointing out that the others have crossed the bridge, so he tries to suggest that they get moving as well. However, before he can do this, the red-eyed mercenary declares that he's going to wait there until our boy arrives. Both Legas and Scarface are shocked by his statement, so the merchant tries to change his mind by explaining that the killers are going to arrive soon, and that it's best if they cross immediately. Despite her attempts to convince him, Guilford tells her that the blacksmith saved him twice, and that he's now in his debt, even though he never wanted to. As a result of this, his pride and honor won't allow him to just leave without trying to help the person who saved his life. Meanwhile, back in the hellscape, we see our boy holding his own against the killer within the tall flames. Just like before, Zig uses his very efficient arm break skill to destroy one of Kira's daggers, and as the broken blade falls to the ground, the psycho assassin realizes that it's the same skill our hero used against him earlier. 
As the fire surrounds them, the brave blacksmith takes a battle stance with his sword again, while Kira boasts, asking him if he really thinks his petty tricks can take down a first-class assassin like him. Rather than getting intimidated, Zig shows just how fearless he can be by hitting back at the psycho killer with taunts, suggesting that he can't even stand straight anymore since he got blown up during the explosion. The blacksmith points his sword at the assassin and boldly tells him that he's all bark and no bite. But while he's still talking, several strange purple slashes appear on his hand, spreading pain all over his body. As the long slash strikes our hero, he screams in pain and coughs up blood, showing just how deadly the attack is. As he collapses to the ground, the tremendous pain makes him wonder what could have caused the sudden damage. Of course, the person responsible turns out to be none other than Kira himself, who stands over our hero and reveals that the damage and pain are caused by a skill, which is called the afterimage assault. Seeing the blacksmith on the ground, the assassin starts mocking him by asking if he really thought he could win by simply dodging. Feeling victorious, Kira calls Zig a knucklehead and tells him to know his place. But even after taking all that damage, our boy doesn't stay down. The brave and resilient blacksmith tries to get back on his feet, and when the crazy killer sees this, he attempts to stomp Zig's head into the ground, telling him that he's going to kill him like a bug. Just when Kira raises his leg to deliver the finishing blow, our boy suddenly shouts for something to execute a plan. And as you'd expect, the assassin is taken aback by this so he stops and begins to wonder if there is another bomb left that he didn't know about. You can tell from the look on his face that he's terrified of the explosion, and it's very likely that he won't survive another blast. Kira looks around frantically searching for the so-called bomb, or whoever the blacksmith was talking to. He starts to panic, but this emotion quickly turns to rage when he sees our hero running away. At this point, the assassin realizes that he's been outsmarted once again by the young blacksmith, and as such, he's utterly outraged so he curses our hero as he runs away. As our boy escapes, he laughs at the dumbass for falling for such a childish trick, and flips him off to annoy him even further. The psycho with a grudge follows Zig into a place called the Nemesis Mountain's Cave of Triumph, and as he continues to search for him, he threatens to deal with the blacksmith when he finds him. The assassin is so pissed that he even wishes he could beat up Zig in real life too, but while he's still saying this, something is suddenly thrown in his direction. Although he manages to dodge the first one, many others follow immediately. And before he can figure out what's going on, a barrage of biscuit missiles is unleashed on him. As you'd expect, he's quite baffled by the nature of the projectiles, but while he's distracted thinking about that, the fearless blacksmith appears out of nowhere with a powerful sword in hand, and uses it to take a big swing at Kira. Zig seems to have slashed the assassin in half with the supercharged weapon, and as this happens, you can tell from the look on Kira's face that he's now really afraid of the blacksmith he's consistently been looking down on. Seeing the massive damage he inflicted, our hero is delighted that he finally landed a lethal hit on his opponent, but this joy is short-lived when the injured assassin turns into purple dust. Of course, Zig is confused by what's happening, and as he loses his footing and stumbles, a tab pops up, revealing that the assassin used a hidden skill called Shadow Decoy, which summons a clone that moves and looks just like the main body, but disappears when attacked by the enemy. In other words, our boy has been tricked by the psycho killer, and while he's still trying to wrap his head around the whole situation, Kira once again does some ninja shit, and surprises him with a devastating kick on the back from behind. The force from the attack is so great that it sends the blacksmith flying several feet away till he crashes elsewhere, and then, we see Kira stepping on his sword. The seemingly unkillable first-class assassin admits that Zig is one tough guy, and even suggests that he might even be more of a pain in the butt than Guilford. Regardless of everything that had happened up until that moment, Kira pulls out his dagger and declares that the game's end now. Unfortunately for him, before he can finish his threats, he's suddenly interrupted when vines sprout up from the ground and tie up his feet. When he sees the vines creeping up his feet, he's both irritated and frustrated, because at this point, he's tired of the surprises that keep coming out of nowhere. Kira wonders what could be causing the vines to come to life this time around, and as he begins to panic, Zig, who's chilling on the other side of the cave, calmly tells him that although there aren't any mobs or items in the cave, there's an interesting plant that grows inside it. Hearing this, the assassin tries to break free from the vines, but they just tighten up even more, and when our boy sees this, he casually tells Kira that there's no use struggling because he can't escape the plant's grip. As it turns out, these mysterious plants are called the cave vines, and they're at level 33, possessing the ability to trap any nearby objects, and only disappearing after the restrained time is over. Zig suddenly gets back on his feet, and as he goes closer to the trapped assassin, he thinks about how the whole plan was just a gamble, but somehow ended up working. He still makes it look very intentional to the assassin, and simply proceeds to taunt him, telling him that he should have looked where he was stepping. At this point, Kira is extremely fed up with the blacksmith, and whatever hatred he felt for him before must have multiplied tenfold because of how annoying Zig has been. 
The frustrated assassin curses at him for playing tricks till the very end, and angrily asks our hero what he could possibly do to hurt him in 10 seconds when he has no combat skills or weapon. Just as Kira asks the question, something starts to materialize in Zig's hand, and while it's still taking shape, he tells the killer that he doesn't need any weapon or combat skills because he successfully killed a giant golem with the object in his hand. That's about when the trusty pickaxe fully materializes, and as he tightens his grip on the tool, a smile is plastered on his face because he feels the assassin might not have heard about something called rage mode. Kira also has a smile on his face, and like usual, it's a more twisted and cynical one, because he's once again underestimating our hero. The assassin scoffs upon seeing the weapon and mocks the blacksmith for choosing a mere pickaxe as his trump card, because he's pretty sure that there's no way such a weapon could possibly harm his defenses. Despite the condescending remarks, Zig just hits back at the psycho, suggesting that they check if it's a mere pickaxe or not. And just as he says this, he charges at Kira once again. But then something unexpected happens, because rather than landing a hit on the assassin, the blacksmith chooses to bury his axe into the wall of the cave. A huge crack appears on the wall, and Kira starts mocking our hero. He calls him a fool, and claims that he can't even hit a static target, because he thinks that he missed by accident. However, he quickly realizes that he was wrong when our hero bluntly tells him that he didn't miss and reveals that his aim was actually perfect. He then points at the crack on the wall as the blue energy-filled lines spread all over the cave and reveals that he actually hit the core of all the walls in the cave. Our boy didn't just hit the core though, he actually destroyed it, and as a result, the entire cave is going to collapse in a short while. Even though he reveals this to the psycho, Kira refuses to believe him, claiming that such a small hit can't make the cave collapse. But while he's still trying to counter the blacksmith's claim, the cave's rumbling grips him with fear because he realizes that the entire thing is actually shaking. Kira is sure that he's never heard of such a thing happening, so he convinces himself that there's no way our hero is not bluffing. Even though he's lying to himself, he can't pretend that he doesn't feel what's happening around him, so he starts to wonder if the blacksmith's skill is something that messes with the mind. But then he concludes that it's not possible because Zig is just a blacksmith. With all his other guesses turning out to be wrong, Kira finally accepts the fact that the cave is really collapsing, and this terrifies him because he knows that Zig is planning to bring the whole thing down on both of them. At this point, the psycho can't think of any better option than to run for his life, so he takes to his heels, attempting to escape from the cave. But the vines tighten on his feet, causing him to trip over and smash his face on the ground. After he eats dirt, a tab pops up, reminding him that he is caught in the terrain and can't move freely for 10 seconds, which just makes him even more furious. After all, he's a first-class assassin, and he can't stand the thought of being defeated by an ordinary blacksmith. Unfortunately for him, Zig isn't your regular blacksmith, he's the goddamn hero of this story. While he's still yelling in rage and throwing a tantrum because of the cave vines, the inevitable happens, and massive boulders rain down from above as the cave finally collapses. The next thing we see is a paper reporting that the exploration team attack quest has failed, because all the assassins hired to stop the Barca's exploration team have died. Unfortunately, that's not the only bad news, because this failure also means that a penalty will be given to the Black Crescent Moon Guild members. Back at the bridge, we see Scarface still trying to convince Guilford to cross without Zig, and one of them even suggests that the young blacksmith is already dead. But of course, the father-in-law insists that the kid doesn't look like someone who would die so easily. Scarface agrees, but also points out that Zig should have shown up by now if he was still alive. As if on cue, the blacksmith in question appears and jokingly warns Scarface to watch his mouth because he's alive and well. Understandably, Zig is exhausted so he staggers over to them, but what the mercenaries can't fathom is the fact that he's unharmed, even after a one-on-one -on -one battle with the first-class assassin. It's at that moment that our hero reveals that he would have died if it wasn't for the ring leg is sold to him earlier. In a flashback scene, we see Zig back inside the crumbling cave as he thinks about how he only has one chance to escape without getting crushed. With only a few seconds till it's all over, he contemplates running toward the entrance of the cave, but ultimately decides to use the ring to teleport himself outside instead. So once again, he takes a big gamble and activates the one-time skill, and thankfully, it works, dropping him safely outside the cave before it collapses. Our boy is excited to still be alive, and admits that even though the ring just saved his life, he still considers it a rip-off because of the high price. Nevertheless, he's thankful to the con woman. And when Legas finds out he used an item that was basically useless to survive against a ranker, she becomes even more intrigued and impressed by our favorite blacksmith. Like the manipulative and desperate bitch she is, she concludes that she has to make him her slave because of how useful he can be. So, in an attempt to steal some of the credit, she claims that he should be thankful to her and refer to her as Big Sis. Zig bluntly responds that he doesn't even know her age, but he's distracted when Guilford praises him too. 
Scarface takes the opportunity to mock the old man for being all talk and no action, so he takes offense and claims that he had his own problems to deal with. Everyone laughs at the old man's expense, and after a brief moment of relief, Zig suggests that they continue their journey to the North Ark. The journey continues, and it doesn't take long before they arrive at their destination in the snowy mountains. As they reach the gates, a dwarf ushers them inside for shelter. The massive gates begin to open, and a notification pops up, informing them that their quest is finally complete. Out of the 80 adventurers who set out on the journey, only these 28 have managed to survive, and for their massive achievement, they'll receive a gift along with the king's approval. The gates finally open to reveal the engineering marvel that is the North Ark, a city inhabited by dwarves and other races. And simply by entering it, they all receive 3,000 experience points and 700 prestige points. For his pivotal role in the quest, Zig finally reaches level 55, and also unlocks the ability to craft and repair C-rank equipment. On top of that, he's been gifted the Shield of Wyg from King Barkas, a royal treasure which is exclusive to high-level blacksmiths only, which also gives our hero the special ability to block any kind of attack once a day. In the real world, we see an office setting where one of the executives shows the other men in the meeting a PowerPoint presentation, focused on the activities of our favorite blacksmith. The man in a suit reveals that the character's name is Zig, and that he was created only a month ago. He also reveals that the character is being controlled by a player, who was the previous user of the ranker character, Bartz. Pointing at the huge screen and going further into the report, the executive explains that since Zig was created, he has been showing signs of unusual play. For starters, he's already beaten the berserk giant stone golem, which activated from a hidden event. On top of that, this relatively new character has also completed a very special quest, and made it to the North Ark where the next trigger is set to be. After making his points, the official, along with his colleagues in the development team, believe that this new player has a very high chance of activating something that they call the Mykenia event. But just as he's saying this, a superior executive at the board meeting begins to voice out his own opinions. The big-lipped fellow decides to assume that a mere level 55 player can't clear the requirements for activation, but even if that happens, he still doesn't see any reason why they should delay the update. In response, the presenter nervously points out that the Mykenia event can bring about huge changes throughout the game, and if those changes were to clash with the timing of the update, then the users may end up getting confused about some things. While he's still trying to make his point, the big-lipped superior slaps his forehead, feeling disappointed and bored. He cuts the man off and suggests that he's not making any sense at the moment. The presenter turns out to be the department head, Kim, but this superior doesn't seem to think he's competent enough because he's currently scolding him like a toddler. The boss reminds Kim that it took over three years for the berserk giant stone golem to be unlocked, and that's quite a long time. So he's pretty baffled and annoyed that the department head of all people would suggest that they push back the update, because some low-level blacksmith in the game looks like he might activate a cannon event. Still feeling very upset, he asks Kim if he would take responsibility and face the backlash from players after doing something as annoying as delaying an update. And as you'd expect, no one would want to be burdened with such things. At this point, Kim is already sweating and shaking nervously in front of everyone, and as he tries to suggest that the move would benefit the players in the long run, someone else suddenly cuts him off and accepts responsibility for whatever backlash the company faces. Everyone turns around upon hearing the voice, and they're surprised to see director Sun Seokjin, smiling nervously as he enters the office. Sun apologizes for arriving late, and explains that he was so busy preparing for the meeting that he ended up forgetting about the meeting time itself. After receiving his flimsy excuse and chuckling awkwardly, the boss clears his throat and asks Sun to take a seat like the rest of them. And at the same time, he asks him to explain what he meant when he said he would take responsibility. As he takes his seat at the table, he calmly and vividly reiterates what he said, confirming that he's going to take full responsibility for the delay, so he supports the idea of pushing back the update. Of course, the boss is curious as to why he would take such a stand, so he asks Sun if it's because he also believes that the low-level blacksmith will activate the event. Hearing this, the director adjusts his glasses and admits that the point is a small part of his decision, but reveals that there were also some additional things he wanted to add to the update. As such, Sun once again tells the boss that he's asking for time to finish adding all those things to the update. And after clicking a few keys on his computer, he turns the screen to the others, showing them the stuff he has in store. Stuff like Continental Expansion, the story expansion of Deborah the Witch, 300 new skills to be added, and even underwater monsters. With a confident grin on his face, Sun asks the boss what he thinks about the new features he has in mind, but the superior is dumbfounded upon seeing the brilliant ideas lined up for the update. At this point, Sun takes the boss's stupefied look and silence is a good sign, so for the last time, he suggests that they push back the schedule a little bit before proceeding with the update. And he also claims that if they're unable to meet the expected performance numbers, he will take responsibility and bear the consequences. 
While he's saying all of this, the other executives murmur among themselves. And just then, Kim approaches him, telling him to wait a minute, and reminds him that it usually takes at least two years to develop all the things he just displayed. Even though Kim is freaking out, Sun just smiles nonchalantly and claims that he already did most of the work while he was on vacation, and as such, the development team just has to put the finishing touches before launch. Upon hearing this, Kim is shocked and also quite doubtful about it, because he doesn't really believe that one man can do all that work by himself in such a short time. But while he's deep in thought, Sun interrupts him by asking him if he looks forward to seeing the new changes in Arpedia Online after the update. Meanwhile, elsewhere, we see Kang laughing hysterically in his sleep, as he talks about how he finally found the hacker who took Bart's away from him. As it turns out, the bastard hacker was hiding in the North Ark, and Kang knew all along that he would be there. While he's saying all of this, his younger brother walks into the room, and as usual, a look of disappointment is etched on his face when he sees his pathetic brother laughing like a maniac on his bed. It seems Kang was acting too weird for him, because the next thing we see is that he's leaving the room the way he came while sighing in exhaustion. Afterward, Hyun goes to see their parents, and just as he's walking into the room, they ask him where his older brother is. The boy replies that he's still sleeping, and remarks that he must have stayed up playing games all night. Not surprisingly, their mother is furious when she hears this, especially because Kang promised that he'll be studying at night. In this family, it seems like the dad is the cool laid-back parent, because he doesn't see anything wrong with Kang's behavior. And as he calmly asks his wife to cool down, he claims that the fact that Kang would even promise to do something on his own is already a step in the right direction. The gentleman says this while eating his food, before reminding his wife about their son's past, and why she should cut him some slack. Seeing her husband so calm about the situation, she accuses him of being the reason Kang acts the way he does, and she's particularly concerned about it because she fears he won't be able to earn a living at this rate. Once again, the kind father that everyone wishes they had claims that Kang earning his keep shouldn't be an issue because he can always inherit their store. After all, the only thing he wishes for their son is for him to be happy. It turns out that Kang's father feels really bad about his son because when the boy was suffering in college, they couldn't do anything to help him. Which is why he feels they should just let him do anything he wants now to make up for their absence. Just then, we see that Kang has woken up and is now eavesdropping on the conversation, so he hears when his father says all of this and admits that he's worried about the game addict's health. At this point, the younger and less problematic brother starts to get bored of the whole thing, so he decides to try his luck by suggesting that he celebrate the father's wisdom by skipping his lessons at the cram school. But before he can finish talking, the old man switches up on him and tells him a very loud and clear no, which makes the high school student sigh in disappointment. Well, at least it was worth a shot. The scene shifts, and we see the problem child sitting outside, probably thinking deeply about his life choices. With a big drink in his hand, his thoughts are all over the place as he recalls the conversation he heard at home, specifically when his dad said that they couldn't help him when he was in trouble, and how they should let him be if he has something he really wants to do. After recalling the memory, Kang thinks about how his parents have unnecessary worries, especially since he doesn't even care about their concerns at the moment. As he slams the can on the bench, the scene shifts to the time when Kang was in his second year at Hakram High. We see him getting the disgusting food on his tray at the cafeteria, and as he looks at the weird stuff on the plate, he wonders if it's even real food. Anyone who might have thought he was exaggerating was dead wrong, because by the time the so-called plate of food is in view, we see an actual rat floating inside it. Without skipping a beat, Kang and his friends decide to take pictures of the garbage being served at their cafeteria and then post them on the internet. It doesn't take long before the post is on the web, and attached to the disturbing picture is a very detailed caption to match. But what he intended as a not-so-harmful joke ended up turning into something very serious, and Kang finds out just how much trouble he's in during the next class. While everyone is seated and listening to the teacher, someone suddenly barges into the classroom to search for our hero. Seeing the angry student in their class, all of Kang's classmates start to whisper, and we get to know that the furious guy is Kim Piljoon, a student who hails from Yongwon Middle School. As it turns out, Kim was famous during his middle school days, and since then, he's gotten a reputation for being really fucking crazy. The students continue to whisper, warning each other not to make eye contact with the psycho, because he has a tendency to hit people for no reason. While they're whispering, Kim walks over to a table where one of the students is sleeping, and asks the guy sitting next to him if the dozer is Kang. Of course, the terrified classmate rats him out, and so, Kim immediately pulls the gamer's head up with his hair, yelling at him to wake up. Unfortunately, it seems Kang is a really deep sleeper, because even the angry yells can't bring him back from dreamland. He keeps drooling and begins to sleep talk while trying to deny that he wasn't sleeping, because he thinks the person yelling at him is the class teacher. Seeing this, Kim loses his cool, so he lands a devastating punch on the sleeping boy's face, causing the gamer to bleed out of his nose and mouth before collapsing to the floor like a dead body. 
Even when Kang's head hits the floor, Kim doesn't feel remorseful or concerned. Instead, he just cracks his knuckles as he prepares to fuck up our hero. At the start of the next chapter, the scene shifts once more and we see Kang arriving home from school. Judging by the look on his mother's face, you can tell that she is horrified at the sight of her son. The shocked and worried mother tries to ask Kang what happened to his face and even wonders if he got into a fight. But rather than telling her the truth, the boy just claims that he fell down the stairs. Even though she doesn't totally believe this story, she skips the details first and asks him if he's alright. But before she can even finish talking, Kang just storms past her, not giving her any audience or attention. He keeps walking away without even saying anything, so his worried mother asks him if they're not going to the hospital. Hearing this, Kang finally turns around, revealing his messed up face one more time, before telling her that she has nothing to worry about because he's fine. As any person with eyes would have already guessed, Kang was not fine in any way whatsoever. You'd think that after one day of premium bullying, Kang would have been left off the hook, but unfortunately, his bully was just getting started with him. In fact, from that day forward, our hero's school life transformed into a living hell, because no matter how hard he tried to hide or escape, Kim would always find him to make him miserable. It happened everywhere at school, and nowhere was safe for Kang anymore, because Kim never seemed to mind the place or the people before starting the bullying. As a result of the endless humiliation and suffering, all of Kang's friends drifted away, leaving him more and more isolated and exposed for Kim to hunt him down. Things only got worse from there, because apart from being doused with the disgusting cafeteria food all the time, Kang was hit every single day. He was hit and bullied endlessly, and he still didn't know why Kim was torturing him. So one day, while he was lying at the bully's feet covered in cuts and bruises, he asked the monster why he was doing this to him in the first place. Rather than answering, or even showing a drop of sympathy, Kim and his goons pretended not to hear what he was saying, and one of them even went closer to curse at him and ask him what he's mumbling. Surprisingly, our boy suddenly summons the strength and courage to speak up, because he yells out the question again, which shocks all the bullies present. Seeing that Kang's fire isn't out yet, Kim is speechless for a brief moment before bursting into laughter like a psychopath and calling our hero a bastard for acting all tragic. The ringleader of the bullies starts mocking Kang for what he said and for being afraid, but his twisted fun is suddenly interrupted when a voice tells the bullies to mind their behavior. Kim is alarmed by the sound of the voice, and when one of his goons turns around to see the owner, he's visibly horrified. The stranger continues talking and tells the bullies that if a friend asks a question, they're obliged to answer properly. We finally see that this brave hero, who's coming to save our own hero, is Jiang Hunil, who just happens to be the Hakram High School Student Council president. Like everyone else, Kang looks up to see who's talking, and is surprised to see that it's Jiang Hunil, the same guy who always takes first place in class. As it turns out, Hunil's presence actually makes a difference, because all of a sudden, Kim backs off. The student council president acts a lot nicer, and even goes toward Kang so he can reveal why Kim has been bullying him ever since. However, we quickly realize that it's just another wicked scheme to hurt the poor kid, because all of a sudden, he tells Kang to listen up and pulls the hair on his head with great force. Jiang Hunil smiles wickedly and reveals that they've been hurting him because he just felt like it. The undercover bully even believes that he shouldn't really have a reason to fuck our boy up, but he just clarifies that he's been messing with him simply because he doesn't like him. The other bullies start laughing of course, and our hero just lies on the floor, physically and emotionally scarred by their words and actions. As the flashback ends, we see Kang crushing the empty can with his hand while he's still sitting outside. He remembers the traumatizing series of events and curses Jiang Hunil for treating him like a boxing bag along with the other bullies. Enraged and frustrated, our boy starts shadowboxing and threatens to rough all the bullies up if he ever meets them again. Because with the battle sense he learned from the game, he believes that he'll be an unstoppable force that would turn all his enemies into mincemeat. Out of the blue, a napkin flies at his face and just sticks there, covering his eyesight. Our boy struggles to get it off and staggers because he can't see what's in front of him. With his obstructed eyesight, he staggers all over the place until he seems to bump into a big guy with tattoos on his arms. Of course, Kang is the one who falls flat on his butt because he's smaller, and as he winces like a girl, the big guy with an accent tells Kang to apologize because it's the normal thing to do after bumping into someone on the road. While rubbing his head in pain, our boy accepts that he's at fault, so he looks up at the big guy and tries to apologize, but when he sees the person's face, the sentence hangs in his throat. Kang immediately recognizes this tall figure as his tormentor from high school, and he's none other than Kim Piljoon. The bully stares down at him with a tired expression, revealing that he's very busy and has somewhere to be. In other words, he wants Kim to quickly apologize to him so he can get going. However, our stunned hero just keeps staring at him after the unexpected discovery, so the apology is the last thing on his mind. He's still sitting on the ground though, and the bastard still wants his apology. 
So, like the never-changing bully that he is, he kicks Kang's feet, asking him why he stopped talking, and if he's not going to apologize anymore. Seeing the face of his oppressor again strikes fear into Kang's body, and he even becomes speechless for a while, not being able to do anything but stare in bewilderment. At this point, the scumbag bully gets impatient and upset, so he grabs Kang by the shirt and lifts him off the ground. Kim holds our boy up with one hand, and angrily asks him if he can no longer hear what he's saying. Our terrified hero still doesn't say a word, but rather, he just keeps staring at the bully in shock and terror, wondering why Kim Piljun of all people is here. Just when the bully is probably about to start pummeling our boy, something unexpected happens. Kim's phone immediately starts ringing, so he lets go of Kang, calling him a lucky bastard as he checks his phone. Once again, the rude bully drips our hero on his butt, and as he takes his call while walking away, he tells Kang to be more careful in the future. Before he leaves the scene, our boy hears Kim telling someone over the phone that he's on his way. And hearing this, Kang becomes even more stressed out than earlier. The scene shifts, and elsewhere, we see Kim asking an unknown man who's wearing a turtleneck if he's increasing the amount of his bribes. And the latter confirms this, explaining that it would happen pretty soon because the topic will come up during one of the meetings. As it turns out, these guys are also players of the popular fantasy game, Arpedia Online. Because we see the man reminding Kim that the North Ark and Bark has recently started trading, which also appears to be the reason Mr. Turtleneck wants to increase the price of his bribes because the new trade route has caused finances from the lords and Broaden to be in a tough spot. Mr. Turtleneck then reveals some in-game politics to justify his decision, but Kim still insists that doubling the price is a bit over the top. However, before he can finish talking, Mr. Turtleneck, who turns out to be Jiang Hunel, cuts him off by calling him with his last name and asking him what his final answer is. After thinking deeply about the question, Kim finally makes the difficult decision and reluctantly assures Jiang Hunel that he's got everything under control. The next day, our boy is feeling very motivated, so he goes to a gym and hopes to muster enough courage to register. He stands at the door, feeling a bit disappointed, because he thought he was no longer particularly scared of other people. However, as the memory of Kim grabbing his shirt flashes across his mind again, his blood boils, and he vows that he's going to get stronger and enhance his mentality. With this fresh motivation, Kang storms into the gym, so pumped up that he instantly introduces himself and indicates his interest in learning martial arts but he immediately stops talking when he sees the real martial artist making a small mountain out of broken men, who are begging to be saved from his cruelty. Seeing how weak and beaten the men are, Kang wonders if they're dead and starts to reconsider his decision. He eventually changes his mind and starts walking out the door, claiming that he's unemployed and doesn't even have the money to pay for the martial arts lessons. Just then, the human tosser calls out to our hero and asks him if he's come for a membership. There's something eerily familiar about the man, and it's probably the scar on his face, which is very similar to the one of our hero's new friends in the game, the Scarface. Either way, Kang isn't planning on staying around to find any other similarities, because he just wants to escape. With this in mind, he lies that he didn't want to become a member and claims that he came into the dojo by mistake. But before he can walk out, he accidentally bumps into another big guy, and this one doesn't really look as friendly as the human tosser. The moment he sees Kang, a scowl appears on the big dude's face. Strangely enough, this guy also looks pretty familiar, and we soon realize that he's our father-in-law, Guilford of the Storm. It just so happens that this tough guy is also able to recognize our boy, because upon taking a closer look at our hero's face, his eyes widen, and he points at him, realizing that he's the blacksmith from the game. As our boy sits nervously on a couch in the dojo, he looks at the members awkwardly and begins to panic, thinking about how he could never have imagined that this dojo is actually the Red Tiger Company's headquarters in real life. While Guilford and Scarface sit across from him with smiles on their faces, the other members murmur in the background, wondering if the young man sitting in the room with them is truly the legendary blacksmith from the game. They all seem excited and surprised to see Kang, and Scarface finally breaks the awkward staring competition when he suddenly comments that he knows the reason Kang's movements in the game weren't like those of an ordinary person. As it turns out, the dojo instructor actually assumes that Kang is a martial artist himself, probably because of how pumped up he was earlier. Of course, after seeing what Scarface did to the other members during the sparring session, our hero is not in any hurry to meet the same fate, so he quickly denies the assertion and explains that he only thought he could learn something from the gym. Hearing this, Scarface interprets this as a request to join the dojo, so he asks Kang if he's come to become a new member. But this question takes our boy by surprise, and he instantly explains that he doesn't have any money and won't be able to afford any membership fees. However, while he's still saying this, Guilford chimes in, telling him not to worry, because he'll specially exempt him from paying any fees for a year. With that being said, Scarface pulls out a sheet of paper and tells Kang that perhaps they were meant to meet each other. As you'd expect, our MC is pretty upset that all his attempts to get out of joining them proved futile. 
and while he's nagging in his mind, Guilford daydreams about his plans for Kang, like how he's going to drain him like a dog till he finally learns some manners. Seeing that the martial artists badly want him in their dojo, our boy feels that he can't refuse, so he agrees to give the membership thing a try, especially since he thinks he has nothing to lose. Kang then accepts the offer, reminding them that he'll be in their care henceforth, so Scarface pulls out the membership form to sign him up right away. He asks our hero what his name is, and when he reveals that it's Kang Yuhan, Guilford instantly recognizes the name, claiming that it was also the name of the store owner's son, who he visited often in the past. From the small flashback scene we're shown, we can see that Kang and Guilford's daughter were quite close as children. The old man confirms this when he tells our boy that the person he's talking about used to be his daughter's childhood friend. Guilford suddenly reveals that the mention of the name makes him think of the old days, and upon hearing this, Kang starts sweating profusely because he's now extremely nervous. It seems that he already knows where the conversation is heading, because he also remembers someone who matches the story Guilford is telling. So after summoning all the courage in his body, he finally asks the bulked-up man what his name is. The old man didn't even realize that he hasn't introduced himself to Kang yet, so he reveals that his real name is Song Tisu, and of course, it's just as our boy suspected. At this point, he's almost completely sure that Tisu is his family friend from years ago, but to clear any doubt, he asks the big man what his daughter's name is. Even though Tisu reveals that her name is Charon, he doesn't seem to be pleased with the fact that a young man would be so curious about her. While he's expressing his annoyance, Scarface just sits beside him like a fangirl who's already shipping our boy and the big man's daughter. When Tisu asks Kang why he's so curious about the girl, the latter just laughs in response, before telling the old man that it's been a while. As you'd expect, Tisu is confused to hear this, and his annoyance grows even more as he asks the MC what he means by that statement. But then, it suddenly clicks in his head, and he realizes that the naughty boy sitting in front of him might be the same Kang Yuan he knows. The scene shifts, and we're taken back into the fantasy game, where we see a tab informing our hero that it's been 30 minutes since he ran out of stamina, but he just lies on the ground in exhaustion while his HP continues to decrease slowly. At this point, Zig looks like the life is being drained out of him, and as he starts to feel dizzy, he admits that it's the worst feeling ever. As that scene fades out, we see Tisu tossing Kang around the dojo and talking about fate. The old man claims that fate brought him and our hero together once more, and as such, he believes that he might as well teach him martial arts personally. After the hellish training session, the newest and most exhausted member, who happens to be our MC, drags his sorry ass home. And when he finally gets into his room, he doesn't even make it to his bed before collapsing beside his capsule. However, he still managed to muster enough strength to get into the capsule, so he can log into Arpedia online. What an absolute gamer. Back in the game, Zig talks about how he worked very hard, and thinks about getting some quests from the dwarves. He wanted such quests because they would help raise his level and crafting rank. They could have also helped him gain some hidden skills, but unfortunately, things didn't go the way our boy had planned. Instead of getting these special quests he craved so much, he got booted out of all the places he went to offer his services. It gets so bad that Zig starts to cry, because even though he knew the dwarves were closed off, he didn't expect the situation to be this bad. Our sad hero begins to recall the things the dwarves told him, and we see a flashback of two very mean ones yelling at him. The first one claims that humans will be of no use to him, mocking him for thinking he'd even hire him in the first place. While the second one simply accuses Zig of wanting to steal their secrets, and tells him to fuck off. Meanwhile, in the present, Zig is still outside on the streets, thinking about how terrible the dwarves are, and how they might even chase after him with swords if he tries any harder to get a job. As he gets back on his feet, he's immediately notified that he has insufficient stamina due to lack of food, so he decides to get something to eat first. A while later, our boy arrives at a place where he swears in frustration. As it turns out, the reason for this is the fact that food in the North Ark is outrageously expensive. Zig stares at the shiny overrated potatoes, and furiously asks why on earth they cost 1,200 gold. The price tag is so insane that he actually thinks the seller is kidding. But that's not even the most crazy part because these potatoes are also being kept inside a glass box. The whole thing makes Zig upset, but he realizes that it's just the beginning, when the dwarf merchant informs him that he's standing in the store with the cheapest food in the entire town. Hearing this, our boy begins to wonder if the prices are so unstable because the direct trade just started. But after shaking off the thought, he finally gives in and asks the merchant to sell him one of the potatoes. Unfortunately, when he checks his balance, he's disappointed to see that he has only 817 gold and won't even be able to afford a fucking potato. He's shocked to see his balance so low, and that's when he remembers that he spent all his money on ordering iron from the gold rush because he thought it would be easy to get into a workshop. RMC trails off after a while and returns to his sad reality, but still, he doesn't give up, and instead of leaving the store in defeat, he politely asks the dwarf for a 400 gold discount on the potato. 
For some reason, he actually thinks the plan will work. But while he's trying to give the merchant the puppy eyes, he's kicked out once again and told to piss off. After that scene, we catch up with Zig's present condition, where he's lying on the ground and looking like a shrunken vegetable. It turns out he still hasn't gotten anything to eat in the expensive town, so now, his HP is decreasing constantly and it looks like his time at Arpedia might have come to an end. Our hero wonders if he should just die at this point, because at least his stamina will be back to full when he responds. However, he ultimately decides not to give up there, because he remembers how he went through hell to gain the experience and all of his new skills. Our boy sits there crying like a baby, when suddenly, one of his items appears in his hands. He's decided that he has no other choice but to sell it, so he can get something to eat and save himself. We see that the item Zig wants to sell is the Shield of Weig, which just happens to be the gift that the king rewarded him with. He holds the shield against his face, and admits that it would be a waste to sell such treasure with special abilities. However, he feels like he has no choice, and since it's an epic rank item, he claims that it would take a while before he will even be able to use it. In conclusion, there's no point keeping it when it's almost impossible to make any money from work in the town. While he's sobbing and justifying his decision, he's interrupted by a dwarf who's staring longingly at the shield. The redhead dwarf admits that Zig has got a very nice-looking shield, and asks if he wants to sell it. Even though Zig wants to sell the shield, he pretends to be very attached to the treasured item, but at the back of his mind, he's delighted that he already has his first potential customer. Hearing what RMC said, the dwarf becomes curious about the treasure, so his interest and desire to purchase the item skyrockets in an instant. He offers Zig five big ones for the shield, explaining that he can't give him anything more for the item. When our hero interprets this statement, he's overwhelmed that the dwarf wants to pay a whopping five million gold for the shield, which is way more than he could have ever imagined. Without skipping a beat, Zig hands over the treasure to the dwarf, and accepts the deal feeling more satisfied than ever. The dwarf admits that it was quite expensive, but agrees that it's a good deal overall, so he takes it off our boy's hands and proceeds to make a payment that shocks the blacksmith to his bones. Words might not be able to describe just how disappointed and confused Zig is, when he sees a meager 500 gold being placed in his hand as payment for the shield. As it turns out, he misinterpreted the redhead's offer earlier, so now he's staring at the pathetic sum in his palms like he's in a daze. By the time he snaps out of it and regains consciousness, it's too late, because the dwarf is already driving off with the treasure. As you'd expect, Zig begins to panic and sweat profusely, regretting his decision to sell the shield. Like a crazy person, he chases after the vehicle, yelling at the dwarf to return his shield while other people just go about their business and ignore his pathetic display. The scene shifts, and the next thing we see is our favorite blacksmith's fist banging on a door, while he yells for the dwarf inside to come out. With a crazy look on his face, he hits the door over and over, screaming for the guy to come out, and threatening to stay outside his house forever if he refuses to show his face. At this point, you can tell that our boy has full-on spiraled, because even though he's supposed to be conserving his remaining energy, he's barking and yelling at the top of his lungs while banging on a door with all his might. While Zig is making a scene outside the house, something very tragic is happening inside, because when the scene shifts into the house, we see that the dwarf is already breaking the shield into several pieces. If you think Zig is pissed now, just wait till he sees what has become of his treasure. The dwarf finally finishes his work, and we see that he's done extracting the last jewel that was on the shield. But the only problem he thinks he has now is whether the jewels will match the wavelength of something else that he's building. Outside the house, it appears that our boy finally makes the rational decision and gets something to eat. He munches on the food like an animal with crumbs all over his face, but we can't really blame him since it's the first thing he's had to eat in a long time. While he eats the food like a maniac, he thinks about the bastard dwarf who bought the shield and vows that he's not going to give up that easily. In fact, Zig decides that he's even willing to become a murderer to get the shield back, and so he's desperately waiting outside for the dwarf to show himself. From the huge rock he is hiding behind, he hears someone tell another person to stop pushing him, and when our boy comes out to take a peek, he sees that the people talking are three young fat dwarf kids. Zig watches them quietly as they stand in front of a house, preparing to do something. He's curious to find out what they're talking about, because he hears one of the boys saying he's ready, while the girl among them assures them that she's in top shape. RMC watches the dwarves closely as they stand in front of the wall with their buckets in hand, and then all of a sudden, they begin their objective, which turns out to be some pretty vulgar graffiti. The kids write stuff like poop, moron, butthole, and other crazy things with their paint brushes. And when Zig realizes that they're just scribbling on the walls, it triggers something inside of him. He knows that scribbling is one of the basic things that children do, but for some reason, he doesn't like it. So while the kids are painting the shit out of the wall and having fun, the pissed blacksmith walks up to them from behind to cut the fun short. Our boy interrupts them, and as expected, the guilty dwarves turn around and immediately start denying, when clearly they were painting the walls. The brushes are even still in their hands while they're denying, but Zig doesn't even seem to care. 
he snatches a brush from one of them and tells them that what they've been doing isn't the right way to scribble something on a wall. And then he tells them that if they're going to do something like that, then they should at least do it the right way. Our boy is still saying this when a wide, mischievous grin appears on his face because he's about to indulge in some very childish shenanigans. The next thing we see is the blacksmith lifting the paint-soaked brush into the air to show that he means business. While Zig is busy distracting himself with that, we see the dwarf inside, holding a big bag of jewels that he's examining. After taking a close look at the jewels, he confirms his earlier fears and reveals that just as he thought, the magic power wavelength in his old jewels and the ones from the shield doesn't match. The dwarf is pretty disappointed because he feels like he bought the shield at a high price for nothing. But he ultimately accepts his fate since he can't change what has already happened, before starting to wonder if he'd have to go to the ice palace after all. Even though the thought crosses his mind, he admits that he's not too keen on fighting, because he feels that it's too barbaric. He burdens himself with these thoughts and worries as he climbs the stairs back up with his sack of disappointing jewels. The dwarf continues to ponder on the way forward and admits that it would be nice to see someone do the fighting in his stead because he's not a fan of violence. Still feeling very bummed out, the dwarf goes upstairs and finally comes out of his house. That's when Zig sees him and is instantly reminded of his vendetta. The blacksmith screams at the dwarf, pointing out the obvious and saying that he's finally come out. But as you'd expect, the redhead is just confused because he doesn't understand why the weirdo holding a bucket of paint is screaming at him like a maniac. Before the dwarf can even figure out what's going on, the angry blacksmith charges at him and grabs him by the shirt, demanding that he give him back his shield. He calls the short man a jerk and starts shedding tears as he expresses his frustration about the whole matter, because he doesn't understand why the dwarf could take such a rare treasure from him and pay only 500 gold when he went through hell to acquire it. Our boy is extremely pissed that the dwarf had the nerve to give him only 500 gold, and on top of that, he said big ones, which the blacksmith interpreted as a million, because that's the normal way things go when it comes to trade in Arpedia Online. Rather than snapping at him or feeling frightened, the short man just stares at our hero with a blank expression the whole time. Even while Zig is holding him in the air and screaming at him, he just stays completely silent, looking very bored. The blacksmith notices this and immediately becomes irritated by the dwarf's nonchalant behavior, so he just yells at him again, asking him if he's even listening to his rants. But once again, the short man doesn't say a word and continues to stare back. After being infuriatingly silent for a while, the dwarf finally speaks out, but the first thing he says has nothing to do with the shield, because he's more interested in finding out who vandalized his property with paint. He asks the blacksmith if he is the one who painted on his wall, so Zig reveals that he is, feeling flattered that the man asked about his artworks. But then he suddenly switches back into angry mode and tells the dwarf that the awful paintings are nothing compared to the pain he's already caused him by taking his shield away for an insulting price. At this point, he's still holding the short man by the collar to show just how furious he is. Imagine what he would do when he finds out that the shield he's been screaming for has already been destroyed into pieces. As Zig continues to yell and rant, the dwarf just ignores him and pays close attention to the paintings all over the wall. He scrutinizes the artwork and notices that they're giving off an aesthetic sense that seems to have stopped at the age of five. It appears that this dwarf knows a great deal about art because just by looking at the brush stroke, he concludes that it's reminiscent of a fractured wrist. And eventually, after examining all the paintings carefully, he actually finds them to be awesome. Our boy is too busy ranting to notice that the dwarf is also scrutinizing his looks now, and as he does so, he notices Zig's clothing, deducing that he must be a human blacksmith. Seeing this, the short man is delighted because he feels like there couldn't have been a more perfect time for him to meet a human blacksmith that would finally help him achieve the thing he's been longing for. Our boy finally notices that the dwarf zoned out a long time ago, so he calls his attention again and asks him to return the shield of Wyke. Because of Zig's little display, the three dwarf kids who started the whole graffiti fest easily sneak out of there and escape without any punishment. Meanwhile, the dwarf finally acknowledges our hero's presence and promises to give the shield back after telling the blacksmith to get his human hands off him. Zig lets him go, and immediately, the short man gives him a bag, telling him that the shield is inside it. Upon receiving the sack, our boy is happy and relieved to be getting his shield back, but when he looks into the bag, a wave of shock and disappointment washes over him again. The blacksmith turns the sack upside down, tossing the contents on the floor. And upon seeing the jewel and a piece of the shield, he expresses his confusion by asking the short man what on earth he's looking at. Of course, the dwarf reveals that it's the shield of Wyk he bought a while ago. It's now been turned into a few jewels, a golden mithril alloying steel plate, and a solid shield handle because the dwarf took it apart. As you'd expect, Zig is still baffled by what he's seeing and almost can't believe his eyes. But the dwarf casually tells him that since he took it apart so nicely, the blacksmith can just craft it again, assuring him that the same armament will be created. 
The short and insensitive man reminds Zig that he's a blacksmith and suggests that he should at least know how to craft things of such caliber. But our hero is so furious that he completely ignores the second statement and just asks the dwarf if he really just admitted to taking the shield apart. At this point, it's easy to assume this dwarf has a death wish because once again, he nonchalantly and casually confirms that he dismantled a rare treasure moments after buying it for a price that was nothing close to its true worth. From the black look on Zig's face, one can only imagine how angry he is. He appears to be so angry that he doesn't even know how to show it, so the first thing he does is place both hands on the dwarf's shoulders, probably to make sure he can't try to run away again. Suddenly, he tries to ask a question, but stutters in the process. And all of a sudden, he raises his head, and we finally see his face. However, it is not anything close to what we expected, because instead of a red-faced angry blacksmith, what we see is an oddly polite version, curiously asking the dwarf to reveal how he dismantled the shield of Wyke. I guess the student has found his teacher, and I feel like he would do anything to work under this dwarf. As we start the episode, Zig thinks about how the normal blacksmith skills only include production and repair, and because of this, it's customary to make an item with a recipe when crafting a piece of equipment using expensive materials. The reason for this is that it would be a total mess, and there would be a great loss if a bad piece is made by accident. However, an idea comes to our boy's mind, a hack that might be able to manage such a dicey situation, and it's the question, what if disassembly is possible? Using this technique, one can reuse the material and try out making equipment pieces that don't have a recipe, all without the fear of making a permanent mistake and loss. At the same time, our hero might also be able to create a surprising item with amazing abilities, or even take an already completed item and change it to fit his tastes. After thinking about all of this and the great prospects the technique has, Zig concludes that he has to learn disassembly, and even forgets about the rare shield that has been torn apart. With his hands still on the dwarf's shoulders, our hero starts begging the short man to teach him how to use the disassembly technique, even if it's just one lesson. And after a brief pause, the redhead agrees to train him, asking the human blacksmith if he's going to become his apprentice. Because Zig knows the dwarven philosophy that obliges all dwarfs to always protect their technology from other races, he doesn't even realize that the short man has already agreed. He keeps trying to convince the dwarf to teach him out of habit, until he finally realizes that the short man had already accepted his proposal. The next thing we see is our boy inside the house with the red-haired dwarf, and he doesn't look too comfortable this time around. Zig pinches his nose to prevent the pungent smell of mold from choking him out, and while he's still complaining about the terrible odor, the dwarf just ignores him and asks him to follow him into a trapdoor that leads to his basement. Of course, the blacksmith is reluctant to follow him, and while covering his nose still, he questions the short man's instruction. However, the dwarf doesn't even have any time to waste, so he just ignores our boy and keeps walking down the stairs. On the way down, he suddenly asks our hero if he knows anything about Anjuras, and the blacksmith admits that he does. It turns out that Anjura is a legendary monster in the game that is active in the northeastern part of the North Ark, and one unique thing about it is that it loves gemstones. As a result, the dwarves usually pay tribute to Anjuras from time to time in the form of jewelry or ornaments. This train of thought continues in Zig's head, and he thinks about how this particular monster is quite gentle, which is rare for dragons. But even though it's a gentle beast, the blacksmith still feels like it's ripping off the dwarves big time, and he's a bit jealous that it receives such expensive jewelry from the short men of the North Ark. While Zig thinks about all of this, the red-haired dwarf leading him downstairs suddenly reveals that he thinks the eastern folks paying tribute to the giant lizard are spineless for doing so. The short man doesn't believe in such traditions, so he sees himself as different from the easterners, and he makes this known to the blacksmith. This ambitious dwarf isn't willing to bend the knee to some overgrown lizard, and he vows to one day slay the giant beast, so that he can develop a rich ore vein in the north and become insanely wealthy. Hearing this, our boy applauds the dwarf for dreaming big, but at the back of his mind, he's praying that the desperate short man won't send him on a mission to hunt the giant lizard. To show just how serious this redhead is, he takes Zig to the door of a room, and as he unlocks the door, he reveals that he has created something to help him defeat Anjuras. Hearing this, the blacksmith becomes rather curious upon hearing about the supposed bad boy that's going to take down the legendary dragon. Zig expresses this curiosity, so the dwarf finally opens the door to the room. And as they enter, he tells the blacksmith that he'll introduce him to the so-called bad boy. Our hero's eyes widen as he sees the machine, and as he stares in bewilderment, the dwarf reveals that the device is in fact his life's work. As it turns out, this bad boy might actually be bad after all, because it's a mecha dragon and it's exactly what the dwarf plans to match up against the legendary dragon itself. I'm already getting chills from the thought of this fight. Even my boy Zig is so stunned that he stutters when he asks the short man if the mecha dragon can move yet. But rather than answering, the red-haired dwarf points out how stupid the blacksmith's question is. 
In a shocking twist, the dwarf reveals that the question is stupid because the dragon can't move, and he explains that if it could move, he wouldn't keep the huge machine down there, especially when his work area is already so crowded. As you'd expect, Zig is shocked and disappointed to hear this, because like every normal person, he expected that the so-called bad boy would at least be able to move. I mean, how's it going to defeat Anjuras if it can't move? Our boy expresses his utter disappointment, and even concludes that the mecha dragon is just a huge-ass tin can, but it seems like he might be wrong, because the dwarf calmly shushes him and tells him not to be so quick to judge. The red-haired short man reveals that all the pieces of the machine are appropriately balanced, and in a perfect state to allow perfect control. This is the point where Zig zones out, because the dwarf starts explaining a lot of complicated stuff about the machine's joints, and how he needs a very stable source of energy for the mecha dragon to work. Unfortunately, the blacksmith gets bored of hearing all the complex gibberish, so he loses focus and starts fiddling with something else. By the time the short Einstein is done rambling, Zig just casually shows him a random object, and asks him if he can make a weapon with it. Seeing that the punk wasn't even paying attention to what he was saying, the dwarf snaps and uses his short legs to kick the blacksmith, demanding that he listen because the main point of his long gibberish is about to begin. Of course, Zig isn't going to listen to all the complexities of building a mecha dragon. But since he also doesn't want to get kicked with those powerful dwarven legs again, he asks the short man to tell him. However, because the dwarf knows that it won't make much of a difference, he decides to go straight to the point and start from the conclusion, which basically requires Zig going to the ice castle. From the look on our hero's face, you can tell he's both shocked and confused. I bet he wouldn't want to go either, but there's a very high chance he might not even have a choice. Meanwhile, the scene shifts and we're taken directly to the ice castle in question. Just as the name implies, it's a massive castle made completely of ice and surrounded by nothing but snow. Apart from the sheer size of the structure, there's another interesting feature at the place, and it's the huge balls of fire being blasted around the castle. We quickly find out that the reason for this little fiery display is a powerful fire user, who's currently blasting several mob monsters around the castle. We also find out that the guy isn't a sole operator, because the next thing we see is that he's assisted on the battlefield with a familiar blue-themed arrow attack. Yep, that's right, the shooter he's working with is none other than Archersia, who appears to be finally done with her exams. After unleashing the powerful attacks, she calls out to the guy to ask him if he's okay, and the man assures her he's fine thanks to her help. As the fire mage and the archer get ready for round two of the battle, the man concludes that the places they're currently in must really be Deborah's next dungeon. Just as the rumors said, Sia seems to agree with him, because all the monsters they're facing at the moment are all familiar. All of a sudden, a voice yells out to execute a move called Saint Ray, and a thunderbolt almost hits the pair. But thankfully, they jump out in time, and as they do, the mage yells at someone named Iron, asking her what on earth she's doing. The culprit responsible for the blast is revealed to be a very immature-looking girl holding a staff, and playfully admitting that she made a mistake. Despite her not-so-convincing confession, the man doesn't believe her. Instead, he accuses her of blasting them on purpose. But while he's still calling her a liar, she cuts him off and changes the topic by suddenly asking him why he thinks a new dungeon would suddenly appear when a patch for the new one hadn't come out yet. The mage is immediately puzzled by the thought, and admits that the question Iron asked is one that has been going around among different users in the game. He admits that there are several theories to explain this, but he also suspects that the reason for the mystery is that someone cleared away the conditions that appeared two weeks ago. Hearing this theory, Iron becomes less worried and laughs off her concerns. Meanwhile, Sia watches and listens to the two. She begins to think that judging from the mage's theory, the problem started two weeks ago after she and Zig cleared out the first Deborah's dungeon. The moment Sia thinks about the dungeon quest, it suddenly hits her, and she remembers that she hasn't contacted the blacksmith ever since, even though she added him on Messenger and promised to meet up with him again. The archer claims that she was so busy trying to level up, that she forgot to contact him completely. While she's still talking, another player suddenly appears, wearing armor and covered in blood. Her attention switches to the new guy named Loki, and she asks him why he's in such a messed up state. While she's berating him, the mage chimes in, asking Loki if he was just tanking and wasting time. He promises to heal him immediately, however, the exhausted-looking fellow quietly points to the side at a figure, standing within the fog. Every one of them becomes alarmed, and as the mage wonders if it's a monster, Iron just yells for Sia to get ready to shoot. And of course, the skilled archer agrees, so she quickly pulls out her bow and arrow to aim at the potential enemy. But because there's so much mist, it's hard for her to see. She patiently waits for the person to come a little closer so she can lock on properly, and as the figure comes closer, we see that it's Zig. And when Sia notices this too, her eyes pop out in shock. While she's dealing with the unexpected discovery, our boy struggles to see anything from within the mist, and he also starts to wonder why there's so much of it. But then, the stuff finally clears, and he also sees the archer who's still aiming at him with her bow. 
As you'd expect, he's shocked to see her there, and even more surprised that she's currently pointing her weapon at him. He calls out to her, and the girl does the same, still feeling a bit uncertain that it's actually him. But either way, she asks the blacksmith what he's doing at the ice castle. In a flashback scene, we see the dwarf explaining his plan to Zig, and telling him how the ice palace is a dungeon that appeared two weeks ago at the very end of the ice valley in the north. The short man slams his hand on a paper and reveals that it's the diagram of the monster that appears in the ice palace. But when Zig sees the so-called monsters, he's shocked because he recognizes it as the wooden soldiers from Deborah's dungeon. The dwarf seems to agree with him and confirms that he's also right, by showing the blacksmith that if he looks closely at the diagram, the appearance is just vaguely different from the normal ones. According to him, the reason for this might be that they are among some undisclosed works of the witch Deborah. After stating this suspicion, the short man reveals that the wooden soldier will be able to help him get his ginormous tin can moving. Of course, Zig doesn't understand that, so the dwarf explains that Deborah was a genius in magic engineering. As a result, the hearts within the soldiers that she created are able to produce incredible amounts of energy, directly proportional to their size. Even though he knows that it's a stretch to use the hearts of normal wooden soldiers, the dwarf believes that if he's able to study the heart of the witch's undisclosed work, then maybe he'll be able to come up with a power source that can produce enough energy to move his mecha dragon. After explaining all of this to the blacksmith, the dwarf tells him that this mission is a trial, so if he wishes to become his apprentice, he has to bring back 30 hearts from the new version of Deborah's wooden soldiers. The panels switch back, and we're now completely caught up in the present with our hero standing in front of Sia and her new colleagues. The archer assumes that Zig must have come for a quest, and although he confirms it, he also admits that he's suffering a lot because the drop rates are very low. And while he's still talking, he trails off, thinking about how the dwarf punk made him think he'd be accepted straight away. Either way, our boy has accepted his fate at this point, and he just wants to get over with the quest, especially since he is also curious about exploring a new dungeon as well. The blacksmith's drawn out of his thoughts when Sia asks him if he'd like to party with her and her current members. Apart from Loki, they all seem eager and excited to have him on their team. The mage even tries to convince him by claiming that fate must be at work, because they'd be helping him clear the quest, while he'd be helping them to clear the dungeon. Hearing this, the gears in Zig's head begin to turn, as he thinks about the issues that come with partying up. He knows that a party with many people is a bit burdensome, and clearing the dungeon isn't exactly his objective anyway. However, all of a sudden, Iron expresses her views on the whole arrangement by suddenly asking what the party can even do with the blacksmith. They won't know how to use his skills, and will only end up sharing their experience points even further. Zig's eyes glimmer with hope when he sees that Iron might be opposing the idea of having him, but when she confirms that she agrees with the others, he tells her to just go on with her friends and ignore him. Of course, the table turns on him once again when Sia suddenly grabs him by the arm to drag him into the party by force. As the scene shifts, the next thing we see is Iron charging Loki's shield with her staff, using a skill called Holy Armor, and then two more skills called Taunt in the defense. The result of this combo is a large defensive wall that protects the party members from the wooden soldiers and skeletons, while they unleash their own powerful signature attacks. Using powerful blasts like Burst Shot and Stone Edge, the party is able to obliterate the many monsters that were charging at them. And after that, we see our boy picking up the last heart of the wooden soldiers to complete his quest. Our hero smiles in delight as he holds the heart in his hand, and just then, a tab pops up, informing him that he's completed the dwarf's trial test by successfully acquiring 30 wooden soldiers' hearts. While the other party members stand in front, eager to clear the next phase of the new dungeon, Zig stays behind, thinking about how he's already done with his own quest. The blacksmith thinks deeply and admits that the collaboration between the party members is good, and that if they continue at this rate, then they'll be able to clear the dungeon nicely. However, there's just one thing he's concerned about, and that's the fact that he doesn't know what's at the end of the quest. Because ever since it was discovered, no one has completed the dungeon. Once again, Zig is drawn out of his thoughts when Iron calls out to him, teasing him by calling him an old man, and asking him to stop picking stuff up like a selfish person so he can help them out. Upon hearing the party member say this, Sia quickly jumps in to defend the blacksmith, telling Iron that she's wrong, and insisting that Zig is currently saving his energy because they'll all be shocked when he springs into action. The archer says all of this, and then turns to the hero in question to confirm that they're on the same page. But when she looks at our boy with those expecting eyes, he gets shaken out of his nonchalant mood as his ego feeds on her praises. As a result, he decides that he has to impress the group by doing something spectacular. Unfortunately, before he can even think about what he's going to do, he's interrupted yet again. But this time, it's by a clapping sound coming from the mage's hands. After getting everyone's attention, the mage asks everyone to focus and informs them that they're getting close to the boss room. Seeing that they're almost at the end of the quest, he suggests that they have a quick review of their skills and items before heading inside to face the bots. 
Of course, the ever-cheerful and naive Iron rushes out, volunteering to go into the boss room alone first. But while she's childishly skipping away, Sia yells at her, reminding her that it's too dangerous for her to go alone. And sure enough, it doesn't take long before the young girl comes across something disturbing. Suddenly, Iron stops in her tracks when she sees a lady crying. But this lady doesn't look normal at all. For some reason, her hair is white and hands are dark blue, but she's covering her face while crying in a very creepy manner. Of course, the innocent and naive girl feels sorry for this strange lady and reaches out to her to ask if she's okay. And just when she's about to touch the tall lady, the mage appears behind her, screaming for her to stop whatever she's doing. Unfortunately, before Iron can understand him or even get away, the strange lady grabs her with her big, dark blue hand, before telling the innocent girl that she's caught her. Immediately as the scary lady says this, she becomes even more terrifying, because she suddenly transforms into a lizard monster with many snakes coming out of her head. Before Iron can even think about her next move, the creature shoots out something she calls a stone cloud from her mouth and blasts the poor girl with it. Afterward, we find out that this lizard lady actually has two faces, which she can switch very easily at her will. It appears that Iron somehow managed to dodge the attack and escape, because the strange woman's faces are now talking to themselves. The lizard face admits that humans are always good at running away, and then when the human face senses the presence of another member of the party, it takes over the creature's consciousness and attempts to trick the person. Their target member happens to be Loki, who's probably come to search for Iron. The evil woman tries to deceive him, promising to spare his life if he reveals the location of his friends. However, Loki is way smarter than this, so he doesn't buy the lady's lies. And as she continues to fake a cry, he quickly activates his taunt and defense skill on his shield again. Of course, when the witch sees that he's not cooperating, she decides to attack him instead. With the snakes on her head, she charges at Loki, promising to grant him his wish because she thinks that he has a death wish for not playing her game. The witch says this, and all of a sudden, the serpents on her head grow a lot longer to increase their range of attack on Loki. But before we can see the showdown that follows, the scene switches back to Iron, who's currently panting and gasping for air, with the archer and the mage comforting her. As the terrified girl shares her experience and asks what the creature was, Sia just laughs, because she finds her shock amusing. On the other hand, the mage kindly informs her that she just came across a Medusa, a creature that is infamous in Arpedia for being the most uncomfortable monster to face. He then goes on, revealing that there were rumors on the community board about the Ice Palace boss being a Medusa, but he wasn't sure of the information so he kept it to himself. Of course, he now regrets his decision because they almost lost a member of their party. As the mage apologizes, Iron tells him that it wasn't his fault. She takes the blame, recalling that she was the one who went off bounding on her own after all, and she sobs even more as she reveals that her carelessness is the reason why Zig is now turned to stone. It turns out that the naive girl survived because Zig pushed her out of the way or something, because now he's been petrified in her stead and won't be able to move for the next 10 minutes. The poor girl keeps crying, claiming that Zig was trying to save her, but Sia comforts her and assures her that she can apologize to the blacksmith after they've dealt with Medusa. So hearing these words from her big sis, Iron finally pulls herself together and promises to do her best. Either way, Sia points out that the situation is still tricky, because she doesn't even know how they'll deal with a monster that uses petrification attacks. But while she's saying this, the mage interrupts her to assure that she won't have to worry about that, because he brought a very useful item just in case. The mage with a monocle reveals the magic reflector he brought, and he's hopeful that it will be of use in the fight against Medusa because it has the ability to reflect literally anything. Meanwhile, back in the Ice Palace boss room, Loki is in the middle of a very tough fight with Medusa, and he's doing a very good job of holding his own against her by using his shield to deflect her attacks over and over again. All of a sudden, the monster lets out a loud laugh and assumes that the human must be at his limit already. Feeling confident that he's been weakened, she goes in for the kill, but as she hits his shield one more time, something unexpected happens. Loki suddenly receives a healing boost, his shield is fortified by the holy armor, and most importantly, he's suddenly granted a holy weapon to match his attack. By the time the lizard lady looks back at him, she's surprised to see his party members standing ready for battle behind him, while Loki is looking stronger than ever with his supercharged shield. Seeing this scary scene, the Medusa almost can't believe her eyes. And it only gets worse for her, because they all team up, combining their strongest signature moves just to blast her to dust. So, with Iron's Mega Flame and the Maid's Burst Shot, two unstoppable blasts are sent flying at the Medusa, but she doesn't stay down for long. In the meantime, the group goes to check up on Loki to see if he's okay. The guy maintains his brooding demeanor and blankly tells them that he's fine. Upon hearing this, Iron gets excited again, and the Maid simply tells her to give all the buffs to Loki, which she agrees to do with pleasure. In preparation for the next stage of the quest, the Maid suggests that Loki keeps tanking, while him and Sia keep attacking from a distance. 
and seeing that everyone is on board with the new plan, he leads them into battle one more time. The party members charge at the furious Medusa with everything they've got, and Iron is extremely excited by the whole thing. As the fight resumes and the players fight bravely against the lizard lady, we see our boy on the sidelines, standing like a literal statue. But soon enough, cracks start to appear, and a tab informs us that he still has seven minutes of being petrified before he can return to normal. Looks like it will take a while for our hero to show up and save the day, and it's still not yet sure if the others can defeat the Medusa on their own. Will Zig be able to escape the debuff in time? And will his new teacher ever get to breathe life into his mecha dragon? Stay tuned to find out in the next episode. Until next time.